good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Museum here at um, Collins Barracks, um, Top Auto Road Galair. Um, and we're really, really um, honoured to be hosting an exceptional conference here over the next uh, day and a half um, entitled Portrait of a Nation. And it's bringing together, um, I suppose, the themes developed as a result of an incredible exhibition called Studio and State, the Laveries and the Anglo-Irish Treaty that opened here at the National Museum of Ireland, Collins Barracks, in November just past, or sorry, actually, yeah, late November 2021, and will run until the end of this year, 2022. It's a joint collaboration between the National Museum of Ireland and the Hugh Lane Gallery, um, which in itself is a landmark exhibition. Um, but the themes and the quality of the material on display, I hope you will agree, um, would warrant such an incredible conference of this nature. And I just want to thank in particular Helen Beaumont, Dermot Bulger, Ashling, um, um, Dunn and others here in our own Department of Education in the National Museum of Ireland, but also Jessica O'Donnell in the Education Department of the Hugh Lane Gallery and her team. But I also want to acknowledge the incredible work work um, um, through by the curators, Dr. Edith Andres and Logan Sisley, who created the exhibition Studio and State in the first place, um, and to encourage you all uh, throughout the day to have a look at the exhibition, um, literally across the way here in Clark Square, on the other side of the square here in Collins Barracks. It really is um, a very meaningful experience, but then I would say that, I suppose, but I do sincerely believe it. So um, just to say that we have an audience of more than 200 participating today and tomorrow, both in person and online, and um, you're all extremely welcome. And um, just to say that uh, the, um, it has been a very exciting experience to have this joint collaboration with the Hugh Lane, and there are many more um, things to come this year, but as a result of talks and podcasts and also other events. Um, so please check out both um, websites, both the Hugh Lane's website and museum.ie for further details. Um, I also just want to point out the fact that when we opened the exhibition in November, we also had an incredible publication to accompany it um, with incredible contributors, um, including Dr. Sinead McCool here beside me, um, for Professor Fergal McGarry, Logan Sisley, Edith Andres, and many, many others. And that is for sale, um, again, on the shop part of the museum.ie website and on site in the Hugh Lane shop itself. And just to say that there's a, dis there's, um, a special order um, associated with it if you do so online today. Day. It'll be uh, free delivery from Monday onwards uh, for those attending the conference here today. Um, it's a very important conference because it's the intersection between art and politics in the context of the birth of the new Irish state. And it brings together a broad range of speakers historians, artists, writers and curators to share, discuss and debate themes from the background to the signing of the treaty in London in 1921 to its legacy and impact on the ordinary Irish person, from questions around memory and trauma to the role of the artist as a witness to history. Um, so it's a real honour to get started here today. But just to draw your attention, I suppose, to the fact that over the course of the last 10 years, the National Museum of Ireland in particular has been a central component um, in terms of programming, both exhibition and um, educational programming for the decade of centenaries, which obviously started in 2012 and will go on until at least 2024. And we've had about a, um, 11 exhibitions, some of them permanent, some of them not, some of them temporary during the course of that time period. Um, and I'm just read out some of them in terms of names. Asgard from Gun Running uh, to Recent Conservation, which opened in 2012, is still ongoing here. Uh, the 1913 Lockout, which was a temporary exhibition. The Recovered Voices, the Stories of the Irish at War, 1914 to 15, which is still ongoing here in Collins Barracks. Proclaiming a Republic, the 1916 Rising, that closed in 2020, but ran from 2016. Um, the 1916 Rising, Roger Casement, Voice of the Voiceless, which ran in our Museum of Archaeology in Kildare Street. And looked at his collecting, particularly in the Congo and South America, and obviously how that influenced him in terms of his revolutionary activity later. Um, we've also done others such as Votes for Women, Suffrage and Citizenship in 2018, and Marching on the Road to Freedom, Dáil Éireann of 1919. And at the moment, we still have ongoing, since January of 2020, a newly revamped section in our Soldiers and Chiefs galleries here at Collins Barracks on the Irish War of Independence and the Irish Civil War, entitled The Irish Wars of 1919 to 23. So in conjunction with the Studio and State exhibition, I'd also encourage you to look at those once you have a chance today. And also just to um, give one example of the, the emotional um, and 
the tangible when it comes to what museums do, either by way of fine art, um, art history and history. And I suppose one very moving example that always strikes me is, is a set of rosary beads, actually, that was given or owned by Joseph Mary Plunkett that was on display here in the 1916 exhibition up until 2020. But it was given to him by Sergeant William Hand of the Sherwood Foresters, a member of Plunkett's own execution firing squad moments before Plunkett's death. And the registration entry, which is brutal in its factual detail, simply states, Joseph Mary Plunkett's rosary beads given by him to Sergeant W. Hand, a member of the firing squad which executed him. Hand, in turn, gave it to his cousin Dora before going to France where he was killed in 1918. Donor is her son. So it's the fact that both men are connected through this one humble object and, and both lost their lives through conflict within two years of each other, I think underlines the reality of war and what we're doing here in terms of the commemorations and its utter annihilation of human life. The fact that also that one, this one artefact has the power to evoke the sense of duty experienced by both men, Plunkett in his utter determination to bring about a sovereign independent Irish Republic and hand in his loyalty to king and country on that most violent of European stages, the Great War of 1914-18. to 18. And Plunkett's rosary beads, along with all sorts of other objects, 15,500 in the Easter Week collection alone in the National Museum of Ireland, dis, um, basically conveyed strong emotional charge by their actual presence and their interpretation. And this lends, I think, great validity to what has been described as the National Museum of Ireland embodying the complexity of cultural memory beyond the state-led in its challenges of description, interpretation and designation, and so too in its programming, and particularly in the context of this conference today. So with that, I'm just going to introduce you to the chair of our first panel here um, this morning, the incredible um, Mark Duncan. Mark is a co-founder of the Inquest Research Group, who has spent over two decades designing and managing large-scale research projects for clients in the media, government and the voluntary and private sectors. He is the author of numerous reports and books, including the GAA, A People's History, Handling Change, A History of the Irish Bank Officials Association, and Creating Ireland, Research and the Role of the Humanities and Social Sciences. Mark is a former director of the GAA Oral History Project at Boston College, Ireland, and he's also acted as head of research for RTE Current Affairs, holding editorial responsibility for programming on a broad array of political and state events. And he is currently a director of the Century Ireland Project based at Boston College, Ireland, and a regular media contributor. So with that, I want to welcome Mark um, and also the other panelists for the, this morning's discussion. And thank you so much for being here. Good morning to you all, and, and thank you, Audrey. Um, I balked at that word incredible there in the, in the, in the introduction. I'd like to um, thank also Dimmer Bulger and Helen Beaumont for the opportunity to chair this opening session of what is going to be a wonderful and uh, a wonderfully original um, uh, uh, programme over the next couple of days. Uh, Helen reminded me earlier that my last time in Collins Barracks for a conference was for the Reimagining um, Commemorations Conference, which was the last Saturday of February 2020, which we all enjoyed in blissful ignorance that our worlds, our physical worlds anywhere, were just about to shrink uh, a fortnight later, and we were all forced to actually learn the frustrations and the joys of, uh, of Zoom, and if we could indulge in uh, or engage in conferences like this, it was inevitably online. Now, we're still online, and I think one of the um, uh, great byproducts of, of the pandemic experience is the fact that now we can use technology to actually broaden the reach of events like this. Uh, and already just looking through some of the comments on the screen here, there are people tuning in from, would you believe, a sunny Edinburgh uh, and, a, and a cloudy Zagreb uh, this morning. So this conference has very much a international reach and that is fantastic. In saying all that, uh, if I can borrow from an old GAA advert from some years ago, nothing beats being here. And it's just great actually to be sharing a space with other people in particular, to be sharing a room with some wonderful speakers, speakers whose work as writers, as curators, historians has done so much to kind of to illuminate and deepen our understanding of the complexities of the period we're putting under the microscope today. I think pivotal to that period of history that we're talking about has been the Anglo-Irish Treaty, of course. And um, I think most 
mostly when we think about it, or when we discuss it, it tends to be in the context of what flowed from it. And I think that's probably inevitable. You know, we're talking here about the, the, the splits in organizations like Sinn Féin, in Common Amman, uh, in the IRA, uh, leading ultimately, I suppose, to the onset of civil war in the summer of 1922. This morning, we're going to take a step back from that. We're going to, we're going to look at that period from the summer of 1921 to Christmas 19, uh, 1921, six, six, a six month period, you know, um, where we're looking at the negotiation of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, from the period from truce to treaty. Now, I think it's worth bearing in mind that outside Belfast, where violence continued, um, when, the, when the truce was concluded uh, a, on the 11th of July 1921, there was really a sense, a palpable sense of relief, a sense of attention lifting throughout many parts of the country. And that's kind of reflected in newspaper reports from the days that followed, but also in many of the personal recollections that we find, uh, uh, find in, in, in the many archives from that period. Just down the way from us here in, down this way actually, uh, out in Dublin Port, uh, uh, when the truce commenced at noon on the 11th of, of, of July, sirens were sounded from American and British steamships out in, in the bay. Um, workers, uh, labourers in the, in the employ of Dublin uh, Corporation were let off work for the afternoon. There were 1,600 railway workers working at Inchip Core Railway Works across the, across the Liffey there who were given the afternoon off as well to enjoy the kind of summer sunshine. School children were let off school. That evening in towns and cities across the country, marching bands were marching through the streets to celebrate the onset of truce. The Irish Times reported in the days after that the very air held a new lightness and was irradiated not only with sunshine, but with hope. Now that hope, of course, was tempered by a realism uh, within, uh, among many elements in Sinn Féin and the IRA, that the truce was going to be temporary, that the, the respite from the conflict was actually, was only going to be short-lived, and that the talks that were about to open up between the British negotiators and the Irish delegates uh, were as likely to end in failure as they were in success. Now to understand why those talks ended the way they did, um, and reach the settlement that they reached. I think it's important to appreciate both the political dynamics of the negotiations that took place in London in late 1921, and also to appreciate, I suppose, the milieus in which the negotiators mixed. And to help us do that, we could not be in better company than the two speakers I have beside me today. We're going to hear from Dr. Sinead McCool uh, later, but first up, it's a pleasure to introduce to you uh, Gretchen Freeman, an award-winning journalist who did her postgraduate study in international history at Trinity College, having previously been educated in England and Australia. Uh, now, to our obvious gain and to others' loss, she now is living amongst us. And last year, with the good people in Merriam Press, she published her first book, which was entitled The Treaty, the gripping story of the negotiations that brought about Irish independence and led to civil war. Now, that gripping in the title is not just publisher's hyperbole, um, because the, that's exactly how the book actually reads. Uh, and it's, it's really a kind of testament to kind of skill as a writer that she, managed to, she manages to marry a, a lot of historical detail with a really kind of lively uh, and engaging Engaging pace that kind of wears very lightly the scholarship that clearly underpins the book. So Gretchen this morning will be looking at the imperial realities behind the treaty negotiations and I'd like to welcome her to the podium. Um, thank you very much for that kind, excessively kind introduction. Um, and good morning to you all. It's a, a great honor to be invited here today. And um, thank you for that to the National Museum of Ireland and the Hugh Lane Gallery. It's especially generous of you to invite an Australian to comment on one of the most contentious episodes in modern Irish history. A lot is made of the cultural affinities between our two nations. Paul Keating, one of our former prime ministers, Famously, he who laid a hand on the Queen's back once said that Australia without the Irish would be unthinkable, unimaginable, unspeakable. And that's true. After all, our imaginary founding father, Ned Kelly, is a doomed outlaw of Irish Catholic descent, mythologized in a series of paintings by another Irish Catholic Australian, Sidney Nolan. But that tells only one part of the story, for as the late Clive James reminded us, the problem with Australians is not that so many of them are descended from convicts, but that so many of them are descended from prison officers. 
And I think we can see in today's post-Brexit age that it's not so much the ties to Ireland, but the ties to the motherland, as Britain used to be called in Australia, that are winning out. Not long before, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, said that a Britain unfettered and unburdened by the EU would be able to intensify old friendships around the world. The Commonwealth economies, he implied, would form the foundations of a new global Britain. But what Commonwealth was he referring to? Was this the outworn vision of a global British family radiating from the mother country, which became known as the Anglosphere, or the Commonwealth in general that included India and former con colonies in Africa and the Caribbean? Some observers were in no doubt, and the Euroscepticism championed by Johnson was described in one quarter as an implicit rehabilitation of the racialized early 20th century notion of the Commonwealth as a cosy and exclusive Anglo-Saxon club. Now we're going to delve into that world today because my central argument is that if we are to fully, and appre fully appreciate and understand why it was that five representatives of the self-proclaimed Irish Republic signed a compromise treaty with the British in the dead of night on 6 of December 1921, an agreement that confirmed partition and which created a new dominion out of the 26 counties south of the border, then we need to lift the perspective out of the Anglo-Irish bilateral vacuum. For the treaty talks were played out on an imperial stage. Ireland was an imperial question like no other. It was both an integral part of the United Kingdom and a quasi-colony, a status embodied by the position of the viceroy or lord lieutenant who functioned as the monarch's representative in the country. Part of the reason for this narrow focus has been the tendency to view the truce to the treaty period through the prism of the Civil War, which erupted the following summer. These blame-centered accounts come with pre-loaded pre assumptions. They tend to read into the choice of the leading participants the attitudes and divisions that defined the post-treaty era, to see the outcome either as an exercise in realpolitik or something not far short of a humiliating failure. And there was plenty to attack because the settlement marked a drastic contrast to the expectations of the Republican movement, which was not prepared for an alternative vision of statehood other than the self-proclaimed republic. The treaty did not sever the link with Britain. It failed to achieve a united Ireland. And while it ended one war, it provoked a bloodier conflict, one that was to leave a lasting legacy on the newly constituted state. Another familiar interpretation is to see it not so much as the fruit of mutual concessions as the product of Welsh wizardry, an episode when flat-footed Irish negotiators were outmaneuvered by more experienced British statesmen, led by that wiliest of politicians, the Prime Minister and Welshman David Lloyd George. Personalities and factional quarrels within Sinn Féin loom large in these accounts. And as a consequence, the imperial complexities that shape the treaty negotiations tend to be simplified or crowded out of the picture. Yet in the turbulent aftermath of the First World War, the chief concern for Britain was how to safeguard the empire, the source of its global power and prestige. Imperial resources had helped propel the nation to victory in the Great War, while imperial sentiment remained strong on the home front, although it's impossible, I think, to articulate precisely what the empire meant to the mass of the British people. Many conceived of it as a benign, civilizing institution. They thought of themselves as a fundamentally peaceable people and regarded the British Empire as unique because it was centered on an open and politically liberal society. The antithesis, they thought, of the sclerotic authoritarian regime regimes that had ruled over the German, Austro-Hungarian, Russian and Ottoman empires, all of which collapsed after the First World War. A string of post-war crises were to challenge these attitudes, but none more so than the conflict in Ireland. The countless atrocities committed here by the Crown forces provoked widespread re revulsion, although according to one journalist, the strength of feeling did not reach a tipping point until May 1921. Then at last, he wrote, the country awoke to the hideousness of this hellish policy. In addition to the damage to the empire's putative moral authority, the turmoil in Ireland also threatened to undermine the British government's efforts to reshape imperial relations, an imperative after 1918 when a myriad of internal and external crises threatened to overwhelm the great liner, as William Churchill, as Winston Churchill <laughs> liked to call the empire. By 1921, there was a realization in Whitehall and Westminster that imperial control could not be wielded in the form it was prior to 1914, not least because of the state's overstretched military and economic resources. The empire reached its largest extent after the Great War, but now the sun never seemed to set on its crises. These multiplied at a bewildering rate and threatened Britain's place in the world. 
There was the fluctuating international order, the ascendancy of the United States, the persistent threat from Bolshevism and the global anti-imperialist currents it stimulated, the demands from the Dominion leaders for greater independence and a greater input into imperial policy, the cascade of nationalist uprisings in the colonies, with prized possessions like India and Egypt up in arms, and all this on top of mounting pressures and problems on the, high, on the home front. Ireland as a strange constitutional hybrid, quite unlike anywhere in the, in the empire or the United Kingdom, brought these imperial and domestic threats together. And increasingly, British policymakers came to believe that if they could find a resolution to the Irish question, they could quell turbulent waters elsewhere. Sinn Féin's leaders also faced narrowing choices with no coherent strategy of the future and forced to run the counter-state government on the hoof, many separatists recognized that unholy compromises were unavoidable. So although they had fought the British to a standstill by the summer of 1921, the battle for sovereignty looked as problematic as ever. It was evident by this stage that President Wilson's lofty talk of self-determination for smaller nations, encapsulated in his famous 14 points, did not apply to the empires of the Great War's Victoria, victorious powers. The self-proclaimed Irish Republic was just that. Frozen out of the 1919 Paris Peace Conference, denied membership of the League of Nations, and unable to secure the much yearned for recognition from the US, the Sinn Féin-led counterstate was running out of options. Their quest for a republic cut no ice either with the Dominion governments. At the end of June 1921, when the heads of the emergent British Commonwealth of Nations, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, gathered in London for the post-war imperial conference, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, widow of Frank Sheehy Skeffington, who was murdered in the Rising, traveled to London to try and exert pressure on the Dominion pre premiers. She wrote to them and requested a formal hearing, claiming that she wanted to explain to them in person how women and, and, women and children in Ireland were suffering as a result of the Crown Force's brutality. The British press made quite a stir about her visit, describing her as Eamon de Valera's official envoy, but not one of the Dominion leaders broke ranks and agreed to meet her, although New Zealand's Prime Minister, William Massey, who came from Ulster, initially said yes, and then hastily retracted the invite two days later. Not that the Dominion leaders were patiently waiting for Lloyd George's administration to beat the Irish into submission, far from it. The power dynamics between the white settler co colonies and the motherland had fundamentally changed by this stage, 1919 being the watershed year. But conflicting interests among these nations meant that at the Imperial Conference, leaders disagreed on whether Dominion status should be set in stone. So these constitutional ambiguities, which would have clarified the nature of Ireland's with the nature of Ireland's future relations with Britain were not ironed out until long after the treaty talks. Of all the Dominion leaders, Jan Smuts, South Africa's Prime Minister, was by far the most influential. A former Boer commander, he was now a messianic defender of the British Empire. To him, the Commonwealth was essential to white South Africa's future, and he nurtured hopes that its influence would lead eventually to a vast white dominion, stretching unbroken throughout Africa. But all his high-minded rhetoric about the supposed civilizing force of the Commonwealth, his public arguments that this was an organic community of co-equal nations united behind a common flag and a higher ideal, rang hollow in the face of British aggression in Ireland. In 1919, he warned Lloyd George's government that the Irish conflict was a wound capable of destroying the British Empire. And just a week or so before Sheehy Skeffington had approached him and was turned away, he told the Prime Minister that the present situation is an unmeasured calamity and insisted that it negated all the principles of government which we have professed as the basis of empire. At the start of July 1921, he traveled to Dublin, hoping to persuade Sinn Féin's leaders to abandon their quest for a republic. When de, Valera, when de Valera asserted that the choice was between a republic or dominion status, Smuts retorted that the British people will never give you this choice. You are next door to them. Later that month, de Valera received the same message from Lloyd George himself when the two leaders met alone in the cabinet room of 10 Downing Street, where the dominion pre premiers had assembled only a few weeks earlier for the imperial conference. The Prime Minister emphasized this fact to de Valera. Ireland's destiny, he suggested, lay within the Commonwealth, a sisterhood, in his words, of free nations. When Sinn Féin's president recoiled, Lloyd George put it more bluntly, the choice was dominion status or renewed war. In the months between that encounter and the start of the treaty talks, de Valera devised his compromise formula of external association, which afforded Ireland complete internal autonomy and voluntary association with the Commonwealth in external matters of common concern. 
During the treaty negotiations, Lloyd George asked Arthur Griffith, chairman of the Irish delegation, what that meant. Association, he argued, is not the position of Canada and Australia. What is the distinction between association and coming inside the empire? Rather at a loss, Griffith responded, we should be associated with you. Outside that, a free people. Free people. De Valera had not fully thrashed out his external association proposal by the time the treaty talks were underway, nor had he explained it to the Doyle, let alone the wider public. And there was little enthusiasm for it in the Doyle cabinet. Indeed, Griffith and Michael Collins, Minister for Finance and the de facto leader of the IRA, departed for London convinced that it did not represent his last word. The British, desperate to shore up the great liner, never took the idea seriously, seeing it as a dressed up demand for a republic. Their concern was to preserve the symbolic importance of the crown, and there was a very real fear that any ground conceded here would lead to a dissolution of the empire, as one civil servant noted anxiously during the treaty talks. The crown is the symbol of all that keeps the nation of the empire together. This fixation on, imp on imperial loyalty as opposed to loyalty to the union underlines how the First World War had shifted the compass. For as the late historian Keith Jeffrey observed, it was during this conflict that the empire became a virtually united and cohesive unit. Prior to then, opponents of home rule could argue that loosening the ties of the union weakened the empire. Now, in the emotional years that followed 1918, when few British people were untouched by grief and when the reputation of the empire stood so high because the war was a united effort with troops drawn from the dominions and the colonies, this outlook, this outlook appeared hopelessly outdated. The old guard and the far right were left to fulminate at the British public's indifference to the Union. Sir Henry Wilson, the chief of the Imperial General Staff, declared that Lloyd George, far from grabbing murderers by the throat, was now shaking hands with them. Unfortunately for him, a more liberal view had gained the day. The conflict in Ireland had been deeply unpopular and the consensus of opinion was for a settlement that kept Ireland within the empire. Few believed any more that domestic or imperial problems could be solved by the deployment of overwhelming force, and this prevailing pacifist mood, exacerbated by the weakness of the domestic economy, marked a significant departure to Victorian and Edwardian times when conservatives typically favoured coercive policies in the empire. Lessons learned in governing India and other colonies were thought to hold good for Ireland too. It has often been said that internal changes in the Conservative and Unionist Party cleared the path for the treaty settlement. Lloyd George, leader of one half of the split Liberal Party, depended on the support of the Tories for his political survival, and he could not push them further or faster than they were willing to go. But this interpretation is too narrowly focused. It is the wider imperial context that changed the dial. The Conservatives had backed Ulster's Unionists to the hilt on their anti-Home Rule crusade prior to the First World War because it was politically advantageous for them to do so, and it reflected their united stance on empire. Then the Tories, like Ulster's Unionists, equated loyalty to the Union with loyalty to the empire. But amid intensifying domestic and dominion outrage at the state of affairs in Ireland, the old alliance began to crumble. Ulster's unionists' determination to cling to a traditional vision of empire, their dogged refusal to place themselves under a Dublin parliament, struck many conservative politicians, not least the party's leader, Austin Chamberlain, as vexing in the extreme. Many, though, believed that the six counties was the price that had to be paid for peace. Ulster's unionists, like their old allies, could not be coerced, and however unjustly drawn the border was, there was a belief that unity would eventually emerge. The only hope of union in Ireland, Cham Chamberlain said, is to recognise her present division. And so the challenges posed by the wave of nationalist movements across the empire left British decision makers with little room for manoeuvre. Once unthinkable compromises had become inevitable. In this age of crisis, the question was always, how far should the concessions go? As late as the end of September, one member of Lloyd George's inner circle characterised the offer of Dominion status to Ireland as a risky and rash move. The essence of the Dominion solution, he wrote, is a spirit of loyal partnership with the British Empire and that spirit of tolerance and compromise which lies at the root of British institutions. It does not yet exist in Ireland, which was a fairly breathtaking comment given the conduct of the Crown forces during the War of Independence. But if it speaks to the depths of prejudice within Whitehall and Westminster, it also underlines the dilemma the British faced because Dominion status could not be defended by force, although paradoxically in Ireland's case it could be imposed by force, or at least the threat of force. Nevertheless, in the weeks prior to the treaty talks, Lloyd George rallied his coalition cabinet behind the offer of Dominion status to Ireland, no easy task, and Chamberlain told his sister that this represented the utmost limits of concession, both in substance and form. 
Conservative MPs swallowed the treaty in the end, but a significant number did so reluctantly, believing that dominion status should have been granted only after the IRA had been fully suppressed. In 1921 then, as so often in the past, the question of Ireland's constitutional status bridged debates on domestic politics and the future of the empire. Nationalist uprisings in India and Egypt had yet to be settled while the treaty talks were underway. Indeed, Egyptian supporters of the anti-colonial anti -colonial nationalist leader, Said Zagul, were due to hold a, a lunch with de Valera at the Mansion House on 8th of December, a plan that had to be swiftly scrapped after the treaty was signed on December 6th. Then there was the naval armaments conference in Washington, which had started in November, and which represented a crucial juncture in Britain's relations with the US and the Dominions. In Washington, news of the treaty signing was viewed as a towering diplomatic triumph. Ireland, as one historian noted, had quite suddenly become the government's badge of honor and respectability. In London, the mood was jubilant, and from the Dominion premiers, there was profound relief. Weeks earlier, New Zealand's Prime Minister had urged Lloyd George not to coerce Ulster, arguing that any move in that direction would mean very serious trouble all over the empire. People who are loyal, he said, must be treated fairly and justly. Traditional sympathies for Ulster's loyalists or the Belfast government led by James Craig were at a low ebb, however, among the chief British negotiators. After almost eight weeks of close-quarter negotiations with the Sinn Féin delegation, especially the leading Irish delegates Griffith and Collins, Britain's big four, as Lloyd George, Churchill, Chamberlain, and the Lord Chancellor F.E. Smith or Lord Birkenhead were dubbed, had developed a genuinely conciliatory approach, or rather conciliatory attitude, towards the Irish. And so despite the high drama of the conference's final hours when Griffith capitulated and Lloyd George threatened war in three days if the others didn't follow suit. That mature stage of the negotiations would arguably not even have been reached if the arguments for Dominion status had not already proved persuasive. It is, of course, unlikely that Collins or Griffith would have signed if they believed the Boundary Commission lacked teeth and that it would achieve nothing more than minor rectifications to Northern Ireland's territory. This was certainly one area where Welsh wizardry came into play. And yet, at, as that final fraught Doyle cabinet meeting on December 3rd revealed, Sinn Féin was more preoccupied with the question of sovereignty than partition, just as Ulster's unionists were more concerned with entrenching partition than with extracting a more accommodating or politically wise constitutional arrangement. In the end, they were left with a home rule formula that foisted a hefty tax, tax burden on them. Ultimately then, the treaty expressed the shifting imperial priorities of Britain. The United Kingdom had fragmented, but no hole had opened up in the hull of the great liner. Catastrophe in India and Egypt was averted, and thanks to the expansion and development of the Commonwealth, the vision of empire beloved by imperial diehards like Rudyard Kipling, who thought the treaty was a betrayal, was displaced by the equally potent Whiggish myth of progress. Ireland's loss was not the next step in the empire's recessional. Instead, the creation of a dominion on Britain's door, doorstep, the Irish Free State, marked the logical and planned for evolution of a unique and enlightened empire. A war-weary yet patriotic public found reassurance in this belief. For as one historian observed, this was to become the era of the bucolic Stanley Baldwin, a John Bull figure for the modern age, stripped both of his vulgar swagger and of his fearsome bulldog. In Ireland, the treaty led to civil war, but de Valera soon proved the validity of Collins's argument that while the settlement fell short of the freedom that all nations desire and develop to, it created the scope to achieve that freedom. Significantly, de Valera's opposing claim was also vindicated. The idea that the crown was indivisible, that its position at the apex of a single, all-embracing imperial hierarchy was immutable, proved a fiction. The Commonwealth could and did accommodate a de facto republic. And it was this, this arguably this unavoidable flexibility shown by the British in 1921 and 1922 when the treaty took effect that introduced into the Commonwealth not so much a reluctant dominion as a recalcitrant dominion. Okay. Uh, thank you, Gretchen. That was fantastic, and and really did kind of um, provide the kind of uh, 
a great kind of setting of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in a much kind of broader context. Uh, and I think um, it's important, really important, obviously, to, to understand the imperial dynamics that played into the negotiations and the eventual settlement. Just a reminder to people in the room and to people watching online that if you have questions for Gretchen or if you have questions for Sinead, um, start preparing them now or you can punch them into uh, the online, um, uh, the, the YouTube or Facebook channels and hopefully I'll, I'll pick up on them. I'll, I'll certainly be scrolling down on them and I'll, I'll, I'll be putting to them uh, after Sinead speaks. Uh, Dr Sinead McCool, our next speaker is a historian and curator of Irish culture, arts and history. Uh, and I think if if you were, if, if Sinead was to kind of, kind of write this, write, write a theme for uh, for a conference that you would like to speak on, it would probably be this because uh, this really does speak to her research interests, her publications, which are uh, which are many, uh, and uh, which you know she's she's been engaged in this material for, for for well over kind of 20, 25 years at this stage at least. Her her book Hazel, A Life of Lady Lavery, was published in 1996, and I still remember the kind of interest that, that kind of elicited uh, both in the press and the media and all of that sort of stuff. There was a huge response to that book and she's been still, she revisited some of that material again for Passion and Politics, uh, the Salon revisited, that's uh, Lady Lavery Society and also for, uh, that's, that's, that was Sir John Lavery, wasn't it? The Salon revisited uh, in 2010 with the uh, Hugh Lane Gallery. She is been, she has been involved in an awful lot of the really good stuff that has been happening over the decade of centenaries in recent years. You kind of, it's the hidden hand you don't see, but she's there. Um, in, involved in an awful lot of, of the really kind of innovative, innovative um, exhibitions and online um, stuff that has been going on. She is a member of the expert advisory group on the gov uh, of the Government of Ireland on the Decade of Centenaries programme since 1912 um, and, in 20, uh, and in 2021 she curated Manaw100.ie which I'd encourage anyone to go to. Uh, I certainly use it uh, um, repeatedly. Um, she is going to be speaking this morning um, on um, the Lavries and what was their nation state. Okay, Sinead. Hello everybody, uh, thanks very much Mark and thanks also to Gretchen um, and I agree her, her book is lively and interesting and I suppose is a great follow on in the modern time from uh, Peace by Ordeal which was written on the treaty. Yes, I have been working on the Laveries for a long time um, and I suppose today I want to look at um, a, an aspect of their lives and I want to look at the whole concept of unreal. I suppose what we have in relation to the Laveries is a look again in this decade of centenaries. But before I start, I just want to thank the Hewland Gallery once again for allowing me to uh, be part of this and also to the National Museum and being involved as I am in the decade of centenaries. We're looking at a far more complicated and complex look at Irish history. And I want to refer back my, my undergraduate thesis for my master's um, back in 1990, 1991, was the, um, the Laveries and the emergence in their, the Irish Free State. Um, in 1990, Mary Robinson had just become the president, and I was told jokingly but seriously within the academic setting was the story of the Laveries making sandwiches for politicians. And I suppose I want you to think about that is, um, more seriously now in the context of what I'm going to say to you today is that when you're trying to look into um, the lives of people who are on the fringes, maybe um, outliers as it were, um, when the, the, when the ac academic sort of t take on it is, is that their story doesn't have substance, it's very hard then to forge ahead with your work in this area. So when I look at them today, I, 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 I want you to look beyond a little bit of the, the wonderful images and I'm going to race through their life in 20 minutes. If for some reason I miss some obvious bits, please ask in the questions something that I've, that I've overcome. But just 
to say to you also that on Sunday in the Hugh Lane, I'm going to give the super deluxe version of this talk. So I will fill in all the gaps on Sunday if anybody's interested in hearing me speak again. Um, so they look like cinema icons as you see this particular image of them on the screen from 1921. You may be surprised to know that John Lavery is 65, a sprightly looking 65 year old, I have to say, born in 1856. She was 41, 24 years younger than him, but she actually was lying about her age, Hazel Lavery. She was claiming to be in her 30s, most, most closer to the age of Michael Collins. She had been lying about her age from the time of her first marriage. It took me to go to the States and find her confirmation record in a time before the easy access of online to actually discover how old she was. And she was concealing her past in America. So therefore, it was important for them to have a public persona and to have a private persona. And even in the modern age, those people who manage their image, who manage their story, who managed to leave out as much as leave in. Harder, I must say, in the modern world. So when um, John Lavery wrote in his autobiography, which uh, I brought along today, I suppose, just because I thought it was important to illustrate his story, um, is because if anyone wanted to take a little bit of a look at what he's reading, I shall pass it around as the day goes on. He described her Ireland as unreal, as a mirage in the desert. Um, they're, they're, the concept of them as people working within Ireland, they never lived in Ireland. Well, John had, but they'd never lived as a couple in Ireland. They lived in London. They had a house in Morocco. They traveled widely. They were international people from a very early stage. But what is the truth of their story? I, I, I always think back to the, the, the first moment that I became interested in the story. As a student of history of art, I was interested in the whole concept of, of, of artists and their wives. I was thinking of people like Rubens and Helen Formon, the fur wrap, this sort of um, very um, you know, intimate portraits that artists had done of their wives. And then this artist had painted her coffin in her bedroom. He had painted it and called his painting, it is finished, it's in the Hugh Lane um, Gallery collection. He gave it in 1935, and 1935 is a key year for John Lavery. It is this painting and others, her on her deathbed, that was recorded um, by W.B. Yeats when he wrote, um, Hazel Lavery both living and dying as though some ballad singer had sung it all, and he didn't even know the truth of their story. It definitely was ballad singers' songs, if they knew the truth of this story, but what's really important here is I'm probably standing here because John manufactured their life. The fact he painted her coffin in her bedroom, the fact that he wrote in his autobiography that there was a was a a, a bundle of letters that he was not going to look at, that it was going to tell her story. And I very fortunately in my early 20s what came to have access to that collection and that became the content for my biography of Lady Lavery. It is surprising to know that there is no catalogue raisonné for Lavery. For art historians, his work is mixed. He doesn't in some ways have the status of other artists. It's, this is not an art history piece, but it's really important to talk about it as somebody who needs w more work to be done on him. And definitely, every time you go back to look at the Laveries, you find more about them. The images that you see on the screen here are John Lavery in 1909. By 1909, he was uh, um, in the academies of of, of, of Rome, Germany, Austria, Belgium, Spain, France. He, with the Glasgow boys, he had become known all over the world. He was already established in London, as I'm going to show you, but he saw himself in a particular way. You'll have seen those images of him. He's wearing a white painter's coat. He wrote in his biography even later, it's called The Life of a Painter. His, his, his stepdaughter said that it sounded like he was a house painter. He seemed to have um, an element of times of being humble, but other times not so humble. Um, um, and, and, and maybe some of that not so humble is part of this mirage in a, the desert, the sort of the obscuring of their, their true selves. He was born um, in Belfast. Um, his father died when 
He was three, his mother died months later, and also a sister um, died at the same time. He was, he was taken over by, um, and I'm taken over, taken to his relatives in Mora in County Antrim. Clenahan's um, is a pub still there where you can uh, see some of his, his artifacts. He was brought to school and sent to school in the local, you can see it on the map there, the Church of Ireland School. And I think this is significant because what's really important about John Lavery is how he perceived himself as an Irishman. Um, writing in 1915, Ulster men um, were described by one clergyman and it said, in one sense, an Ulsterman are Irishmen first and Britishers afters, and in another sense, they're Ulstermen first and Irishmen afterwards. And so for the rest of his life, John Lavery always wrote, even on his collector's card, that he was Bel born, Belfast born. It was very important to him, perhaps maybe because his childhood wasn't as easy as the wee orphan boy described. He talks about um, his life and how he capitalised on being an orphan when he was in his uncle's farm. But his aunt sent him at the age of 10 to Saul Coates in Ayrshire in Scotland to work with a relative of hers who had a pawnbroker shop. And in his autobiography, he talks about his trip to the three golden balls, which he thought was going to be something quite exciting and turned out quite differently. He, was he went home for two years when he was 15, so he was taken back in his family and they did try to establish himself, but he was a, a man who, as Kenneth McConkie said, went from rags to riches. And then the, this is the house which would the aunt called Trainview. His, his father died in a... In a, in a, in a uh, a, a drowning incident um, on his way to America, the map of that. So as I've explained already, he, his life expanded a long time. There's no, as I said, no overview of his artwork. But when you think about John Lavery and you think about his age, um, he painted Queen Victoria. Um, he, he, he knew everybody in, in each of the periods from the monarchs to the prime ministers straight through. And then to this painting at the end, the sunbathers. His life was, was long. He lived into his 80s. But his, his establishment at 1921, he had reached where he wanted to be financially and otherwise. Um, he, 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 he met Hazel Lavery in a, in a colony, uh, a painter's colony in, 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 in France. Um, you can see here that the middle image is her as a convalescent. Sometimes the, when you read about um, you know, self-portraits and their, their importance, it's how the person sees themselves. So did she see herself as confidently and as as, um, yes, she was known um, as the most beautiful girl in the Midwest in a competition she won, won, ran at, won at school, but that might be later Lady Lavery. Certainly when, when she met John Lavery, she had fallen in love with him as a great artist, and this is a, a, a sketches that they exchanged. Um, Quite different from later on. John Lavery, as I said, has already established himself. He's a, you know, in the ac 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 academic setting of, of Europe. He's also heading up um, the avant-garde artists. He's a member of the Glasgow Boys. They're, you know, using the French style. So he he he's everywhere. He knows everybody. The last small building at the end here of Cromwell Place. The whole um, the row is now an, an art gallery, is, and and uh, the the studio is a, an exhibition space and entertainment space. Um, but what's interesting about it is, is, is that this was um, in the centre of London, so you just give a sense of where it is. You can just imagine um, on a first re -trip, trip, trip, trip to London to actually discover where Cromwell Place was in, in, sort of, uh, in, in London and the area in which he found himself. So within sort of 10 years of literally getting himself trained through Paris, through London, um, coming from Glasgow, uh, returning to Glasgow for a while. He comes to the centre of London and where it's all happening. And he, he said in a fit of Irish recklessness, he got a, a lease to this house. The reason I'm concentrating so much on the context of this is, is in relation to the, the, the treaty delegation and the importance of 1921, because this is where it's happening. These, the, their neighbours are the Churchills. They, although he said he never knew his neighbour next door, not quite true. This was an area which was full of artists and, uh, and, 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 and the wealthy. If we look at, at society, which is a really important part of what I want to look at in terms of it as I, as I run through the time, um, the importance for here is that society was small, it was 
um, 200 great families, as Winston Churchill said, brilliant and powerful body, um, who knew everyone for generations, were related to everyone else. You could get a small estate to break in, but that wasn't even um, a guarantee that you would make it in society. And they all knew each other, and the importance of newcomers as artists and theatrical people, they were outstanding and well patronised some artists, but they didn't always have social access. And John Lavery, um, when he married Lady Lavery, was already part of the Asquith set. He was already friends with the Prime Minister. He had a home in Morocco and he had painted the royal family in Buckingham Palace. Now what's interesting about his access to the royal family is that they actually went to the Lavery's home in Cromwell Place and because the, the painting had been commissioned by Hugh Spottiswood, who was head of the Tatler, it was all covered in the press. It's really important. He used the same setup for his famous painting that's in the National um, Gallery of Ireland, the, um, the studio, where he depicts his family in a particular way and he sees himself a la Velasquez. Um, but what's interesting about this is the status and the idea of his wife in the centre here. When we talk about 1921 and we talk about their connections, I want you to realise that they don't get excluded from society. They are still being faded by royalty and we know that the, the royal um, connection into um, the, you know, the, the setting up of, the, of the, the circumstances in which the truce is negotiated. And this is um, uh, John Lavery painting the previous king and queen for Queen Mary's dollhouse in Windsor. Um, Hazel, as I said, in the early stages, really capitalised on her herself being an American, was, in the, was as Illinois in the Peace Ball, she, was, she, she courted uh, a little bit of notoriety, um, posing as the Madonna in the Tableau Vivons. This is St. Patrick's Church in Belfast, John painted a triptych for his native place, the, the last place he knew he was with both of his parents, he was baptised in the church, but I mean again, he offered to, to build a wing to house, house this particular painting, and then he became involved in a degree of controversy, people asked whether or not he was going to lose Lose his clientele by painting the, um, the, the painting of the, the, the treason, um, uh, uh, painting the foregone conclusion that Sir Roger Casement was going to be now stripped of his knighthood, um, was going to be uh, sentenced to death. And um, he did it as a commission. And in many ways, and we ha I've argued myself that this was his conversion, but now I'm looking at it more deeply. Bazano saw him as one of the British key, key figures um, in his photographic collection. And their, their house became a centre, as we know, for the, the negotiations. This is the studio where they hosted their parties of eight people, um, never a larger table than that. And the, her ladyship sitting room, which overlooks the front uh, uh, door so that she could see who was coming in. Um, but the friendship with, with Churchill is key. Even as later in 1920, during the War of Independence, Jen, Hazel and John do this incredible tour across Ireland, going to places that are very obscure and not on any tourist trail. I can tell you about more that if anyone's interested, and they, they, they do so writing back to the Minister of War, their friend Churchill. 15 and 16 he painted them. 15 is now part of the, of the collection in the Hugh Lane, but the other painting is in Chartwell, um, uh, his, his home. Um, you can see this, this particular um, press cutting, it's in the National Portrait Gallery collection, and you can see that Hazel Lavery is sitting beside Churchill in the Grosvenor, Grosvenor House at the, uh, the annual um, lunch. Their friendship with, with the um, Unionists is also important. They'd been part of Lady um, Londonderry's ARC parties that were full of the, um, the, the who's who of the time. And John Lavery, we have to remember also, was a member of the Reform Club. He was a, he was a Liberal. And being a part of the Reform Club, he was again in a gentleman's club where he had access to all of the important people. He was mixing with everybody and anyone, and when in 1920 he was sent across, he was painting the Cardinal Lowe. Uh, later he painted McCrory. But the reason I put both of these on screen is because what better, who better than an artist to have access to information and pass information. You get a lot of time with individual people, usually without observation, usually without anybody seeing what you're doing. And so as um, Griffith and, and, and Eamon de Valera came, as Gretchen has said, for that original conference, what's important to remember is they sat for their portraits, 
But when it came time for the next delegation to come, it wasn't a given. John wrote back to Art O'Brien, who was part of the Irish Self Determination League, and Hazel, as we now know from a collection that's been digitised recently in the National Library, she was writing directly to, to Desmond Fitzgerald. One person didn't let on what the other was doing, classic activity of trying to let on that you're a particular, particular way. And so, so what I wanted you to conclude at the end of this talk for the last three minutes is, is that while John was being um, somebody who was looking at Irish and when Collins died, he has painted his love of Ireland but while Lady Lavery was in public mourning, John Lavery said he wouldn't exhibit this painting, but instead he invited people to Cromwell Place to view it, and he later sold prints of this particular painting and other works that he did. He was commercial. This was um, what was happening at the time. It was at the forefront of all the newspapers. It was, he was Irish, she was American. Now she was saying she was Irish. I know that she knew that she was, had no Irish blood. In fact, she said to Edward Martin that, that she was related to him, and he said, we haven't had any beautiful women in our family. And he paused very diplomatically for all his relations when he said, yes. But the fact of the matter was, with Lady Lavery, we have to look beyond the tabloids. We have to look beyond the stories in the newspapers. Their, their own work that, that they, and their own letters that ended up in the public domain that I saw as a student all those years ago, I was led by the nose through all of that material, thinking and seeing them as they wanted to be seen. What I want you to think about for this conference is how unreal they were. It, what was the front? The private and the public personas are different. And what we need to understand in this period of the decade of centenaries is that history is far more complex. Our relationship with England is far more complicated. And John Lavery was was so well placed, his secret negotiations, and how he depicted, and the reason I brought the book was because how he depicted his wife. The stories that I got from the newspaper and from John Lavery are the ones that really distracted me. And for many, many years, I suppose I saw the story. I could have told you the story about the, about the material that was found in Collins's body from Lady Lavery, or I could tell you other stories about the Lavery, but I chose instead, and I had about another hour and a half to speak, and everyone who knows me knows that I could have spoken for another hour and a half, but I suppose I suppose what I want you to take away from this talk today is that as you go through that exhibition upstairs, and I urge you to come to the National Museum and see it, you will see a different story if you look beyond the um, images and think about the context. Thank you very much indeed. Sorry, is the microphone on here? Yep, okay. Um, well, if that's the warm-up, uh, I think um, everyone should get along to the Hugh Lane at the weekend, because I can um, I imagine what, what, what kind of a treat is in store for you. Um, I'm going to let you take a breath for a second, uh, and we're going to move into, uh, into, into the questions. As I said, uh, if anyone wants to actually pose a question online, please do, and I'll pick it up here and, and put it to our... Uh, two speakers. I might start with you though, Gretchen, and can I just say magnificent timekeeping from you both. You were almost on the second uh, of, the, of the 20 minutes. Um, we have about 15 minutes left, okay, so um, plenty of time, uh, I hope, for contrib uh, contributions from the floor. Just to get things rolling though, Gretchen, um, Roy Fest Foster um, once wrote, you know, that the best history is written by people who realise are read by people who realise that people in the past acted in the expectation of futures that were never going to happen. You know, I remember looking at newspapers in early 1914 and a sense of expectancy among Irish nationalists that home rule was finally going to be delivered. You know, they talked about housing, they talked about health in the context of what a home rule government would actually do with those issues. When I was reading your book, I get no sense that there was a, an expectation that a republic was actually going to be delivered. And this is during the truce, as the negotiations were going on. No sense of that at all. Yeah, but I think there had been a lot of setbacks. I mean, in 1919, they 
they weren't invited, they, they weren't um, able to access the, the um, Paris Peace Conference. They had, as I said, been frozen out of uh, the, the League of Nations. De Valera had travelled to America to um, try and um, hope, it was a futile hope, but he wanted to, um, he wanted the Americans to recognise the Republic and it didn't, it didn't work, it didn't happen. Um, he did, in that trip, I think, um, you know, put, uh, increase Ireland's profile, I guess, in, in America um, and maybe galvanise the, the uh, always fractious Irish-American uh, community. But um, ultimately, it didn't achieve anything in terms of recognition for Ireland. He, um, he didn't access the halls of power. And uh, I think there's, um, you have to recognise that ultimately, although there was a lot of sympathy from America for the Irish, uh, politically, they were not going to align themselves with uh, the Irish. And in fact, when, um, President Wilson thought that the, uh, the, the troubles in Ireland, he, you know, he, he really took the view, despite all this talk about self-determination, which he was really, for him, focused on the, the Central European situation. For him, uh, Ireland was a situation that needed to be worked out within the, the British Empire. He was entirely in favour of Ireland remaining within the British Empire. And that was the view within um, the, the American establishment. And can I just tell you, very clearly, it seems one of the great failings of the Irish negotiating team, they hadn't seemed to have worked out a bottom line or a clean line of argument on the issues that they were going to settle on, you know? Yeah. On Ulster hadn't been finalised. Um, de Valera's idea of external association had been discussed but not possibly understood by his negotiating team. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Dermot Ferreter has said that, you know, there's... Uh, there was, a strategic, uh, there was a strategic point to this ambiguity um, to kind of uh, play their cards close to their chest. But um, ultimately, no one was really... No, when they went to, to London, no one was really sure what the bottom line was. No one had a vision of what success looked like. They weren't clear on how far the, the concessions were or how far they should go in terms of the concessions. And um, this was, uh, you know, this is in contradiction to, to the British, who were extremely clear, because they had thrashed it out in the, in the weeks prior to that. Um, and, you know, I hope, as you might have seen from my talk, there was still an, an awful lot of um, fear and anxiety among the British about that. But to them, defence, empire, crown, these were the core issues. They would not... Um, move ground on those and they had to at all costs as far as they were concerned ensure that there was no there was no division if you like of, of this idea of the empire they did not want a divided crown they didn't want that to be a precedent for um, other uh, anti-nationalist uprisings uh, across the empire particularly India and Egypt uh, Sinead uh, the, the Lavries um, when the Irish delegation arrives in London and their home on Cromwell Place becomes this kind of setting for um, just for, for dinner parties and all of that sort of stuff, and, and also for, for sittings for paintings, the libraries themselves, as you pointed out, had very close connections to the British establishment. They were, you know, um, Sir John, he was knighted in end of 1917, beginning of 1918, um, uh, close to people in the Vice Regal Lodge in Dublin. Mm -hmm. um, was there a sus any suspicion on the part of the Sinn Féin negotiating team of the Laveries when they visited London? Yeah, I, I can just, I, I'm just flashing now at all the things I didn't say. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. It, it, they're, 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 he was knighted. Um, they're, they're in the establishment. I suppose it's, it, it's what I see at, this, at this, this moment, and I suppose it's sort of the, the extra story, and that is the, the key mover and shaker that they know is Andy Cope, who's the uh, civil servant that is sent over to Dublin Castle to negotiate peace behind uh, closed doors, and Eddie Marsh, who's um, 
whose Churchill's private secretary is in and out of Cromwell Place. So what you're looking for all the time are all those people that are in the, that are there that they are in contact with. So I think that the libraries were probably selected as 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 the right people. Um, John having his Northern Irish background, but also the the connections I've described. And what I think what Gretchen has said there is is very true. And what you 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 say to about not being able, and I think that's why Century Ireland works so well is that you're always in the moment and you're not projecting further ahead. And, and I suppose if you stop in 21, the, the whole interest for the libraries is that they continue their, 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 their association with Ireland right up through the imperial conferences. The, um, Hazel Library has aspirations to become the Irish um, Vice Rini and, and, and John is the Viceroy. It seems inc in, incredible now to think that they may have ended up in that role given sort of Ireland and, and what, what was what, what was happening, but when you see that that um, their closeness to Kevin O'Higgins, in, in you know who, get, who gets assassinated in 1927, he he was all for it. They're behind the scenes, even in the appointment of Tim Healy. So so I suppose when 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 you look at the treaty, and um, we again and and again the idea that they're hosting dinner parties, we're back at the same thing again. Is that it? The front is the informal setting, but what it is is that all those things that are, are not written. And, and one of the things was when I did my thesis all those years ago, and it was really good um, instruction for me, was it was the concept of salon politics and the idea that how, you know, in a period where we now talk about influencers, we talk about networkers, we talk about branding, all of those things the Lavery's did to perfection. And I suppose what, 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 I, what I, I, I sort of wanted to bring out, and I know this doesn't really answer your question, I'm, I'm turning into a politician now, giving you other answers, but what, what, I, what I didn't say and I really wanted to say was that when we look at it in, in a particular level and we think of them as being sort of, um, sort of pawns or not in control, right? But if you think about um, one quote that I, that I really want to bring out, and that is that Hanny Collins stayed friendly with the Laveries right up through um, her time. She was working in the civil service in Kensington. And she said about Lady Lavery in 1956, she said, Hazel Lavery was a very intelligent woman, something she generally managed to conceal. <laughs> So I think what I'm, what I'm saying to you is, is that it's a long, long, long and complicated answer. Sorry. Yeah. Gretchen, uh, imperial realities. Uh, it, it's probably true that uh, even Devon who doesn't go is conscious of imperial realities. You know? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, we underestimate how big a deal, really, the setback was for 1919. Really, the Sinn Féin leaders thought of that as a... Uh, as a huge setback, um, and uh, uh, sorry, I, I leapt in. And, uh, well, no, uh, just I, I was reading for Christmas, uh, yeah. Liam Weeks and uh, Michal Fartik's book yeah. uh, on, on on the treaty. You know, it's and they did this kind yeah, of word analysis, brilliant. word yeah. analysis of the treaty debates, and the word republic came up twelve hundred times, more than oath, more than anything else. I'm just thinking, right? Republic wasn't on offer. Um, De Valera never mentions it in his external um, association I idea. So he is trying to fit a solution, it seems to me, um, while not in the negotiations, around imperial considerations also. Yeah, it's extremely difficult to know. I mean, it's impossible to know really what exactly De Valera's plan was, you know, in the sense that um, would because what we do is we tend to see his reaction after the treaty and say, well, this is how he would have reacted prior to the treaty. And really no one uh, could quite read what de Valera's intentions were. But the important thing, I guess, to, to uh, understand is that in the lead up to the treaty negotiations, um, during that sort of long protracted um, correspondence between de Valera and Lloyd George after they had um, had this uh, meeting in um, London in July, the word republic was barely mentioned. And you know, so de Valera was trying, obviously, to manage expectations. Um, and the, the idea of, I, you know, it, it's impossible to know, did he think that external association was going to work? Was that ultimately the uh, formula that he had in mind that would keep the Sinn Féin movement together because they had this fear that if they 
you know, that this was the only way that they were going to achieve what they wanted in terms of a compromise. They had to keep the Sinn Féin movement together, and they didn't want to lose. Um, they didn't want to lose the support of the people. Uh, so, you know, I just I have to say, Eamon de Valera was uh, during when I was doing the book. I used to get so, uh, I used to tear myself in knots because I would try and work out what de Valera meant. And I would read his quotes over Welcome and over Ireland. again. <laughs> and, yeah, and then I would go back and I'd read, what did historians make of this? What did they say about that? And then, you know, um, and ultimately, I would guess, you know, that is, that was part of de Valera's genius, I, w I guess, in one way. He didn't, he, he, he behaved, I think, appallingly in, in, during the treaty negotiations, but ultimately he was a great statesman. I mean, he achieved what the Irish people wanted. And, um, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ah, don't drag <drink> me. <laughs> but um, I'm not, Collins or de Valera, I'm not on either side. But, you know, speaking from the outside, you know, in terms of, I always say that, I've lived here for a long time. Um, uh, speaking from the outside, it seems to me that um, it, you can't deny that there was a great will and desire for an Irish, for an independent Irish nation from the people of Ireland. They had gone through 1916, the War of Independence, and um, these had left lasting scars. You were never going to be able to go back to the, the pre-1914 era where there was going to be, uh, you know, and, and it looked impossible anyway with the Ulster Unionists. Um, always refusing or frustrating home rule. So, so there had to, I, I sort of think that there has to be some recognition that ultimately most people wanted independence in the end. Because if you think about after the treaty, English politics and the issue of English politics was, it, it never went away. I mean, England was Ireland's greatest external problem. Whereas Britain, they moved on. You know, they didn't, they didn't see it as that anymore, even though prior to that, from the 1880s up to the treaty, Ireland had been the biggest you know, internal problem and um, imperial problem for them to, to, to handle. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, I sort of think um, when the chips are in, de Valera, as far as I'm concerned, behaved abysmally during the treaty negotiations. He should have been there. But... Um, the, yeah, the question is, question, uh, let's not... Butter de Valera to death here. But, um, <laughs> no, just, no, no, uh, no, 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 but he, I think ultimately he, he, did, he, achieved, um, he achieved what he set out to do. Th there's a question <laughs> online here, just, to, just to, 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 to look again at, the, I suppose, the imperial dynamics here and, and the perspective of other dominions. A question here from uh, Mary Monroe online. Can Gretchen say something more about South African influence in Irish nationalism and learning from uh, the example in achieving dominion status. Um, was Smuts just arguing for a white empire? Oh, well, yeah, he was um, yeah, racist to his core. Um, you know, uh, he genuinely thought that white, Anglo-Saxon, it has to be said, people should be in charge of Africa, and, and that was um, the natural order of things, and that's why he loved the Commonwealth, because he sort of thought that... Um, well, I shouldn't minimise it. It's, it's a very complex subject, but he did... You know, this, his whole racial outlook was core to his, um, his views. But he, he genuinely believed in um, this idea of uh, a community of equal nations, and his, his, um, his theories on this were very influential. Um, but in terms of uh, the influence of South Africa, I mean, the influence of South Africa on the Irish was huge because of... The Boer War, you know, the, the Irish nationalists identified with the Boers um, and in uh, trying to, in, to to fight the, their way for independence. Um, and Jan Smuts, it must be said as well, uh, was very good friends with a lot of Irish nationalists. Um, a lot of prominent, um, I think it was, uh, well, Alice Stopford Green and um, a whole a whole slew of them. I've forgotten all their names now. But <laughs> Have we got a question from anyone in the room? which is the exhibition, The Portrait of a Nation. And as you rightly said, Dr. McCool, the branding and the creation of the image was so important to the Navarrese as a couple. And I was very curious, when you were branding this exhibition, the choice of three pictures that you made for the poster. Uh, Lady Lavery, you've got Churchill, and you've got Collins. Was that choice made on artistic, or was it made on political grounds? 
I didn't. Uh, yes, that's for you, Audrey. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the hospital pass. Um, so I'm Logan Sisley, so I co-curated the exhibition. Uh, I guess we had several, we had a, a lot of debate around um, uh, the uh, design for the exhibition, and you notice the cover doesn't have any image on it, you know, which probably publishers aren't so keen on, but um, I get, yeah, it was trying to kind of have some kind of sense of balance. Do we put, you know, do, we, do people read a certain political message into if we put one person on the cover or two people on the cover? Or, uh, and I guess Collins, Churchill, um, Hazel, Lavery, it, it, it kind of encapsulates a lot of the story in those three figures. But um, we had several designs, there's different posters. Uh, one takes some of the, the kind of graphic from one of the uh, pamphlets. Um, so there were several different designs you see on bus shelters around town and, and used in advertising. So, uh, yeah, it, it was a difficult kind of balancing act that the libraries themselves uh, I do, I, do think, I do think what's, what's really interesting in terms of the overall debate is that um, I, I, maybe it, it's what came to mind for you is that this idea of the minimization of, of Arthur Griffith is, uh, yeah, and, and, and that's, a, you know, that is always the, the one, but I suppose when you're, when you're talking about a pull for a story and, you know, you, you, you know that, that idea of what, what brings in an audience, um, you, know, you know, Collins is the, is, is the billboard and, and the idea of Winston Churchill being instantly recognisable is, is really important. Um, and sorry, if I could if go over for a minute. There was a poster that went around for one of the votes against Europe years ago. And on the poster, it had all the, the, about four of the leaders of the 1916 Rising. And I used to ask my children who were in school and should have had a knowledge of who they were to tell me who they were. And they couldn't tell me who any of them were. So I suppose the, the idea is, is that when you make a poster, it's the same thing. It's like you're, you're bringing in the general audience. And, and in a way, I spoke today in a very much in a shorthand. So you, know, you, you, you want to assume knowledge from so many people. And, and I, think, um, I think that's the difficulty always in terms of curation. And even in the decade of commemoration is so much of it will be directed by the general public and general interest and documentary makers and TV makers and, mm -hmm. and all of that. And then we historians and others are trying to catch up and saying, but... But, <laughs> uh, uh, will you allow us one more question? Yeah. Uh, anyone else? One more from the floor? Okay, it'll fall to me then. Um, uh, can I just ask you, Sinead, just for all the talk of salon politics and the conviviality of, um, of, of the Lavery's home and the dinners and the paintings and all that sort of stuff, it, has their influence on negotiations been exaggerated um, in terms of kind of the relationships, because ultimately it comes down to a threat of war at the end of it all. And the British don't offer anything in December that they weren't offering the previous July. I, I suppose that the idea of the threat of war is one of the things that is, that is happening. Mm. And one of the things that, happen, that happens in this period in the, in the lead up to the, the signing is you know, you know, why did the signing happen? Have to happen in December? You know, why was it not pushed out? Why did the why did it all of a sudden go? Yes, they were plenipotentiaries. Yes, they had the power to sign. Why did it all change? You know, the, I, the, the letters that I was writing or reading, sorry, excuse me, um, during my 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 my. Um, my undergraduate was to try and figure out whether or not the, you know, why, what had happened in terms of the socialising, what had happened in terms of people being distracted, being broken up. And one of the things that you see is, is that one of the key things of the Welsh wizard was he broke up the negotiation. He made subcommittees. He, he broke everyone down into, into in, in, compartmentalised. And so you do have, um, you know, other delegates listening to the people that, that the Lavries are introducing to them. They're influencing them them in a particular way and this is the problem is is that if you really you know this in terms of negotiation if you want to get something over, over the line in a meeting it's mostly outside the meeting that you do the work and that's what what I'd say is that if we if we really are going to understand the complexity um, you have to understand that not everything is documented and probably some of the most key things aren't documented so I would argue that they had a far bigger influence than um, than that people realize but as a historian, it's finding that piece of paper, it's finding that, 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 that reference. And to be honest with you, at the moment, there isn't that material in, in you know, and I don't think it will ever come to light. 
Well, it was a worry about were, were the British eavesdropping um, mm -hmm. on the Irish delegation? I mean, most mm. likely they were. Mm. <laughs> they but were. You know, we have, we're yet to turn up the evidence on, on that. So, you know. Okay, we're, we're now over time, and I'm sure everyone is uh, trying to get a copy. I'd like yeah. to thank Sinead and Gretchen, and I can't urge you more. Let's go out and buy their books. I think it's a short book, uh, short break, uh, for a couple of short books. <laughs> Thrilling books, but, uh, great reads. Short break for a coffee, and we'll be back, I think, at 15 minutes, and it'll be the great uh, Leanne Lane in the chair here. Okay, thank you.
Hi, um, you're very welcome back. Um, and um, uh, so we're, we're, we're into a really great morning of Portrait of a Nation, our conference here um, at the National Museum of Ireland in partnership with the Hugh Lane Gallery. Um, and our first panel, which explored, uh, I suppose, the, the context around the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Now we look at some of the immediate responses um, in a panel entitled Politics of Identity and Place. And it's my great pleasure to introduce the chair of this next session to you, Dr. Leanne Lane. Um, Leanne is a lecturer in the School of History and Geography in Dublin City University. And her primary area of research is modern Irish history with a specialization in 19th and 20th century gender and women's history. She's the author of Rosamond Jacob, Third Person Singular, and Dorothy McCardle. Dr. Lane is currently working on a biography of Mary McSweeney, and in 2012, she was appointed by the Taoiseach to the expert advisory group of the Decade of Centenaries. So it's uh, delighted to hand over to uh, Dr. Lane now for uh, uh, the next panel. Thanks. Thank you, Helen. Um, so this panel is entitled Politics of Identity and Place, and our first speaker is uh, Mary Staines. Mary completed her MPhil in Modern Irish History uh, at Trinity College Dublin in 2016, um, following her retirement as a clinical director, consultant, psychiatrist. Uh, she contributed with Professor Eunor Halp in a chapter entitled Between Two Hells, the Social, Political and Military Backgrounds and Motivations of the 121 TDs who voted who voted for or against the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Uh, and um, she is currently uh, a PhD candidate in Trinity College, uh, expanding and deepening her research on the above topic. And her paper today is entitled Identity and Place in the Treaty Debates. Good morning, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, Jermbeth Bulger and the National Museum for the kind invitation to speak at this conference. The Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed on 6th of December, 1921. Following a bitter and divisive de cabinet meeting on December the 8th, where Griffith, Collins, Barton and Cosgrave voted in favour of referring the treaty to the Doyle for ratification, and De Valera, Stack and Brewer voted against. The Dáil debates started on the 14th of December in the Council Chamber of University College Dublin at Earlsford Terrace. Some days of private debate followed to discuss, according to Griffith, whether they had exceeded their powers, and according to De Valera, how the team broke. The public debate commenced on December the 19th until a recess, which was mainly resisted by those who were on the anti-treaty side on December the 22nd. It recommenced on January the 3rd and lasted until the vote was taken on January 7th, which was within 24 hours of de Valera threatening to resign as leader. This paper is part of my PhD and a work in progress. I have conducted a prosopography of the 121 TDs who voted in that debate and am attempting to propose some formulations as to why they decided to vote the way they did. In this paper, I look at whether the notion of place had any influence on the decision on which way to vote. Initially, I will show the overall outcome of my work on the sociodemographic profiles and the revolutionary activities of the TDs. I will then look at subsamples based on constituencies where the vote was split. There were 121 Sinn Féin TDs in the second all, all of whom, of whom 20, 121 voted. All had been elected unopposed in May 1921, and 73 of them had sat in the first doll. They were selected by local Kjorla Kjantar with varying influences from the IRA, the IRB and Sinn Féin and subsequently ratified by the Standing Committee of Sinn Féin Executive. Only six women were ratified. Sociodemographic analysis shows that the mean age 
was 38.9 years overall, with the pro-treaty TDs averaging at 37.25, whilst the anti-treaty average was 40.8. In relation to social class overall, the TDs were not representative of the general population, with a much higher rate of professionals therein. In the vote, professional and agricultural groups were almost equally divided, but with a higher rate in the commercial group for the treaty and the industrial group against. Within the professional group, lawyers were more likely to vote for and teachers against the treaty. There were six women, which again was totally unrepresentative of the general population. I have reviewed the revolutionary activity of the TDs, including military and political, and the numbers imprisoned during the period 1916 to 1921. 39 TDs had been active during Easter week, with 22 voting for and 17 against the treaty. Several TDs had been imprisoned during various periods throughout this time. In the post-1916 period, 53 TDs were imprisoned, with 27 voting for and 23 against. In the 1918, in the so-called German plot, 27 TDs were arrested, of whom 14 voted for and 13 against the treaty. During the War of Independence, 1919 to 1921, 43 TDs were imprisoned, with 24 for the treaty and 19 against. In addition to national politics, several TDs were involved in local government. In, Jan in the January 1920 elections, for example, Sinn Féin won control of 338 out of 393 rural bodies. 70 TDs had been involved in local politics, and of those, 36 voted for the treaty and 34 against. Review of IRA activity of the TDs indicated that 41 TDs were involved at these levels. 13 TDs were active at general headquarters level, with eight voting for and five against. 13 TDs were in command positions, with four in favor and nine against. And there were 13 TDs otherwise active with the ratio 12, 4, and 3 against. In relation to the IRB, Collins was president of its Supreme Council and it had supplied him with protection during the negotiations in London. The Supreme Council was in favour of the treaty but allowed that members could vote as they saw fit. Uh, 39 TDs were members of the IRB, of whom 25 voted for the treaty and 14 against. There were six women TDs, all of whom had been members of Common Naman, and all of whom voted against the treaty. The next slide shows the geographical spread of the vote. As can be seen, the border counties and the east were more likely to vote for the treaty, with the south against and the west with equal preference for both sides. 73 TDs which is 60%, were born or reared in the constituency they represented. Of these, 41 or 56% voted for and 32 or 44% against. It could be argued that connection with the constituency was a positive variable towards the for vote. Given these data, it is possible to argue that pro-treaty TDs were more likely to be younger, working in the commercial sector, involved in 1916, to have been imprisoned, a member of the IRB, active in the IRA, GHQ or otherwise, but not in a command position. In relation to constituency representation, they were more likely to have been born in the constituency they represented. In my research, I am examining what they said about why they voted the way they did and looking at how their experiences and alliances may have influenced how they've come to that decision. In this paper, I look at the notion of place in the debates. Um, Tonnies, who is a German philosopher, spoke of the notion of Heimat, uh, which is loosely homeland, a living substance that persists in the never-ending flux of its elements. 
He argued that the physical landscape defines and shapes a nation and its identities, and that there's a deep connection that people have to the places that have shaped their existence. Does this have any relevance to the debate and to the vote? I have taken two samples, constituencies, where the vote was split, and I will discuss these now with particular emphasis on references um, to their constituencies by the TDs in the debate. So Clare was the centre of David Fitzpatrick's groundbreaking study, Politics and Irish Life, 1913 to 21. It documented the supremacy of local over national interests in shaping the Irish Revolution. This four-seat constituency was formed by the amalgamation of the previous single-seat ones of East and West Clare. East Clare had been held unopposed by Willie Redmond of the Irish National Land League and a fervent supporter of Parnell since 1900. Following his death in France in 1917, a by-election was called. Michael Brennan, in his witness statement, recalls that the volunteers and Sinn Féin supporters wanted him to stand, but he recommended de Valera as the recognised leader of the penal servitude prisoners. There was, quote, strong opposition as the old people and the clergy wanted John McNeil, unquote. However, if McNeil were to be selected, the volunteers <clears throat> would run de Valera in opposition to McNeil's actions, due to McNeil's actions in 1916. De Valera defeated Patrick Lynch KC in that by-election and was elected unopposed in 1918. The West Clare constituency was held unopposed by Arthur Lynch of the Irish Parliamentary Party since 1909, but he did not stand in 1918. Brian O'Higgins was selected, most probably imposed by general headquarters, despite some local misgivings about representation by the, quote, Meath poet, unquote. In the 1921 election, Paddy Brennan and Sean Liddy were both selected, and all four were elected unopposed. Brennan and Liddy were both born in the constituency, whilst de Valera was born in the US but reared in Limerick and resident in Dublin. And O'Higgins was born in County Meath and had worked in Clare only since 1917. In the treaty debate, de Valera and O'Higgins both voted against with Brennan and Liddy for the treaty. This constituency followed the general trend whereby those born or reared in the constituency voted for the treaty. Brennan and Liddy were relatively young, from farming backgrounds, and single. They had both been quite active in the IRA and had been imprisoned and on hunger strike. In contrast, both de Valera and O'Higgins were older, uh, de Valera a teacher, and O'Higgins an Irish teacher and Gaelic league organiser. Both had been involved in 1916 and interned thereafter. Their subsequent revolutionary activity was mainly in the political and propaganda spheres. During the debate, de Valera spoke on every day of the debate, and only Mary McSweeney and Arthur Griffith spoke for longer in total. He did not refer specifically to his constituencies either in Clare or Down. On the 22nd of December, Clare County Council, which was presided over by Michael Brennan, an IRA commandant mentioned earlier, and brother of Paddy, the sitting TD, passed a resolution urging that the Anglo-Irish Treaty be ratified and noting the Council's great apprehension at, quote, differences prevailing in Doyle Aaron, unquote. They were concerned regarding a war of annihilation and world opinion would be against Ireland. The resolution continued, quote, but what we wish to urge on our representatives as a consideration outweighing all other considerations is the preservation of national unity, unquote. It concluded, quote, we have the honour to be the constituencies of President de Valera. His record since 1916 has been one of great and noble service to the nation, and we feel confident that he will always give due consideration to the welfare and wishes of his people, unquote. De Valera does not seem to have heeded this call. He felt that he knew what the Irish people wanted by looking into his own heart. O'Higgins was more direct when he spoke on the 3rd of January for 15 minutes. Quote, I am against the treaty on principle and on principle alone. I have heard it stated that we should vote as our constituents wish us to vote because they are our masters. I agree they are the masters of our political thought, but they are not the masters of our souls. 
He asserted, quote, I am not misrepresenting those who had the best influence in the constituency, unquote. He was contradicted by his constituency colleague Brennan at this stage, you are. Further in the debate, when he spoke for five minutes on the 7th of January, Brennan questioned whether, quote, Dr. Reverend Dr. Fogarty and the chairman of Clare County Council were representative of the worst influences in Clare, unquote. Liddy did not speak during the debate. In the packed election in 1922, the same candidates were all elected unopposed. By contrast, I will now discuss the constituency of Carlo Kilkenny, in which the vote was again split, but it does show some interesting differences. Carlo Kilkenny was a four-seat constituency which had been formed in 1921 from the amalgamation of the single-seat constituencies of Carlo, Kilkenny North and Kilkenny South. These had previously held by the Irish Parliamentary Party until 1917, when W.T. Cosgrave won a by-election in Kilkenny North. In 1918 general election, he retained a seat there. James Lennon of Sinn Féin won the seat in Carlow, and James O'Mara in Kilkenny South. Subsequently, O'Mara resigned his seat as his daughter Patricia Lavelle noted, quote, after De Valera's return to Ireland, Dad and he disagreed. Dad objected to what he considered undue influence in the execution of his work, and he resigned from his American activities, also from his trusteeship of the Doyle loan and his membership of the Doyle, unquote. Therefore, for the 1921 election, two further candidates were selected, Gerard O'Sullivan and Ned Aylward. In the debate, Cosgrave and O'Sullivan voted for the treaty, with Lennon and Aylward against. In contrast to the whole cohort, those voting for the treaty were not born in the constituency. Cosgrave lived in and was deeply involved in national and local politics in Dublin and rarely visited the constituency. O'Sullivan hailed from Kerry but did have associations as he had been a teacher in Knockbeg College in County Carlow and was made brigand commandant for the area. Aylward was from Callan and had commenced studying for the priesthood, but left in 1918 to avoid possible conscription. He joined the Callan Company, which became the 7th Battalion of the Kilkenny Brigade. Lennon was from Carlow and was, quote, one of the most best known and respected businessmen in South Carlow, unquote. In 1918, the Nationalist and Leinster Times noted, Quote, many workers are engaged in canvassing for the popular candidate, Mr. James Lennon, who is at present in Belfast jail. When the news of the treaty signing reached Kilkenny, the newspapers reported on the, quote, relief and joy, unquote. A tangible outcome was the release of internees. Several from Callan arrived from Port Leash and were welcomed with, by crowds with banners and tricolours. The Sinn Féin mayor of Kilkenny supported the treaty, as did all the local newspapers. The county council saw no alternative, and both North and South Kilkenny Sinn Féin executives overwhelmingly supported it. Why was the vote split? The two TDs born outside the constituency were both part of the military and political elite. Cosgrave was the Minister for Local Government and had supported the treaty at the pivotal cabinet meeting on December the 8th, quote, much to de Valera's surprise, unquote. In the debate, he spoke for 45 minutes on the 21st of December, arguing that it was the best settlement that could be achieved. He provided, according to the press, delightful comic relief, unquote. O'Sullivan was Adjutant General of the IRA, a member of the IRB, and a cousin of Collins. He wrote to the Nationalist and Leinster Times regarding his selection was because of my efforts while in Carlow to lead its citizens to an appreciation of their duties to the Republic. Notwithstanding widely different views on political matters, Carlow was noted for its hospitality to strangers. Unquote. During the debate, he spoke for 15 minutes on the 6th of January, citing the treaty's intrinsic value and that there was no reasonable argument had been put forward for its rejection and that it was the will of the people. He also challenged his co-deputies to a plebiscite in his constituency of 11,000 voters. I believe, and I will lay any odds, that I will beat them 500 to 1. The two other TDs who voted against were born in the constituency. As mentioned, Lenin had been a very popular candidate in 1918 and had been in prison during the election. In the debate, he spoke for seven minutes on the 7th of January, stating, I will not 
vote or cast my vote to, to bring these men into the British Empire, no matter how many sheaves of rev, rev, resolutions I get to the effect, resign or, or ratify. He said that he was prepared to accept the challenge of his co-deputy. Aylward, in a seven-minute speech on 6th of January, stated, I was elected by the people of South Kilkenny, and the people know what views I have, because at that time I was fighting for the realisation of those views. Should my constituents change their mind, that they can, then they can remove me at the next election and put in a politician, unquote. It is interesting to note that O'Sullivan and Aylward had never contested an election, and in the 1922 so-called pact election, these four TDs were renominated by Sinn Féin, but it was also contested by Labour and the Farmers' Party. Patrick Gaffney, Gaffney of Labour topped the poll, with Cosgrave also elected on the first count. Dennis Gorey of the Farmers' Party was elected on the second count, and O'Sullivan on the fourth count. Aylward, with 10% of first preferences, and Lennon, with 36 lost their seats. In conclusion, the decision, decision about which way to vote in this debate was multifaceted and complex, as is, has been shown in these two case studies, and cannot be explained simply. My PhD work is looking in depth at this issue from, from many perspectives, including personal experiences of bereavement and imprisonment. But as Professor Yunan O'Halpin and I have shown in our case study on two of the TDs, it was clear that the TDs had heartfelt commitment to Irish separatism, but could not agree on how that could be achieved. And I'd like to give special thanks to Dr. Anne Dolan, Professor Eunan O'Halpin, and Dr. Brian Hanley for their continued encouragement and support in my work. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Connor Morrissey. Uh, Connor is a lecturer in Irish and British history at King's College London and previously held appointments in Trinity College Dublin and Hertford College, University of Oxford. His book, Protestant Nationalists in Ireland, 1900 to 1923 from Cambridge University Press has recently appeared in uh, paperback and uh, Connor's uh, paper is entitled Protestant Nationalists and Protestant Servicemen and the Treaty. All right. Thanks very much and I'd like to thank the museum for this uh, kind opportunity to speak with you. Uh, today. So the Anglo-Irish Treaty, the split, uh, the resultant civil war are clearly among the most significant occurrences in the country's recent history. And the war destroyed the delicate unity of Sinn Féin, eased the way towards partition, and left Irish politics with a peculiar structure which has just about uh, endured to this day. And nationalists in choosing whether to support the treaty compromise were making a decision which would have profound personal as well as political consequences. But today I'm going to talk about two specific groups. Um, firstly, I want to highlight some of those Protestant nationalists who chose to support the treaty and the free state. But in particular today I want to talk about, or want to highlight a, a completely forgotten group, I think, which were those Protestant servicemen who chose to join the Free State Army. Um, and some of the questions I'm going to consider include, why did some Protestant nationalists support the treaty? And who were these Protestant National Army servicemen? And what was their background and what motivated them? So prosopography is definitely in fashion uh, in, in Irish history at the moment. Um, Throughout 1921, as the war took its toll on, on their community, the Church of Ireland hierarchy and the Gazette uh, made frequent, vaguely formulated calls for an end to violence and for a peaceful, agreed settlement. Even representatives of the Presbyterian Church in the South, whose members had always been the most hesitant about engaging in Southern politics at all, uh, expressed very similar sentiments, or strikingly similar sentiments by the leaders of almost all the Protestant churches. Um, it's unsurprising then that Southern Unionists um, the bulk of Protestants, certainly, um, greeted the signing of the treaty with relief. Um, there is a broader context here which I'd like to highlight, which is that Protestant political organizations throughout the South um, until 1916 was complex, robust, 
frequently confident, but it's clear that especially once partition had come into effect in the north, um, and it was becoming obvious that at least one wing of Sinn Féin was going to be in charge of the rest of the country, um, that Protestants began inhabiting a shrinking sphere of political activism. It's extremely striking how many organizations um, which have been expected to provide, or they expected themselves to provide an institutional voice for Protestant, let's say, ex-unionists after independence, um, simply closed their doors. Uh, Lord Middleton's anti-partition league was wound down in 1922, although he himself was opposed to this. The more die-hard Irish Unionist Alliance gave up political uh, activities early that same year. And the moderate Irish Dominion League, which had pr provided a home for the old Protestant home rule tradition um, was even earlier. It dissolved itself at the end of 21, but in fact, it, it had stopped meeting by the middle of 1921, and partition really being what, what um, um, provoked a lot of this. Um, with political and aristocratic leadership absent, statements by the church leadership took on added weight. Um, the Church of Ireland hierarchy um, sought to ensure their flock would support the new state. John Allen Gregg here, uh, closer to me, um, um, preaching after the signing of the treaty, argued that although the union was the wisest form of government, Anglicans should offer the new state our loyalty and our goodwill. Godfrey Day of Ossery, who was in fact a, a member of Gaelic legal organisations, went further. He stated they should, and I quote, support the government ungrudgingly, loyally and wholeheartedly with the same willing obedience and servants with which we supported the old. Comments such as this may have spurred Church of Ireland recruitment into the Free State Army, and more on this in a couple of minutes. Um, the Southern Unionist, or perhaps former Unionist press, strongly supported the provisional government, which was set up in the wake of the treaty. Even Arthur Griffith, who they had for decades denounced as a dangerous radical, was praised for exhibiting a previously undetected conservatism. Um, if Protestant Unionists throughout the South were desperate for an end to violence and relieved that the treaty had been agreed, what about their nationalist co-religionists? So I've spent the last couple of years studying Protestant nationalists, um, the minority of individuals who rejected unionist politics and joined separatist organizations. Um, there's no doubt that Protestants, many of them relative newcomers to nationalism and who had made great personal sacrifices on behalf of the cause, were disproportionate among those opposed to the treaty. Um, iconic figures such as Erskine Childers, uh, the Catholic convert Constance Markiewicz, or indeed Albinia Broderick and Kerry, um, whose brother Lord Middleton in fact led the, the Southern Unionist movement, so there was a real split in that family, um, all attest to this. Here I have um, Erskine Childers and Constance Markiewicz. Um, and other stories, I mean Desmond and Mabel Fitzgerald um, had a religiously and ultimately politically mixed marriage. She was a Belfast Presbyterian uh, opposed to the treaty and her husband Desmond, a Catholic minister in the provisional government, supported it. Um, they came extremely close to separation. People believe they were separated but they actually didn't separate. Um, uh, and when their younger son Garrett, who was later Taoiseach of Ireland, was born in 1926. He was nicknamed in national circles the Child of Reconciliation. So they pretty much were separated for a long time. Um, however, the largely biographical nature of the literature on, on Protestant nationalists may give a misleading impression that they were um, um, uniformly radical by 21. Uh, and that they were solely committed to achieving, let's say, an all-Ireland republic. In fact, numerous Protestant nationalists supported the treaty and gave their allegiance to the Free State, and I'm going to highlight a couple of them now. Uh, the most prominent was, or, um, was probably uh, Ernest Blythe, and he's in an interesting position because he's the sole Protestant Ulsterman in the Dole. Um, and by the early 1920s, he had become eager to conciliate Northern Protestant opinions. So, what he said carried a certain amount of weight. Uh, in a memorandum circulated to cabinet colleagues, he stated that the provisional government should seek good relations with Ulster until unity would, and I quote, come to be regarded as a wise and economical thing by the majority in the six counties. Uh, Blythe warned his colleagues that, and I quote again, the unity of Ireland is of sufficient importance for us to take a chance in the hope of gaining it. The first move lies with us. There is no urgent desire for unity in the Northeast, and it would be stupid obstinacy for us to wait till the Belfast attitude improved. 
Um, and this became one of the, the many themes of the, the, the rest of his life. Um, the treaty came as a great relief as well to Yeats, um, disgusted by the policy of reprisals, yet unimpressed by what he perceived as Republican fanaticism. He had long sought a dominion settlement without the coercion of Ulster, essentially what happened. Um, with the signing of the, of the agreement, he too perceived the transformation of Arthur Griffith into a conservative hero. He had uh, distrusted Griffith since the Playboy riots of 1907. And this is another quote, it's quite famous. Um, I expect to see Griffith, now that he is the universal target, grow almost mellow and become a fanatic of broad-mindedness and accuracy of statement. Hitherto, he has fired at the coconuts, but now that he's a coconut himself, he may become milky. Um, and that, that was a letter to, to A.E. George Russell. Alice Stopford Green, very famous, um, um, well, originally, yes, was liberal, radical, and nationalist um, uh, historian, supported the treaty. And for her, it was her experiences visiting uh, Boer prisoners of war in St. Helena at the end of 1900. She thought that the idea of setting up concentration camps in the South, which was her great fear. Uh, but that was enough, she said, to provoke her to uh, support the treaty. So again, these links with uh, South Africa and links with the Dominion status of South Africa were on lots of people's lips during this period, as we've already mentioned. Her decision, and that of most of her large family, to so publicly support the treaty, she, she um, distributed pro-treaty pamphlets in the streets of Dublin with her brother Edward, uh, were noted by several observers at the time. Robert Barton was moved to write to one of the few anti-treaty family members, Dorothy Stopford, um, to congratulate her, and I quote, on having remained a Republican when so many of your relations have gone wrong. Um, Alice Stopford Green was an executive member of Common Assyrtia, uh, the women's pro-treaty organization, along with another one of her nieces, Alice Wordsworth. Uh, even a leading, perhaps the leading, Ulster Protestant nationalist by 1921, F.J. Bigger, the antiquarian and Gaelic leaguer, um, a nationalist activist, he'd always disliked violence, but he also welcomed the treaty, believing that, the, I quote, the tide of Anglicanism has been successfully rolled back, and he hoped for speedy resolution between North and South. And that's quite common, actually, that idea that um, such a great success will be made uh, by the free state. And this is exactly Blyde's argument to a large extent as well, that development in the free state will prove such a magnet that the six counties will want to vote for speedy unity. Um, but the most significant Protestant nationalist endorsement came at an institutional level. The Irish Guild of the Church, or Common Gaelic na Hoglisha, have been founded to promote Gaelic revival ideals in the Church of Ireland. However, after 1916, its members, many of its members had been radicalized, and by 1918, there was a kind of a coup d'etat within the guild, led by a Republican figure called Captain George Irvin, which saw um, the guild act as a sort of an unofficial Sinn Féin club in Dublin. Um, and despite the presence of hardline Republicans, such as Geoffrey Coulter or Albini Broderick, in the organization, its or, or, um, newspaper, The Gaelic Churchman, um, um, urged that there was a Christian obligation to support the new state as it had been um, approved by the majority of the public. Um, what many of these figures have in common is a desire to accept a compromise they thought was fair, a wish for nationalists to put aside constitutional abstraction, and a hope that elected representatives would concentrate on building a new self-governing state. But there may be another reason. It's famously challenging to explain the treaty split in terms of social class. Um, however, and you know, Bill Kassan's recent words that it's spectacularly unconfirmed. Um, but uh, many of these figures were well to do, and their views in many cases were becoming more conservative. Those, for example, with an ICA background, such as Markiewicz or Dr. Dr. Kathleen Lynn, tended to oppose the treaty. So for many Protestant nationalist pro-treatyites, 1922 represented the first time in decades they had shared the same political views then with their co-religionists. This would lead to some interesting interactions in the 1920s. However, the War of Independence had caused previously unwavering positions to harden, and soon hundreds of Southern Protestants would join the Free State Colours. So I want to talk about the uh, Free State Army for the rest of this paper, for the next eight minutes and 19 seconds, I see. Um, under the terms of the treaty, a provisional government was set up and uh, a national army. So the Free State Army, I'm going to refer to as the National Army uh, for the next couple of minutes. Um, there was an enthusiastic response to Collins' call for recruits. A thousand 
men per day, um, peaking at 60,000. Um, although better armed and more professionally led than the IRA had ever been, there were important commonalities between the National Army and the pro the pre-1922 organization. The Catholic, largely Catholic ethos remained and was institutionalized. Catholic chaplains were appointed, soldiers paraded outside church on Sundays, and days were punctuated with intonation of the rosary. Little wonder that in 1923, Daniel Colan, the Catholic Bishop of Cork, declared that the National Army is the army of the most Catholic nation on earth. However, the new army was not exclusively Catholic. According to the Free State Army Census of the night of the 12th to 13th of November 1921, 251 Protestants served. And here is uh, Richard Mulcahy um, um, uh, in Beggar's Bush inspecting the National Army troops. Um, there were 251 Protestants serving in the National Army on the night of the Army Census. This amounts to 0.76%. Um, I've identified 31 of these as being British recruits, mostly ex-servicemen, so I'm excluding them, which leaves a kind of residue of 220 Irish Protestants who served in the National Army on that night. Um, I conducted this research prior to the recent digitization of the records. Um, the existence of these Protestant soldiers in the National Army represents an unresearched and I think fairly forgotten aspect of the history of the Irish Civil War and the coming of independence. So who were these soldiers? Yeah, um, so here's the denominational breakdown. Church of Ireland um, uh, comprised about three quarters of Southern Protestant general, and they represented about 86% of National Army soldiers. There were disproportionately smaller numbers of Presbyterians um, and Methodists um, just about um, um, making up a, a proportionate representation. In terms of social class, which may be more important or more interesting, um, I've traced about 91 of their fathers against the 1901 or 1911 census, which gives some sense of who they were. I initially presumed that these were uh, perhaps ex-RUC men, um, or that they were unionists who found that the Free State Army was a, perhaps an anti-Republican unit and that that was the purpose. But as you can see, they tend to come from the skilled working class, and very, very few of them can be found to have any uh, from political families at all. Um, um, they were from a, a working class, a lower middle class background. Examples include Henry Bovenizer, an Anglican private from Dublin, whose father was a general labor. Isaac Bradley, Church of Ireland member from Kilkenny, whose father was a harness maker. David Marshall, a member of the United Free Church of Scotland, whose father was a coppersmith. Um, only five of the 91 belonged to the professional classes. They included jo John Bowers, a 19-year-old private from Kilkenny, whose father was a magistrate, um, or Anthony Tatlow, a 19-year-old volunteer from Dublin, son of a solicitor. Um, I've looked at their fathers, by the way, because most of them, they often used army ages, so they, they were only schoolboys in 1901 or 1911, if they were alive in 1911. In terms of rank, um, how senior were they? As you can see, the vast majority um, were volunteers or privates. Only 16 served as volunteers. And elsewhere, um, I found uh, evidence that there ended up being 18 Protestant officers serving in the army. Um, in my book, I trace Protestants who served in the Irish volunteers during the War of Independence and before, and almost no connection can be drawn between Protestants who served in the Irish volunteers, let's say 1919 to 1921, and these individuals here. So there's something new. Um, only one among the 220 I can identify as having been an active guerrilla during the period 1919 to 1921, and that's Peter Steep, a member of the Limerick Palatine community who was served as a sergeant in Limerick uh, during the war, sorry, during the Civil War. Um, ex accounts of the experiences of these soldiers are few, and it's difficult to find out much about them individually. However, one article in Antogluck, the official journal of the National Army, is illuminating. The anonymous writer maintained that on stating his religion to the recruiting officer, he, knowing the army, of course, to be predominantly Catholic, felt an involuntary thrill of apprehension, and he said he anticipated difficulties. In fact, writing nine months after his enlistment, he records a generally positive experience. He was excused church parade, facilities were offered him to worship in the Church of Ireland. He claimed that the first rector he met on, on service, I quote, tended me a hearty welcome and we had a long talk. Indeed, such was his experience of the clergy in every village in which he'd been stationed. 
So things are changing, certainly, in the Church of Ireland. Um, he maintained that his fellow soldiers showed him no antagonism. And I quote, Of course, one has occasionally met a sincere Catholic who has endeavoured to reason one as to the wrong belief held, but such talks have always been conducted with due reverence to the subject and no antagonism has arisen. Um, the other quote he says, which I think is interesting, is, and I quote, the only time that actual embarrassment occurs is at mealtimes. The sounding of the Angelus and on retiring are arising. Then certain devotions are paid by my comrades, comrades in which I do not join, but no remark passes on my failing to do so. Um, and, and certain Protestants who joined the Irish Volunteers mentioned something similar in previous year, earlier years as well. Just a slight sense of unease. Um, the, the, the death of one of these figures, Lieutenant H.A.L. Pearson in Limerick, was an opportunity um, for the National Army to demonstrate its acceptance of these servicemen and for the Protestant community in Limerick to show its allegiance to the new state. Pearson's coffin, which is covered by a tricolour, was accompanied through the streets of Limerick by a full military guard of honour and many businesses, including, importantly, the Young Men's Christian Association, which had been previously associated with unionism and loyalism, closed out of respect, and crowds lined the streets of the city and they reverently uncovered their heads as the cortege processed. Um, the influx of such a sizable number of Protestants did not escape the attention of the Commander-in-Chief. And in November 1922, Richard Mulcahy wrote to the Church of Ireland Archbishop of Dublin seeking to create chaplaincy arrangements to minister for their needs. Um, and ultimately, um, by 1923, official Church of Ireland chaplains were um, appointed to the, um, 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 to, to the Irish army where they remain to this day. Uh, and by 1925, when Archbishop Gregg uh, visited the Garrison Church in the Curra to celebrate confirmation, the Church of Ireland contingent was estimated at 120 men. So I'll conclude now. Although they fought, and in some cases died, for an independent Irish state, Protestant, nationalist, uh, Protestant na National Army soldiers cannot quite be described as nationalists. The evidence suggests that they were probably former uh, uh, Unionists or non-political who joined the army for economic reasons nor did they make an attempt to lobby or organize themselves as a unit. This should not surprise us. After the signing of the treaty, hostility towards the idea of an independent Ireland gave way to gradual acceptance. Joining the National Army is just one example of this. This has been a common finding in recent um, um, research on the community. See, for example, Ida Milne's and uh, Ian Dalton's recent collection, Protestant and Irish, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Partition was heartbreaking for Protestant nationalists, and after, in, in, and after independence, their networks lost vibrancy. However, in highlighting Protestant National Army, Army servicemen today, I want to draw attention to another aspect of the broader Southern um, Protestant story, which is unobtrusive engagement uh, with the new state. Thank you very much. And if you want to know more, uh, all good bookshops, <laughs> or Amazon. Thank you, Connor. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mary McAuliffe. Um, Mary is the director of the Gender Studies Programme at UCD. Uh, her latest publications include, as co-editor with Miriam Horton and Emmeline Pine, Legacies of the Magdalene Laundries, Commemoration, Gender and the Post-Colonial Carceral State, and as sole author, Margaret Skinner, a biography. Uh, currently, Mary is working on a major research project on gendered and sexual violence violence during the revolutionary period 1919 to 1923 to be published in 2023 and Mary's paper uh, today is entitled recognize that it was sister against sister two splits divisions and violence between women during the Irish Civil War 1922 to 1923. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Leanne, and thank you to Helen and Dermot and all the team for inviting me to speak at this uh, wonderful conference. Um, and as Leanne introduced in my title, I want to talk about the women uh, who split on the treaty. I am not going to go into the treaty debates, but what happened subsequently. And I want to look at the... Um, and, and to use this as a conversation which pushes back against that brother-against-brother brother trope of the Irish Civil War. 
and look at the impacts and legacies of that split among political and militant women in the immediate and in the long term. The executive of Common Amon reaffirmed their anti-treaty stance, stating publicly by mid-January 1922 that it reaffirmed their allegiance to the Irish Republic and therefore cannot support the articles of treaty signed in London. A convention of the wider membership was held on the 5th of April 1922 in the Mansion House in Dublin to consider the treaty. Delegates attended from all parts of the country, with each branch being allowed two delegates. About 600 women turned up in the Mansion House, although a, ra a rail strike in Munster prevented many delegates attending from Cork and Kerry, um, which may have skewed the result a little bit, but perhaps not so much uh, to make it pro-treaty. Historians have estimated about 300 branches of the estimated 8 to 900 branches of Cumann Amman did not send delegates, which might indicate that pro-treaty branches uh, already knew the way it was going to go and so therefore didn't send delegates. As Lily Cullen says in her uh, Bureau of Military History statement, the atmosphere at the meeting was heated. But as she says, it was clear from the trend of the debate that the majority of the meeting were opposed to accepting the treaty. A resolution was put forward by Mary McSweeney, TD, uh, and was considered. It asked that the executive of Cumann Amman reaffirm its allegiance to the Republic of Ireland and therefore uh, reaffirm that it cannot support the Articles of Agreement signed in London. Jenny Wise Power, a senior executive member and co-founder of the organisation, proposed a, an amendment to that resolution which, cons conscious of the fact that she knew the majority in attendance were anti-treaty, was more of a compromise than overtly pro-treaty, although she herself was. She suggested that Cumann Amman reaffirm the allegiance to the Republic, but realising that the treaty will, if accepted by the Irish people, be a big step along the road to that end, we declare that we will not work obstructively against those who support the treaty. Again, it was the freedom to attain freedom argument that had been put forward by Collins and others. This amendment asked the conventions not to take sides in opposition to the treaty and leave it to the people to decide the issue. However, there was little support for this amendment in the room as speaker after speaker showed, and I quote, uncompromising hostility to the treaty combined with passionate allusions to the principle uh, and to the Irish Republic. Ultimately, 419 delegates, delegates went against Wise Power's resolution, only 63 in favour. She and other anti-treaty women then left the room and the Common Amman put on record its vehement opposition to the Anglo-Irish Treaty. And so this end result splits Common Amman. Uh, many long-standing and senior members leave, including Jenny Wise Power, who offered her resignation, which was accepted with regret. She wasn't the only senior member to leave, though. Others included Min Mulcahy, of course, Min Ryan, married to Richard Mulcahy, Mulcahy who had been active in Common Amman since 1914, along with several of her sisters, some of whom were anti-treaty. So already you see families splitting. Also on the pro-treaty side were founder members Elizabeth Bloxham and Louise Gavin Duffy, as well as other well-known women, not officially members of Common Amman, but supporters of nationalist politics, who also voiced pro-treaty stances. These included, as Connor pointed out, Alice Stopford Green, uh, and indeed Mary Spring Rice of Hoth Gun Running, Running fame. Stopford Green, a historian and longtime supporter of Irish nationalism, uh, lived on St. Stephen's Green, and there she was uh, aided in her activism during the War of Independence by her secretary, Mari Comerford, also a Common Amman member, who uh, they organised and distributed Republican propaganda, and according to Co Comerford's memoirs, they also hid arms in the house and were often raided by uh, the Crown forces. Comerford herself was anti-treaty, this split between the two women who worked and collaborated together throughout the War of Independence starkly illustrates the sister split uh, among organised, militant and activist women. Comerford would carry dispatches between the anti-treaty forces in the Four Courts and, IRA, and the Dublin Brigade of the IRA and later act as courier to Republican units in various parts of the country. Arrested in January 1923 and imprisoned in Mount Joy when she went on hunger strike, uh, she was transferred to the North Dublin Union from which she escaped in May 1923. Following her re-arrest on the 1st of June, she again went on hunger strike and after three weeks she was released uh, from jail on a stretcher. On the other hand, Stopford Green supported the treaty, joined Cumann the Saoirse, campaigned for a pro-treaty vote in the June election and later became a member of the Free State Senate. 
Here is one space we, uh, where the impact of the serious split among Republican women can be seen. As Comerford later record in her just published memoirs, some fine women, foundation members, executive members who had helped guide us through the war years, all of them had proved themselves and all of them are now left. There seems to have been real sorrow in that split, the statement on the split, um, although that sorrow would turn to divisiveness uh, in, in a very short time. While the anti-treaty women in Kumanman began to organize, and many would later become involved in anti-treaty military campaigns, their pro-treaty sisters, all serious activists, well used to organizing, were not going to allow the field to Kumanman. On March the 12th, yeah. On March the 12th, 1922, in the Mansion House, Dublin, uh, a, a meeting was called, which was addressed by Jenny Wise Power, which emphasised the necessity of having an organisation that would give a platform to those women who supported the treaty. She said, an idea had gone abroad that all the, treaty, all the women were against the treaty. Their presence there showed the city of Dublin. There were women who saw that the course they proposed to adopt was the right one from the national point of view. The women of Ireland, not a noisy faction of them, the Cumann Amman women, stood where they always stood, on the bedrock of Irish nationality. On the 15th of March 1922, the Irish Independent discussed this remarkable gathering of women under the headline, Birth of Cumann Saoirse. It claimed there were about 1,500 women there, but uh, 700 seems about um, uh, the correct number, fairly similar to the number that actually had attended the earlier Cumann Amman convention. This demonstrates, though, that Cumann Saoirse had support among a wide swathe of political women. On the platform was Alice Stopford Green, whose proposal for their constitution was adopted. This read, Cumann Saoirse is an independent body of Irish women, pledged to work for the securing and maintaining of Ireland's right as an autonomous and sovereign state to determine freely her form of government. Subsequent to that meeting, they began to organize very quickly on pro-treaty propaganda, election campaigns, et cetera, et cetera. Initially, they produced their first campaigning points on, uh, of any pro-treaty organization in their points for canvassers. They divided the, the issue into seven points, what the treaty rids us of, and seven points of what the treaty gives us. This is fundamentally the stepping stone argument. How much a rule common assertion propaganda played in the June elections is questionable. Uh, of course, Collins and de Valera made their pact mid, in mid-May 1922, um, but common assertion worked to support pro-treaty candidates, um, and they would go on working to return them in the June election, despite that uh, um, meeting between Collins and de Valera. In the end, 58 pro-treaty Sinn Féin candidates were returned, as opposed to 36 anti-treatyites, and the remaining 34 were filled, seats were filled with pro-treaty candidates from other parties. This was a success for the pro-treaty side, but also deepened the split in Sinn Féin, in the IRA, and in Cumann Amman and Cumann Saoirse. During the election, invective and insult were hurled between the women. Cumann Amman regarded the Cumann Saoirse members as women of low character, while the Cumann Saoirse women saw the Cumann Amman anti-treatyites as wild women. But as the country descended into civil war, the split between the women became more and more evident and bitter. Cumann Saoirse would last another 18 months, and by December 1923 uh, would effectively uh, dissolve itself when the civil war and most of the was over and most prisoners had been released. During the civil war, both Cumann Amman and Cumann Saoirse played important roles. As I said, many in Cumann Amman resumed their activities as they had played during the War of Independence as allies of the anti-treaty IRA, while Cumann Saoirse took the side of the national government and of the national army. This war, often written as a tragic conflict between male comrades who had fought together, was also a war between women who had fought together during the War of Independence. So important was Cumann Amman's support to the anti-treaty side that the Free State authorities had arrested and imprisoned over 600 of them during the Civil War. Cumann Saoirse, while not as active, were also important. Um, Cal McCarthy writes of, an ev of evidence of a sustained Civil War campaign uh, propaganda campaign by the organization to counter Cumann Amman uh, anti-treaty campaigns. They were participated in political funerals, as did the women of Cumann Amman. They also engaged in fundraising. They organized Cayleys, carnival dances, etc., etc. Um, members looked on with horror and distaste on the wild women of Cumann Amman and were determined to stop them supporting the anti-treaty IRA. 
and in this aim, they gathered intelligence for the National Army where they could uh, in order to control the activities of the women. This was a very bitter aspect of the Civil War for these women. Women who had held together during the War of Independence were now policing and threatening each other. The IRA and its Cumann Amman allies watched the Cumann Assyrtia women with great suspicion. It was thought that the Cumann Assyrtia women were passing information on the IRA to the National Army via a network of call houses, a series of homes where information on IRA activity and personnel was collected from callers. This call house network worried the IRA so much that their GHQ warmed its membership of their existence. The women also spied on each other. Sheila Humphreys and Maura Deegan of the anti-treaty side organised intelligence gathering on Cumann Assyrtia. For instance, Rose, Roisin Colbert of the Ranala branch of Cumann Amman was uh, instructed to join Cumann Assyrtia by Humphreys, uh, although uh, Colbert's own activities did get her arrested in January 1923. Other women, including Christina Byrne of the Inenia branch of Cumann Amman, joined Cumann Assyrtia for intelligence work and reported back to Humphreys. On the other hand, some women joined Cumann Assyrtia to prevent uh, our, our ambushes attempts on the army officers by irregulars. Uh, Nelly Kavanagh of the Moon Cumann Amman did this and provided information to the National Army. There was a bitter uh, propaganda campaign against Cumann Assyrtia as well. In July, when Wise Power, as Vice President of Sinn Féin, closed its office on Harcourt Street, she was attacked in the Republican news sheet, the Fenian, which referred to her as a leading light in the anemic organisation known as Cumann Assyrtia. On the other side, to lessen the effectiveness of Cumann Amman, Cumann Assyrtia cooperated with the National Army and earned the bitter nickname Cumann the Searchers. The lady searcher who had worked with the RIC in black and tans during the War of Independence had been a target of particular hate by Cumann Amman, as her presence often led to an increase in raids and indeed strip searching of the Cumann Amman women. With a lady searcher present, uh, that could be um, engaged with. Many lady searchers were treated violently if caught and driven from localities and indeed the country. While some were English, recruited by Mary Allen, who was head of the new British Women's Police Service, and, brought, um, and she brought the newly named organisation to Ireland, where they were welcomed by military authorities as aides to searching women, suspected of supporting women, or supporting Republicans. Others were Irish women who drew particular contempt from Cumann Amman. Many of them actually came from Protestant backgrounds as well. Uh, to draw a comparison with the Cumann Assertion Women's Activities for the National Army, was a deliberate um, and particularly insulting thing because they also helped guard the anti-treaty women who were imprisoned. For instance, on the 30th of April 1923, eight women prisoners were being moved from uh, Mount Joy to the North Dublin Union. Mary McSweeney and Kate O'Callaghan were on hunger strike and the prisoners refused to be moved. According to the pro-treaty reports, the women attacked uh, the warders, but according to the anti-treaty side, the prisoners were attacked by CID men, warders, and Cumann Assertia women, with one Cumann Amman woman, Sarika McDermott, uh, according to a report in ERA, the Irish Nation anti-treaty news uh, sheet, she was knocked to the floor by five Cumann Assertia women and stripped of her shoes and stockings and dress. When she recovered consciousness, she was out in the passive, passage, lying on the floor partially dressed and her clothes saturated with water which they had flung on her. Her face was bruised and her lip cut and her body covered in bruises. However, violence was on both sides. Homes and businesses of those attached to Cumann Assertia were watched and attacked. Uh, on December 12, 1922, uh, Jenny Wise Power's home was attacked when bombs were hurled through the plate glass window. There was also an attempt to burn down her cafe on Henry Street, where, ironically, the Proclamation of Independence was signed. Uh, as tea was about to be served, the newspaper report said, the raiders suddenly took out petrol bombs uh, from their pockets and announced their intentions to set the house on fire. Another incident was in Tipperary, where Celia Shaw, a Cumann Assertia organiser, was down to do some organising. She was followed and uh, kidnapped, more or less, by Cumann Amman women, interrogated her attaché case, which was found to contain notes confisc confiscated or captured, as the women said. And the Cumann Amman women communicated to Dublin that all branches of Cumann Assertia were banned in their area and they would use every means in their power to make them ineffective. To conclude, the, the Civil War ended in May 1923, although many female and male anti-treaty prisoners were not released until later that year. 
Common Amman were on the losing side, and many of the political women in Common Assertia were in the ascendance, ascendancy. Uh, with three of their members, Jenny Wise Power, Alice Stopford Green, and Eileen Costello, appointed to the Free State Senate. The bitterness and split of the women and the support Common Amman gave to the anti treaty side left, left a hard legacy. Some women, for instance, anti treatyite Nell Ryan, sister to Min Mulcahy, uh, and indeed men had watched her on hunger strike. Uh, uh, she had went on a very extended hunger strike and was quite seriously ill when she was imprisoned. Uh, never again spoke to her best friend, pro treatyite and later Senator Kathleen Brown. During the Civil War, they had each threatened to have the other burnt out. They were both from Wexford. And as a letter in the Brown Archive states, we were sa she, Kathleen Brown, was saved from being burnt out only by the military guard of the National Army and threats from the officers to burn Miss Ryan's place in Tom Cool to the ground if mine was meddled with. The Ryan sisters themselves, who had split on the treaty, uh, with men, as I said, watching her sister go through a near-death hunger strike in uh, Kilmainham, only kept the family together by always ensuring that no politics was discussed at family gatherings. Many families, relationships, and former comrades had similar stories. The attempts by Common Assertia to platform the rational, political, pro-treaty ideology of Irish women against what it called the noisy faction of the wild women had limited success. Discourses which developed on organized women saw them either as, I quote, um, brave good women and girls who gave so much help in our dark trying days of terror, but had completely lost their heads, as Bat O'Connor said, or as unlovely, destructive, destructive minders, begetters of violence and furies, as P.S. O'Hegarty said, um, came to do dominate the narrative. Pro-treaty newspapers also contained anxieties about these harpies, diehards, gun girls, images the pro-treaty women had wished to avoid, but they were largely unsuccessful in achieving this. However, common enemies and common causes would paper over some of the Civil War enmities in the coming years between the women. For example, Kathleen Clark, who had been anti-treaty, joined pro-treaty women, Wise Power, Eileen Costello, and Brown in the Free State Senate, where all four would work together in trying to combat the flurry of misogynistic anti-women legislation, which, which uh, really increased throughout those first two decades from a common the Goyle government and subsequent Fianna Fáil government. As the bitterness of the war faded, the pro-treaty women often collaborated with former anti-treaty common Amman women against the extreme conservatism of the Irish uh, Free State and of their political masters in both those parties. The adage of the enemy of my enemy is my friend, helping to heal some of the wounds. However, the legacy of the split is vital to acknowledge in our remember, uh, remembering of the Irish Civil War that it was not only brother against brother, but unfortunately, throughout this, uh, that bitter months of civil war, sister against sister. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Uh, our final speaker is Dr. Uh, Cormac Moore. Uh, Cormac is a historian with Dublin City Council on its Decade of Commemorations program. Uh, he is the author of Birth of a Border, The Impact of Partition in Ireland, Marion Press 2019, The Irish Soccer Split, Cork University Press 2015, and The GAA versus uh, Douglas Hyde, The Removal of Ireland's First President as uh, GAA Patron, Collins Press 2012. He is currently writing a book on Leash and the Irish Revolution and is an editor of the upcoming Atlas of Irish Sport. And Connor's paper uh, today is entitled The Root of All Evil, Northern Nationalists and Unionists Reaction to the Signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Uh, to all of the people in the National Museum of Ireland and the Hugh Lane Gallery for, for organising this wonderful conference. The Anglo-Irish Treaty, um, the main provision relating to Ulster was Article 12. It stipulated that if Northern Ireland, which had been in existence since the summer of 1921, opted not to join the Irish Free State, as was its right under the treaty, a boundary commission would determine the border in accordance with the wishes of the inhabitants so far as may be compatible with economic and geographic conditions. Unsurprisingly, Northern Ireland took the first opportunity to remain outside the Dublin jurisdiction in December 1922 
thus triggering the Boundary Commission to be established. And, and you can see here is the, the Duke of Abercorn on the day he was sworn in as Governor General of Northern Ireland in December 1922. Speaking to Winston Churchill in May 1922, the Northern Ireland Prime Minister James Craig claimed the Boundary Commission is the root of all evil. If you picture loyalists on the borderland being asked by us to hang on with their teeth for the safety of the province, you can also picture their unspoken cry to us. If we sacrifice our lives and our property for the sake of the province, are you going to assent to a commission which may subsequently, by a stroke of a pen, take away the very area you now ask us to defend? Craig, like most Ulster Unionists, while somewhat confused on Northern Ireland's relationship with the Irish Free State before December 1922, as were many others in Ireland and Britain, focused his opposition of the treaty on the proposed Boundary Commission should the North remain outside of the Irish Free State. Although Ulster Unionists were not party to the treaty, they now were obliged to adhere to its clauses. The Boundary Commission reopened uncertainty and put Northern Ireland's future in doubt, at least significant parts of it yet again. It reopened the border question, believed closed by Ulster Unionists through the Government of Ireland Act of 1920 and by the establishment of Northern Ireland in the summer of 1921. Craig told the British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, he would refuse to cooperate with the Commission as there was no precedent in the history of the British Empire for taking away territory from an established government without its sanction. Even though in 1919 Craig had suggested the establishment of a boundary commission to examine the border area for Northern and Southern Ireland under the Government of Ireland Act, to avoid the jurisdiction of the Northern Parliament extending over the whole nine counties of Ulster, by 1921 he emphatically opposed the odious boundary commission. By that stage he had his Northern citadel, which he intended to sit on like a rock. Craig's predecessor as Ulster Unionist leader, Edward Carson, violently attacked the treaty during his maiden speech to the House of Lords on the 14th of December, criticising the British government for surrendering to Sinn Féin by conceding too much to Republicans in offering Dominion status. The speech, the speech was not an anti-partition rant, as many have since claimed. In the speech, Carson deplored the pressure being put on Ulster to join with the South, referencing the attempts made by the British government during the treaty negotiations to squeeze the already established Northern Parliament to become autonomous within an All-Ireland Parliament from Dublin instead of from Westminster. He stated, like everybody else, you, the British government, have betrayed Ulster. This constant preaching at Ulster is nauseating. I could not help thinking that it was very like, after, after having shot a man in the back, going over to him and patting him on the shoulder and saying, old man, die as quickly as you can and do not make any noise. For the last three to six months, the whole vitriolic power of the press, inspired by Number 10 Downing Street and their able propaganda department, have been carrying on week after week and day after day a campaign of falsehood and misrepresentation against Ulster, bellowing, bullying and blustering as if Ulster cared one farting about it. But why is all this tack made upon Ulster? What has Ulster done? I tell you what Ulster has done. She has stuck too well to you and you believe that because she is loyal, you can kick her as you like. The Unionist press, while initially condemning the treaty, soon gave a reluctant acceptance to it. The three main Unionist-leaning newspapers in Belfast echoed Edward Carson's condemnation of the treaty as an abject humiliation. The Belfast Telegraph condemned the treaty, which cuts Ulster out of the old intimacy of imperial connection and seeks to precipitate her instead into closer relationship with those who in Britain's darkest hour engineered a rebellion and stabbed Great Britain in the back. The Belfast newsletter criticised the revision of the boundaries of Northern Ireland by a commission, concluding that those who signed the treaty were men without conscience and who do not intend justice. The Northern Whig, who also condemned the treaty, saying there was nothing for loyal British subjects to rejoice over. The Unionist press, like other loyalists, soon warmed to the agreement, content with the effect it had on dividing their opponents in Sinn Féin. It is equally true that initial Unionist opposition to the treaty and its Boundary Commission served to solidify national support for it. By the end of January 1922, the newsletter wrote, if we can take it as evidence that the Provisional Government of Southern Ireland is prepared to adopt an attitude of goodwill towards the Government of Northern Ireland over these matters of government and administration in which we both are now involved, then we say with certainty that the agreement is a source of satisfaction 
and is likely to turn out, out a blessing to the whole of Ireland. At an Ordnance Cabinet meeting on the 10th of January 1922, the first time it met since the treaty was signed, the Unionist government reflected and weighed up their options on participating or not in the Boundary Commission. By not participating, although it would make the government very popular in Northern Ireland for a time, by having no input, Ulster would lose a larger area than if she had representative on the Commission. And resistance would be ineffective unless we were prepared to take up arms against British troops. Such a move would be a reversal of Ulster Unionist policy to obey the laws of Great Britain and would probably lose the support of the Unionist Conservative Party in Great Britain. If they did take part, the leading Conservative, Andrew Bonner Law, had obtained a promise from Lloyd George that either Lord James Clyde or Lord Don Eden, Andrew Murray, who were both Scottish politicians and judges within the Conservative Party, would act as the Northern Commissioner. Even though he was opposed to the treaty, Edward Carson also consented to act as Ulster's Commissioner, saying a little modification of the boundary might be advantageous. Fear was also expressed that under a Labour government, Northern Ireland's area might be further curtailed. Craig thought the best course would be not to show our hand at the present time, but to consider the matter very carefully during the few months that might elapse before the Boundary Commission would be established. This was agreed upon and proved to be the correct and fortuitous decision from an Ulster Unionist perspective, as a lot of time elapsed by the time the Commission finally met in late 1924. And although the Northern Government ultimately refused to select an appointee to the Boundary Commission, the person selected by them, sorry, for them by the British Government, a Labour Government as it transpired, Joseph R. Fisher, could not have been more agreeable for the Ulster Unionist cause. At that same Cabinet meeting, Craig contended that the establishment of a Boundary Commission had prolonged the period of unrest in the North, and he insisted that the charges for maintaining the Ulster Special Constabulary must be borne by the Imperial Government until the border question was settled. Given that people like Austin Chamberlain in the Conservative Party were worried that those opposed to the treaty in his own party could use the Ulster Unionist cause to rally opposition to it, Craig was able to secure an agreement from the British government of continued financing of the specials for an indefinite period, perhaps years, until the border was decided. This decision was made in the face of British civil service opposition who questioned the specials peacekeeping credentials and of the possible scenario whereby British troops could have been deployed against the specials, should the latter, as they threatened, oppose through arms the transfer of loyalists and land from Northern Ireland to the Free State under the Boundary Commission. Even though Craig claimed the Boundary Commission was the root of all evil for Unionists, it resulted in uniting Unionists and leaving the boundary unchanged. It's the seeming threat it represented to the integrity of Northern Ireland greatly strengthened the Ulster Unionist Party, as it adopted the role of aggressive defender of the territorial status quo, uniting all shades of Protestant opinion behind it on the single agenda of maintaining intact the 1920 boundary. And of course, that is a tactic still prevalent 100 years later, where Ulster Unionists used the threat of the Boundary Commission to destabilise the North and to threaten its constitutional status as a means to gain electoral advantage in elections held up to late 1925. For Northern Nationalists, though, the treaty with its Boundary Commission provision turned out to be the root of all, for much evil. It gave false hopes for the transfer of large tracts of territory and people from Northern Ireland to the Irish Free State. Nationalists felt they could continue to ignore and obstruct the institutions of Northern Ireland, particularly in areas of nationalist majorities. This policy was promoted and supported by senior Sinn Féin figures, such as Michael Collins and O. McNeill. McNeill, who subsequently came in for much ire from Northern Nationalists for his performance as Free State Boundary Commissioner in 1925, met a delegation of Northern Nationalists in Dublin a day after the treaty was signed, on 7th of December, and asked him to adopt a practical programme of passive resistance to the Northern Government's authority, involving non-recognition of the courts and non-payment of taxes. The keystone of such a policy, in McNeill's view, would revolve around non-recognition of the educational authority of the Belfast Parliament. And he added, that implies that the schools and colleges will have to derive their revenue from some other source than the Belfast Parliament. As one of their own, he acknowledged that they were the people who will have to bear the brunt in the fight for national unity. As such, they will be entitled to look to the nation for support in implementing such a programme. With the treaty, nationalist leaders in the six and 26 counties believed many areas in Northern Ireland will be transferred to the Irish Free State, including the entire counties of Tyrone and Fermanagh, as well as Derry City and Newry, and large parts of South Armagh and South and East Down. 
Dennis Gwynn wrote that a suggestion of a boundary commission seemed naturally to imply that the Ulster Unionists would not be allowed to retain the full six county area if they did refuse to enter the Free State. Stephen Gwynn, former Irish Party MP and persistent critic of Sinn Féin, believed that if the Dáil ratified the treaty, then it is certain that before long Ulster will fall into its normal place. Almost certainly Ulster will end as a counterpart to Quebec within the Irish Free State. The nationalism, nationalist optimism over the Boundary Commission in many ways explains the fraction of time devoted to partition during the acrimonious Dáil Éireann debates over the treaty. Both the pro and anti-treaty sides supported the Boundary Commission as a means to end or at least limit partition. Both sides were complacent about the vague terms of reference for the Boundary Commission and the lack of provision for plebiscites even in border areas. For Northern Nationalists, the treaty left many of them confused and dismayed. While those in the South were tearing themselves apart over the sovereignty issue, for Northern Nationalists, it was of secondary importance compared to the issue of partition. The role of the proposed Boundary Commission was of primary interest. While Nationalists living in the border regions, particularly in Fermanagh and Tyrone, were optimistic they would be quickly transferred to the Free State, those living in, in, in Belfast and East Ulster knew they were, would remain in Northern Ireland, regardless of the generosity of the Boundary Commission. One IRA member stated, the treaty was a tragedy when it came. We all knew that. We knew in the North that we'd been left out. Historian Robert Lynch asserts that the attitudes to the treaty by the IRA in the North was far more complex than those that developed in the South. Quoting, for the Northern IRA, their primary concern lay in undermining the increasing permanency of partition, and they would welcome support from whichever side of the treaty divide seemed most able to accomplish this end. This pragmatic attitude meant that the organisation in the North resembled more than any other part of the Sinn Féin movement, the pre-truce IRA, and were essentially beyond categorisation as either pro or anti-treaty. Ono Duffy was able to allay the fears of the Northern IRA commanders to an extent, although there was still was some confusion, as some believed that the Falls Road in Belfast could vote itself out of Northern Ireland. O'Duffy was Deputy Chief of Staff of the IRA and Ulster Liaison Officer since the truce of July 1921. Sharing a platform with Michael Collins in Armagh in September 1921, O'Duffy had notoriously said the IRA may have to use lead against those who were against Ireland, against their fellow countrymen. The intervention of Collins was pivotal in securing the support for the treaty of many Northern IRA members, assuring them that they were high on these list of priorities. Becoming the unofficial leader of the Northern Catholic minority, Collins dictated much of the actions of the Northern IRA for the first half of 1922. However, recent research by Kieran Glennon has shown that those supporting and opposing the treaty within the IRA Northern divisions was more evenly divided than previously asserted. Most Catholic bishops were convinced the Anglo-Irish Treaty was an acceptable compromise. There, were, though, there was, though, much misgivings on the treaty provisions for continued partition. It rankled with some hierarchy members that the Dáil members during the treaty debates expressed more concern for the issue of sovereignty and the oath of allegiance than on partition. Utterances from Arthur Griffith and Collins reassuring the bishops that the Boundary Commission would pave the way for greater independence and an end to partition did help to alleviate those concerns. The treaty resulted in differing opinions and strategies being adopted by nationalists within Northern Ireland. Unlike within Ulster Unionism, there was a lack of consensus amongst Northern nationalists in general regarding the policy to be adopted towards partition and the Northern Ireland government. The split within Sinn Féin compounded the confusion of Northern nationalists and effectively prevented the formulation of a policy which might have unanimous support. While local authorities, such as Fermanagh County Council and in South Down and South Armagh, remained defiant and refused to recognise the Belfast Parliament, Others, such as Tyrone County Council, acknowledged the de facto jurisdiction of that parliament in view of what was described as the temporary period during which the Northern Parliament is to function in this area. Derry City Corporation was divided between Sinn Féin members who urged unqualified allegiance to Dáil Éireann and nationalists who believed Derry City would benefit from a nationalist-leaning mayor and corporation officially making the case through the Boundary Commission for the city's inclusion in the Free State. The main argument put forward by local authorities who believed in recognising the Northern jurisdiction and by people like Arthur Griffith and W.T. Cosgrave in Dublin was that they would lose nationalist control and would rob whole nationalist tracts of effective represent representation in the face of uh, the Boundary Commission. It was also clear that any adoption of a full-blooded recognition policy would be opposed by a section of border nationalists who held that it would weaken their case before the Boundary Commission and by considerable anti-treaty section in Belfast Sinn Féin. 
The urgent need for a clear-sighted policy for the Northern Ashes population was the subject of a letter from Louis J. Walsh, a prominent Sinn Féin solicitor practising in counties Arma, Antrim and Derry, to the Bishop of Down and Connor, Joseph McRory, on the 14th of January 1922. Walsh stressed the need for the Free State to adopt a definite line of policy in North East Ulster and at once. Otherwise, he added, we shall drift. You will have, have Fermanagh doing one thing and Tyrone doing another, and we shall be beaten in detail. He also expressed a view that the only policy for the minority now would be to recognise the facts as they are and to admit that the treaty virtually recognises the Belfast Parliament. The idea of a boundary commission was not a new one, nor, nor necessarily a bad one from Sinn Féin's perspective. Although the belief that the transferring of large areas from the north to the south would leave the remaining territory an unviable rump was deeply flawed, as the industrial heartbeat of Northern Ireland was Belfast and its hinterlands, not the west and south of the six counties. Northern Ireland could have survived economically without counties Ty Tyrone and Fermanagh. Also, and paradoxically, the more the Boundary Commission favoured the nationalist case, the smaller the nationalist population that would remain in Northern Ireland, and thus the case for national unity would be diminished. Something those nationalists furthest away from the border in places like Belfast were acutely aware of. While the Boundary Commission was viewed as a major concession to Sinn Féin, the details and wording of the clause agreed to in the treaty proved to be disastrous for Sinn Féin, and particularly for Northern nationalists close to the border. Sinn Féin floundered greatly by acceding to such a vague and ambiguous clause and by not insisting on similar terms for a Boundary Commission to the ones that had convened in post-First World War, War, War Europe. What is particularly surprising is the lack of scrutiny nationals of all hues on the island gave to the vague Boundary Commission clauses and how it compared or not to other Boundary Commissions in Europe. It was just accepted by most that large parts of Northern Ireland would be transferred to the Irish Free State. The Boundary Commission clause of the treaty was riddled with ambiguities. No timetable was mentioned, nor method outlined to ascertain the wishes of the inhabitants. How exactly economic and geographic conditions would relate to popular opinion, and which would prove most important. No plebiscite was asked for. The areas and sizes of the units, was it small areas like district electrical divisions or entire counties, to be considered for transfer were not decided upon. Could free state territory be transferred as well as northern territory? The clause was open to many different interpretations. The proposed Boundary Commission for Ireland was markedly different to the Boundary Commissions that were convened in Europe after the First World War to resolve territorial disputes in five European regions, Upper Silesia, Allenstein and Marienwerder, disputes between Germany and Poland, Schleswig between Germany and Denmark and Klagenfurt between Austria and Yugoslavia. Firstly, unlike in Ireland, plebiscites were used in all five regions to determine the wishes of the inhabitants, which took primacy over economic and geographic factors. Sinn Féin and Northern Nationalists should have, at a minimum, insisted on a plebiscite for contested areas. Also, Ireland had been partitioned before the Boundary Commission convened, whereas elsewhere in Europe, areas were partitioned after the Boundary Commissions had deliberated. There was no time limit, time limit specified for the Irish Boundary Commission, again unique to the other ones in Europe. One of the most fatal anomalies from an Irish nationalist perspective was that the Irish Boundary Commission was the only one that did not have an independent chairperson. And with its vague wording, the ambiguity was to be determined by a British appointed judge. By contrast, the other boundary commissions in Europe were presided over by chairpersons from countries with no vested interest in the disputed territories. The British argument that this was an intra empire dispute wears thin, given that the imperial government was the British government, one of the contesting parties. With the Irish Free State and Northern Ireland commissioners cancelling each other out, the decision by the Sinn Féin plenipotentiaries not to contest the British appointing the judge to chair the Boundary Commission proved decisive. The acceptance of the Boundary Commission clauses, including the appointment of a British judge by pro and anti treatyites and by most Northern nationalists, compounded this mistake. The judge appointed was judge Justice Richard Feetham, a British-born, South African-based judge with conservative political views. Unsurprisingly, all of his interpretations and decisions favoured the Unionists over the nationalist case. In national circles, he became known as Feetham Cheatham. It resulted in the Commission recommending minimal transfers to the Free State. I know I've just gone over time, but I'm just about finished. Um, it resulted in the Commission recommending minimal transfers to the Free State, but also transfers from the Free State to Northern Ireland. Once this was leaked in November 1925 by the Morning Post newspaper, the Irish Free State Government rushed over to London to have the report shelved, resulting in the border remaining as it was, as it does to the present day. While the Sinn Féin plenipotentiaries were not partitionists and genuinely sought a united Ireland, they blundered enormously in acceding to such a vague and indefinable boundary commission, 
which ultimately was the primary reason for the original border being retained as it was, as it still is. And while it was understandable for most Northern nationalists to accept the establishment of a boundary commission on the treaty as a tolerable resolution to the border issue, it was foolhardy and naive not to scrutinise and to comb its clauses. As it transpired, the devil was in the details. Thank you. Thank you, Connor. Um, so we've some time for uh, questions. So would anybody like to uh, get the questions started for our speakers? Maybe I'll start and ask Mary McAuliffe a question. Mary. <laughs> um, were the women searchers in the Civil War female jails paid? I don't know that, actually. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, they were acting as warders, so yeah. I would presume they were. I will have to okay. look into that. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Let's see if there's anything in the chat. Nobody else like to comment or yes, thank you. Thanks for Susan Sorry, I I not I wondered about the Irish news, if you could talk a bit about that and TJ McCarthy, who was a Cork man, particularly because we're talking about place and people who are you know, um, at the the start Mary was talking about place and people who, you know, are talking yeah. about um, reactions to the treaty and that. Um, Obviously, the Irish News is a newspaper editor is TJ McCarthy, and he's quite almost fateless and quite re resigned to, because he is a Belfast paper, resigned to uh, to the fate really of Belfast Catholics, and how this maybe contrasts with other papers at like the Derry Journal at the time and their reaction to the Boundary Commission in Article 12. Yeah, well, it, it, I know uh, James Cousins has written a book um, with most of his research on the Irish News' reaction to. And, and up to the, the deliberation of the Boundary Commission. Um, but when, when I look at it, on the, the, the Irish News, I don't just look at McCarthy, I, I actually look at more Joe Devlin more than, than anyone when it comes to the Irish News, because it essentially was his paper for decades. Um, and, and the reaction of the Irish News is quite different to, to newspapers, national newspapers on the periphery of the, of the uh, six counties, like Derry Journal and, and, and other uh, newspapers. So, so initially the, the Irish News re uh, um, reported the treaty. Um, it, was, it was reticent, you know, there was a lot of concerns. But, but, you know, being a Belfast newspaper, they, they ultimately knew, as, as the Devlin did, and Belfast business people knew that, you know, they weren't going to get much benefit from the Boundary Commission, that they were going to be left out, and the actual, the remaining nationalist population was going to be quite smaller. So the chance of actually, of their rights being uh, safeguarded were actually probably going to be diminished, and also the chance of national unity was actually also going to be diminished. An argument actually, De Devil era, actually uh, subsequently made um, around the time of, of the, the Boundary Commission deliberations. Um, so it, the, the Irish News had different reactions to the, uh, to, to the actual treaty compared to newspapers on the periphery of the, of the, the border. Nobody anywhere in Sinn Féin doing any kind of war gaming, looking at the bigger scenario, and they just didn't realise that partition was essentially written in stone and the border was not going to change? Or do they just really, where did this irrational hope come from that this Boundary Commission, which was so different, as you say, to everything else in Europe, was going to give them their big break and that they were going to get more of the North back? But, but I don't agree that it was written in stone. Partition. Um, particularly the, the six county area. Um, the reason why they got a Boundary Commission was that it, there was, and, and in fact, the actual Boundary Commission that did deliber, deliberate in late 1925 did actually transfer land, more land to the Free State than to the, um, the North. Um, but the, obviously there was some uh, transfer from the North, to, uh, sorry, from the South to the North as well. Um, the, the problem was, it, there was, there was scrutiny of it. Actually, um, Griffith, who was the main kind of a person who brought this Boundary Commission clause um, um, in, into the treaty, he actually did get advice from, uh, legal advice from I think John Byrne, who actually was uh, Attorney General of the Free State at the time of the Boundary Commission Liberation. He said, uh, this is not a good clause because there's a lot of holes here, a lot of gaps here. But Griffith kind of left that, he didn't mention in December, the third cabinet meeting. And others didn't, like De Valera admitted decades later that the, the Sinn Féin plan of entries didn't scrutinise those clauses. But he didn't scrutinise them either, nor did an order nationalists. That's what he should have done. 
Um, so they, they had an opportunity because the British government, I know um, um, Gretchen and Sinead were talking about um, obviously the, the, the negotiations this morning, um, but the scope they had of getting changes was on Ulster. Um, and, the, and Sinn Féin knew that. They knew that British were weak on Ulster. Um, and they, if they had looked in more detail at what was happening in those other boundary commissions, they certainly could have got a plebiscite, I think, in contested areas if they stuck to their guns. Um, and, and the whole thing about geography and economics, that, the original clause, that wasn't included. It was, it was the wishes of the inhabitants. Um, so, so that was actually brought in a later time. If, if, even if that clause, you know, as long as it's compatible with ge geographic and economic conditions, if that was removed, you would have had loads of areas that would have been transferred to Irish Free State because FETAM actually went on the, the, the census returns from 1911 to determine what the wishes of the inhabitants were. So even if there was no plebiscite, the, the wishes of inhabitants would have shown, like most of Tyrone, Fermanagh, Newry, uh, Derry, you know, would have been up for uh, and been, been submitted to the Free State. So, so I think I think the, the, the Boundary Commission wasn't necessarily a bad idea. It was just that the, the devil was in the details, and Sinn Féin, that's what they really messed up. I just want to jump in there on that as well. Um, there's a very long tradition in Irish nationalism, or long tendency to minimise Ulster concerns, and that's a real context here. And you see it the whole way up. I mean, it's only in the towards the very end of Parnell's life that he begins to realise well, there's, there's Protestants in Ulster as well. Um, and you know, if you look at John Redmond's uh, speeches, likewise kind of neglecting the existence of this tradition and a sense that, you know, a sense that perhaps partition is so unreasonable that ultimately um, they will fall into line. And you find this, this um, expression recurs constantly, Ulster will fall into line, Ulster will fall into line. That once something is established in Dublin, it's gonna be so great um, that, that people are going to fall into line. And of course, there's a wider thing that goes back to, I think, that what was discussed earlier in the earlier panel, which is perhaps a, a failure to identify red lines. Uh, Lloyd George set out a red line uh, in 1921, which is Ireland associated strongly with the empire. That was going to be, that was a red line. The Conservatives in the cabinet had their own red line, which is no coercion of Ulster. Not partition, it's no coercion but Ulster. And between those, the, 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 that created kind of a sweet spot, right? And there's no, you know, th th there's no matching red line by the Irish delegation going over there quite to the same extent. And that's why you end up, it's why, why you end up with perhaps this failure to, 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 to you know, to, to recognize ultimately what's coming down the line, I think. Um, thank you. We have a question in the chat from Rosine Kennedy. I wonder if Mary Staines or Mary McAuliffe could say whether women in general we're more anti-treaty than pro-treaty. So maybe, Mary, you'd like to start with that. <laughs> well, Mary would know a lot more about it in general. <laughs> but certainly in the, in, in the, in the, in the Doyle, they were, um, the, the, the women all voted, and, and, and some of them um, very vehemently, particularly Mary McSweeney was very particular, and even subsequently, they, um, Mary McSweeney particularly, but others wouldn't even agree with De Valera. She, 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 she was not going to support De Valera in his compromise either. Um, but I think the uh, vote of the um, election would show that the, you know, the women who were voting, um, as, as most of the people in the country did, was, was pro-treaty. Well, funnily at the time, there was a real anxiety among the um, pro-treaty leadership about the women's vote. Um, and uh, what people forget is in the June election, which is essentially the vote on the treaty, it was still taken on the franchise of only women over the age of 30 mm. uh, having the vote. And even though the Griffith and Collins and all the rest of them had promised that the women would get the same franchise as men all over the age of 21, which did come in on the constitution later on, the 1922 constitution, uh, despite delegates coming from, um, you know, uh, um, Kate O'Callaghan and others who went in to talk to Collins and Griffith to have the, frank, the, the electoral register updated to have women over the age of 21, that cohort, those women in their 20s, able to vote in June. It was all sorts of vote, wouldn't be ready in time, it, it, it can't do this, and so uh, they didn't get that vote because they were very afraid that the younger women particularly would go anti-treaty. Now, I don't know if they would have gone in numbers, I wouldn't think, they would have gone in numbers to actually impact on the overall pro-treaty result of that uh, election in June. Um, but that anxiety certainly was there. 
Um, and, uh, but when you look then at the breakdown of coming among branches, as I said in the talk, an awful lot of them didn't turn up. And it can be presumed that a significant number of those branches didn't turn up to the convention because they were pro-treaty and they, weren't, they were going to get an outvoted at the convention. Um, and in Cork, for example, the coming among remain calling themselves coming among and are pro-treaty for the most part. There's a big, a big split between the coming among in Cork, of course, with Mary McSweeney being so anti-treaty. But actually, the central branches in Cork City themselves are pro-treaty. The Conlon sisters have a big fight with Mary, for instance. Um, and around the country, depend again geographical location, like your research, which I found fascinating. In parts of the country, a lot of the branches are pro-treaty. In Munster and Kerry and parts of uh, rural West Cork and West Limerick, most of the coming among branches are anti-treaty. Women in general, I think, were either neutral on the treaty, the unorganized women or the non-militant women were neutral on the treaty or voted pro-treaty. Not for the treaty itself, but be for peace. Mm. You have to remember that Ireland had been in a war situation from really 1912 when everything kicked off with, with gun running and all that, and then the First World War, 1916, War of Independence. And so a lot of people, men and women, are voting for peace. The treaty is, is a flawed document, but it's all they have, and they're voting for peace. Uh, and a lot of people talk about that. So. Um, I think a significant minority of organised women are uh, uh, anti-treaty and a significant number of unorganised women are neutral on the treaty and will be somewhat helpful in the civil war to the irregulars, mainly in terms of safe houses and food provision and that, but um, really what they want is war to end. Mm. I think it's important to remember that not all women over the age of 30 had the vote because there was a property Oh yes, the yes, property yes. qualifications, so that excluded a lot of working class women as well, who, who were um, you know, very much involved as well in terms of militancy. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, comments? Mark? Just a question for Mary Stainton. First of all, thanks all four of you for fantastic papers. But, but Mary, it's interesting by your breakdown of the, the TDs who voted uh, in the treaty and that distinction between where people were from and how they voted, just, just looking at that. There is a difference where people are born and where they actually resided on, because obviously there is a gap between the beginning of the debates and the vote after Christmas. That, that, that pressure that some TDs um, said was applied to them once they, once they went back to their constituencies. Uh, there's two sides to that. Um, a, how prevalent was it, you know, and also how responsive were TDs who had actually never had to contest an election, you know, they were returned un into uncontested seats, how responsive were they actually to their, uh, to, to the electorate's uh, views on the treaty? Well, I think this, one has to look back, even right back about how, because they didn't contest elections, how they were selected, and it's very interesting to look at the reasons, and then, as, as I said, some of, you know, more of them who voted for the treaty came from that area, but there's also, I think that point is interesting about where they resided, what their influences were. But um, I gave some examples of how, in, in, in the group, about how they responded. And, but do you know, there's another one, particularly James Ryan now, he particularly talks about, um, he, he, he said, you know, he never met anyone in Wexford who was for the treaty. And yet, uh, Michael Laffin has pointed out that he has received many, many petitions and telegrams to saying, uh, please vote. And uh, I was looking at, say, Peter Paul Galligan's papers, and he got lots and lots of telegrams asking them to vote. One fellow, um, Tom Kelly, I think, if I remember correctly, had to resign because he, his constituents said to him to vote, but he couldn't. So there was this, there definitely was a view, and I think even Aylward's comment about that you can elect a politician, they didn't necessarily see themselves as re politicians representing the group of people. They, they really saw themselves represent, you know, looking at themselves, fighting for this um, thing, fighting for the cause um, that way. Thank you, Mary. Any other comments or questions? Okay, well, I think uh, our, uh, we'll leave it at that and just to uh, give a round of applause for our board speakers.
Good afternoon and welcome back. I'm delighted to introduce Billy Shortall, who will be chairing the next section of the conference on the theme of the cultural legacy of the treaty. Billy Shortall is an art historian and is currently the Ryan Gallagher Kennedy Research Fellow on the Kula Press Project, Schooner Foundation, Trinity College, Dublin. A recent visiting fellow in the Kyo Norton Institute, Notre Dame University, his research is focused on the intersection between art and politics in post-independent Ireland. His most recent project involved an online recreation of the 1922 World Congress of the Irish Race in Paris and associated art exhibition. So without further ado, further ado I will now hand you over to Billy Shorter. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Catherine, and thanks to the National Museum of Ireland and the Hugh Lane Gallery for hosting today and organising it, uh, and for inviting me to chair as well. Uh, so welcome everyone to uh, this afternoon's session. The, two, the theme of this conference and the overlap of art and politics has long been debated. Uh, academic and politician Conor Cruz O'Brien defined it as an unhealthy intersection, while philosopher Richard Carney reckoned art must engage with the everyday, the political. For this session, titled Culture Legacy of the Treaty, we will continue this discussion. And we have this discussion on um, culture and politics. And we have four 20-minute presentations, variously grounded in visual art, music, and sport. Speakers are Neve McNally, Terry Moylan, Dr. Emer O'Connor, and Professor Paul Rouse. Following the four papers, we will have 20 minutes or so for questions. So please hold your questions to the end, or people online can, can put them in the, in, in the chat. Our first speaker is Neve McNally. Neve is the curator of the Prints and Drawings Study Room at the National Gallery of Ireland, and has research interests in the work of women artists, 20th century Irish art, and unsurprisingly, in modern and contemporary print. Among other texts, she has edited the Gallery's Essential Guide and co-authored the works of J.M.W. Turner at the National Gallery of Ireland. She has curated numerous NGI exhibitions, but most pertinent to today, later this year she will curate Estella Solomon's Still Moments, which is the title of her paper. So over to you, Dean. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a lovely opportunity for me to uh, highlight uh, this particular artist who's been uh, I suppose in the shadows for a long time and also to highlight the fact that this is a small display that will be happening at the, towards the end of the year uh, to mark basically uh, the decade of St. Tineries. And it's an, uh, an exhibition that's basically dedicated to an artist, a committed nationalist, uh, a coming among member, um, Estella Solomons. Uh, so during basically quiet moments in her great Brunswick Street now, Pier Street studio, she captured, I think, for posterity, uh, many leading figures involved in the revolutionary struggle and the cultural renaissance. Her studio was seen as both as a safe house uh, for War of Independence revolutionaries and a cultural salon for artists, literary patriots and politicians. It was often, of course, raided during the Civil War by Free Strait troops due to her support of the anti-treaty side. Uh, later in life, she turned uh, from portraiture to landscape painting, but uh, nonetheless, her, those particular landscapes s uh, hold that same kind of vigorous quality as her early uh, painted portraits. Within this particular display later in the year, I'll be incorporating uh, archival material from the Estella Solomons uh, and uh, Seamus O'Sullivan Archive at Trinity College, which basically shed further light on the artist's revolutionary activities and network of close comrades. Her work remains, as art historian Hilary Pyle once noted, a testament to her own gentle but radical soul and speaks to the spirit of her generation. So I'll just see if we're going forward there. No. There we go. So she was an artist. Um, from a prominent uh, 
Jewish family in Dublin, uh, one of the earliest Jewish families uh, in Ireland. And um, thanks to her, I suppose, well-to-do background, uh, she was not reliant on commissions, but instead drew her sub subjects from family and a wide circle of nationalist and literary friends. Some of her best portraits, I would say, uh, were painted during the revolutionary period, and they convey a great kind of psychological intensity, with sitters caught oftentimes in moments of introspection. This uh, uh, portrait here on the left is by Sissy Beckett, her close friend, of course, aunt of the writer Samuel Beckett, and they would have attended the Metropolitan School of Art together. Uh, like many artists, Estella was uh, devoted to the cause of Irish nationalism and she was involved in military activity and it's assisted fellow Republicans. And I would hasten to think that this particular portrait uh, highlights some of her youthful idealism and courageous spirit. She was a very beautiful woman uh, with a very independent mind and spirit, something that uh, she carried throughout her life. This portrait of her mother, who was a gifted pianist and published poet, um, Rosa uh, uh, Solomons, she was very uh, fundamental in the establishment of the Adelaide Road Synagogue in Dublin in 1892, which contained schoolrooms uh, for 200 pupils. She was also involved in the Irish Women's Suffrage and Local Government Association. And um, her parents both basically instilled an interest in art, culture, literature uh, in their four tr children. And I would think that this particular portrait shows her strong disposition and character. The portrait in the centre then is a portrait of a rabbi. And this is an interesting one because obviously Dublin in the 1920s had a Jewish population of around 3,000. Um, and this portrait has been identified as the Reverend Abraham Godansky, who made a lasting impression on that particular congregation of Adelaide Road Synagogue uh, during his time there between 1901 and 1938. And new evidence by genealogist Stuart Rosenblatt has unearthed that uh, Godansky had a role in high Michael Collins from the Black and Tans in 1920. Disguising him in traditional Jewish garb, he enabled Collins to evade detection at a blockade set up on Dublin's Longwood Avenue. So the Jewish community very much kind of um, connecting, uh, you know, with the nationalist uh, cause. The, then the lovely little work on the right, uh, garden scene, it highlights, I suppose, her genteel middle-class upbringing uh, based uh, at her family home on 26 Waterloo Road. And um, the thing I like about this particular work is it uh, hides the fact uh, of her kind of covert activity as a member of the Rath uh, Ranala branch of Cumann Amon where basically she hid ammunitions for Sinn Féin volunteers under lettuces she had planted in her parents' garden. But no hint of such kind of activity is highlighted here. As I said, she joined or enlisted in Cumann Amon in 1917, um, where members were trained by Phyllis Ryan in first aid, home nursing, drill and signalling. And as I said, she concealed ammunitions for Sinn Féin volunteers and delivered them to an agent known as the Butterman in Bagot Street. Uh, he taught her how to fire a revolver and in exchange she painted a portrait of his wife. He was later arrested, not for his revolutionary activities, but rather for his habit of watering down the milk. Um, so. In, 1920, in, in 1910, she uh, rented a studio in, uh, on 17 Great Brunswick Street. She installed an etching press there. And this particular studio was a hub for literary and artistic discussions, uh, exhibitions and entertainment. And with its style, skylight and stacked canvases, it also functioned as a safe house for those directly involved in the nationalist struggle, many of whom sat to her. Solomon sketched Dublin city slums, alleyways, shadowy archways and notable buildings. And during those troubled years, she obtained official passes in order to sketch in military zones. Her etchings of Do Old Dublin, created at a time when the city had the highest mortality rate in Europe, are re reminiscent of master etchers like Rembrandt. As I said, she uh, was a supporter of the anti-treaty side and in 1925 she went out on strike with several teaching staff of the Dublin Municipal Technical Schools where she taught etching, having refused to take the obligatory oath of allegiance to the British Crown. She was later invited uh, to teach again at the school but at that stage she had turned her attention to painting. 
Some of the people then she painted, the likes of uh, the novelist and poet James Stevens, who had been introduced to her by her brother Bethel Solomons. And he lived in the flat down uh, below her in um, Great Brunswick Street. And uh, I think Solomon's very much uh, captures his intellect uh, with this broad forehead and where he goes. A really stunning portrait of her brother Bethel Solomon's and an image of him to the right. He was an incredibly progressive uh, person, her younger brother, master of the Rotunda Hospital, president of the Jewish, uh, Dublin Jewish Progressive Congregation and was famous for his researches into obstetrics, gynaecology and infertility and was an at active supporter of the suffrage movement. He also played rugby for Ireland so he was uh, certainly um, very uh, active and uh, he had many friends uh, like Estella in the literary set. James Stevens of course dedicating the charwoman's daughter to him. A person who introduced Estella to her husband uh, was uh, again another close friend and nationalist uh, George Russell um, and he introduced uh, Estella to his protege Seamus O'Sullivan. And his summer retreat in County Donegal, Sheephaven, is where the couple basically went to paint and write and also where their love flourished. And his own at-homes in Rathgar were attended by many of the leading cultural and political figures of the day. And those same figures would have, of course, sat to Estella. Out of respect for her parents, though, who were leaders, as I said, in the Jewish community, Solomon's waited 16 years until her parents had died before marrying uh, Seamus O'Sullivan in 1926. And the love letters between them that are housed at Trinity College basically uh, attest to her frustration um, at that uh, situation. She writes... Uh, to Seamus, uh, you seem like an exotic plant in a greenhouse that's barred and locked. There is that unbreakable glass between us. But they had a famously happy marriage and uh, again held these at homes um, and fancy dress parties that were attended by many literary patriots. The couple, of course, collaborated on the Dublin Magazine, uh, which was an important forum for emerging Irish writers from 1923 until O'Sullivan's death in 1958. And that influential magazine presented some of the first published work uh, by poets John Montague and Patrick Kavanagh, in addition to Samuel Beckett. So she would have dedicated a lot of her time sourcing funding and advertising for this particular magazine. And she did so with her fellow coming on a member. Let me see. This woman here on uh, the left, um, nearest to me, Kathleen Goodfellow. Kathleen Goodfellow was from a wealthy Dublin Quaker family and she was also a poet and writer who published under the pseudonym Michael Scott. She wrote about the black and tans and the atrocities uh, that they committed. Um, she was indeed the primary patron of the Dublin magazine and she also ensured its survival. The, woman, the women actually met during the 1916 Easter Rising while sheltering from snipers bullets on Mount Street and in 1917 they both enlisted in the, as I said, Ranel branch of Cumann and Mon. The woman in the centre then, this is a stunning portrait that she did uh, that's going to come to the exhibition from uh, the uh, Ulster Museum of Alice Milligan. And of course Alice Milligan did not comply with the norms of the time. Despite her Methodist and Unionist Tyrone background, she became a leading literary figure in the Irish Cultural Revival and co-edited the Irish Nationalist Literary Journal, journal The Shan Van Vught in Belfast. She supported De Valera, in his opposition to the treaty, and in the 1930s became a founding member of the Anti-Partition League, publishing articles and poetry in northern uh, nationalist and American uh, newspapers. And then on the, um, uh, the, the gentleman there, uh, where I think Excel again presents this very pensive face and zones in on, on his stocky frame, is the poet J Joseph Campbell. Again, this is going to come from the Ulster Museum. And he was a staunch um, uh, opposer of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. In July 1922, while assisting Republicans in North Wicklow in the Civil War, he was arrested by Free State troops in Bray and imprisoned in Mountjoy until the following December. And he wrote in his prison diary that the Free State was founded on dishonour, built on corruption, and later regarded de Valera's decision to enter the Dáil as a betrayal of rep republicanism. 
Austin Clark published a collection of his poetry and Austin Clark also sat to Estella Solomons. Another great portrait is uh, by her is of um, the friend and political ally of Arthur Griffiths, Sean Milroy, Irish revolutionary and Republican. And again, I think in this particular portrait, uh, Estella really does capture uh, Milroy's commanding presence. He was elected to the second Dáil in 1921 and served in Shannon Aaron from 1928 to 1936. The work that the National Gallery acquired back in 2017 is called On Parole and dates to 1920. And as I said before, uh, Solomon's studio very much became a place of refuge for many War of Independence revolutionaries, several, as I said, who sat to her. And she had to destroy many of the resulting portraits to avoid basically incriminating the sitters. And her husband, Seamus O'Sullivan, later recalled that her studio was not only a centre of artistic activity and goodly conversation, but it was also a centre of quiet, of calm, a place of refuge for many whose political and nationalist uh, activities had brought them a very undesirable amount of notice in the bad times. Solomon evokes, I think, the tension of those times through the sitter's furrowed brow and kind of inward-looking gaze in this uh, particular portrait. Here we have, uh, again, more correspondence between uh, Seamus O'Sullivan and uh, Estella Solomons. A letter from 1920 from Seamus to Estella that's in Trinity's archive. Um, he affectionately addresses her all the time as Dear Queen. And um, this letter, dated the 21st of September 1920, highlights those turbulent times that they were living in. He writes, I wish I could be with you as I want to, but the evening paper with all its horrible news has plunged me into hell. And he continues, pray for peace in Ireland. And then another example of that correspondence is a, is a letter that she wrote to him uh, two days after Michael Collins' death uh, when she's in England. And uh, she's basically expressing her grief on hearing of the death of Collins, writing, I hate London and I want to come home to you. The English, she says, are a vile people. The whole place seems to be clothes and food and beastly faces. I feel as if I could never smile again. The shooting of Collins has made me sick. So another key figure who was a, a very much a, a, a close friend of hers as well and a regular visitor to her uh, studio was Frank Gallagher. And during the War of Independence and the Civil War, of course, he was a, a brilliant propagandist for the underground Republican government. Uh, the year he, this portrait was actually painted, he was imprisoned and later went on hunger strike, uh, one of many hunger strikes. And uh, he used this particular portrait as the frontispiece to his book, The Four Glorious Years of 1953, written under his pseudonym, David Hogan. He, of course, was a staunch supporter of the anti-treaty side, and he became a tireless publicist for De Valera. In 1931, he was appointed the first editor of the Irish press. And I just wanted to highlight a letter here that he wrote uh, from Kilmainham Jail to Estella Solomons in 1923, where he's uh, writing basically to thank her um, for the chocolate cake, the cigarettes, and a book by Kathleen Goodfellow, her friend of 50 years, that she had sent him the previous March. And he also notes uh, that his fellow inmate, Ernie O'Malley, sends, him, sends her his love. And as I said, he went on a number of hunger strikes, the, the longest lasting 41 days. But in this particular letter of 1923, he writes, I am in great form after my little fast. On the 40th day, I could still walk. And now that I've been eating for a week, I feel like Goliath. Ernie sends his love. We are being awfully well looked after here and were carefully nursed right through. That explains why there were no deaths here. Had Ernie and Sean Buckley left in the, were left in the joy, we would be mourning for them today. And then a letter that Ernie O'Malley writes to Estella Solomons in 1923, while incarcerated in prison, um, he basically asks her for a well-illustrated book on Durer and any old peri periodicals and books that she might have. And uh, during a visit, basically, from Estella's uh, uh, 
brother-in-law, uh, a man called Bethel Jacobs, uh, he was a member of the British Army in World War I, and, and basically Estella took his uniform and gave it to Ernie O'Malley. And O'Malley writes in this particular letter that although he had promised to return the uniform, he was unable to keep uh, his word. And he finishes in the letter, you know, having talked extensively about the, the uniform and the belt, uh, you know, that he lost it in an ambush and, uh, you know, that the, the belt had a, a great career in itself. Um, he finishes that the free state people here are honest and do not interfere with any of our parcels sent to us. In fact, I'll, I'll just uh, note a, a couple of lines from that particular letter. Um, he writes, do you remember the uniform and belt you gave me? Um, you, you may remember I promised to give it back. Um, I'm so sorry, but I was uh, unable to keep my word. The tunic was in a dugout in Tipperary, and perhaps if I pull through, I may be able to get it back to you. The belt um, had its own exciting career. Um, about a month after you gave it to me, uh, the house I was staying in in County Limerick was surrounded in the night by tans and military. And uh, as I was dressed at the time, I dashed into the yard uh, with the belt um, containing two guns in my hand. Uh, I did not have time to draw. Heavy fire was um, fired and I, I charged a group lost the belt and guns, uh, succeeded in climbing a gate, a ploughed field beyond the gate helped my escape. So, you know, it's fascinating the, 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 the fact that these, these uh, letters are, are, are show a, a very particular uh, time. And uh, he also writes how being injured, he's going to uh, take a long time to recover um, um, from a shoulder in injury and he's not able to see that well, so hence wanting a, a good illustrated book by Durer. Just finally now, just to say that uh, in the latter part of her life, she very much uh, turned to painting landscapes. And as I said, uh, the, the vitality in those landscapes is similar to what she achieved in her earlier uh, portraits. But really from the 1950s, arthritis prevented her from painting. I would hasten to say that her portraits very much provide an astounding visual record of the, the men and women involved in the revolutionary movement um, during those turbulent times. And, you know, she was very kind of spontaneous uh, painter, uh, not utilising any uh, preparatory studies, etc. And so that kind of uh, notion of her illuminating those friendships and connections uh, among the, the people that sat to her in her studio, I think uh, within a very uh, turbulent time is really of, of great interest. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Neve, <coughs> on the sort of visual and documentary r records of, of the revolutionary times. Um, our next speaker is Terry Moylan, who has had a lifelong interest in traditional music, dances and songs of Ireland. An Ilan Piper, he worked for a couple of decades as archivist of Nepipiri Ilan. He founded a set dancing group, Brooks Academy, who were the first publishers of manuals for Irish set dancing and Irish step dancing. <coughs> and the four speakers later today will give a demonstration of both step and set dancing. <laughs> Terry has published two collections, The Age of Revolution, 1776 to 1815, in the Irish song tradition, and The Indignant Muse, Poetry and Songs of the Irish Revolution, 1887 to 1936, both with Lilliput Press. Terry's paper is titled, Those in Power Don't Write the Songs. Terry. Thanks, Philip. Thank you all very much. I think I'm the light relief here. Now, those in power don't write the songs. I was a bit puzzled to be asked to be here today because uh, what relationship has Irish traditional arts got with the treaty? But I discovered a couple of aspects that I could talk about. And what I'm going to do is present a reflection on the interface between the event that was the ratification of the Anglo-Irish Treaty and the world of Irish song. But when I use the word song, 
it should be understood to embrace the whole thing, music, song, and dance. I'm going to address this in two ways. Firstly, using the word song in a literal but restricted sense, the Irish song tradition includes a genre known loosely as rebel songs, political songs, songs of struggle, songs of protest. This body of material is actually peripheral to the core of Irish song. It's important to the motivated, but is relatively unused among the community of traditional singers who are attracted to songs by qualities other than party feeling. But it was this outlying sector of Irish song that generated tradition's response to the treaty, and I will describe that. Secondly, the treaty or the regime that resulted from it has a significant effect upon the broad tradition of Irish music, dance and song. One could say that it was an unequal contest between Irish traditional culture and the establishment eased into power by the treaty. While the former delivered its opinion on the event in the form of vitriolic verse, the establishment treated tradition with a mixture of contempt and hostility. The Ireland that was established by those who accepted and defended the treaty turned out to be an uncongenial location for the continued exercises of those traditional practices. Before the achievement of independence, folk culture had been viewed with a kind of ignorant indifference. Captain Francis O'Neill was one of the most trenchant critics of this situation, damning the subversion of popular taste by mass-produced cultural goods that he encountered among the Irish in America and on visits to Ireland. I will explore these developments uh, shortly, but first I want to give some examples of the response in the world of folk music to the treaty. I thought I would have a timer up here, Billy. I don't. Okay. The most obvious response was in the area of songs. Songs created by individuals who felt a compulsion to express in verse deeply felt attitudes. This type of song has always been made in both English and Irish. The penal laws, the white boy movement, the United Irishmen, the Rockites, the repeal movement, the anti-tithe agitation, the famine, the resistance to proselytization, the Fenians, the Invincibles, the land war, the rising and the war of independence all generated their own contributions to the store. All were the products of the common muse or the indignant muse as different writers have characterized the makers of these songs. A constant stream of nationalist radical verse was produced over a period of centuries. All with the same hate figure in view, the British occupying power or the local forces of law and order, which was perceived as the same thing. It was a tradition of song making that was homogenous in its division of the world into heroes and villains. This uniformity came to a sudden stop with the treaty. Suddenly, the British, the villainous British foe was replaced by the Irish traitor. For with the division of the Irish forces into two camps, pro and anti-treaty, only one side, the anti-treaty side, continued to feel the motivation to produce songs expressing their feelings. Perhaps those who supported the treaty no longer felt the need to express their grievances in verse, or no longer felt aggrieved, being comfortable with the new arrangements. The great singer Frank Hart was fond of repeating the formula, those in power write the histories, those who suffer write the songs. It certainly seems to be the case that those in power don't write the songs. For those who had seen their cherished project snatched away, a 32 county Irish Republic completely separated from Britain, the grievances went very deep indeed, and these were expressed in often vitriolic verse. I have a number of these selected for your entertainment, but uh, given the time, I think I might skip briefly over some of them. I went to see David to London to David. I went to see David and what did he do? He gave me a free state, a nice little free state, 
a free state that's tied up with red, white, and blue. Patrick Galvin, Irish Songs of Resistance in the 1940s, it was published. The Free Staters Evening Prayer. The prologue, the prologue goes, as the name of God does not appear either in the treaty or the constitution of the Irish Free State, while the name of the king is ever present in and dominates both documents, it naturally follows that all free staters will henceforth pray to the king. From 16 to 21, published in 1936, and this puts the boot in, the cunning tyrant fooled them when their fight was bravely won, and he beat them at the table when he failed to with the gun. Again, 1936. Four Courts Ditty. The Four Courts has been shelled and shocked, whack for the diddle of the dido day. For the Free State Party won't be mocked, whack for the diddle of the dido day. With Bell Mick Collins to the front, but Dublin's born the battle's brunt, oh, five million pounds, oh, it's a stunt, whack for the diddle of the dido day. Whack for the diddle of the dido day, see the Four Courts on the quay. What did Mr. Churchill say? Whack for the diddle all the day, do day. I came to Dublin one summer evening, and what do you think of my surprise? Along the quays was a battle raging, sure I scarcely could believe me eyes. There were guns, big bounders, and eighteen pounders all banging away at the four courts there. And along the roofs there were snipers sniping and bullets all whizzing through the air. I'm doing this so you get a, a flavour of what they were intended to be like. A Dublin battle ditty to the tune of the wearing of the green. Sure, I met with Dick Mulcahy and he took me by the hand Says he, how goes it across the town? How does the Gresham stand? Those rebels want a lesson. We cannot stand their cheek, so we'll finish what the British started here in Easter week. The Battle of the Bower, written by a man in County Kerry, and a kind of entertaining slag on the whole thing, because this was a battle that took place in Rathmore in County Kerry, and they blazed away each other for a whole day, and nobody was shot, nobody was injured. There ne'er was such a rattle as the Battle of the Bower. One of the best pieces written about the Civil War was by Sigurd and Clifford. You may know him as the author of The Boys of Barnley Shry, the, one of the best songs of the period. But he wrote a poem called The Ballad of the Tinker's Son. And he recounts how, when he was a boy in school, a tinker's son was brought into the school and put beside him at his desk. And they grew to know each other and play together and love each other. And they grew up and they kept in touch. And when the Anglo-Irish War broke out, they both joined the revolutionary forces and fought side by side. And then the truce came, the treaty came, and they split up. They lost contact and went their separate ways until the civil war broke out and they found themselves on opposite sides. And the two final verses tell you what happened next. I don't know any poem or song from the period that gives you such a kick in the head as that one. You have the language of the staters the staters came from Dublin, but ere they got to Mallow, they were seriously delayed by the fighting 10th Battalion of the 1st Cork Brigade. This is all very cliched stuff. Churchill's Green and Tans. This is from the Ernie O'Malley collection, and you can see the point it makes again. The, uh, those who accepted the treaty were traitors. The most extreme of these, of course, is take it down from the mast, 
Irish traitors, tis the flag we Republicans claim, etc., etc. One of the most humorous things to come from the period was written by uh, Brian O'Higgins. I will arise and go now and go to Inish Free. If it were Inish Free now, I wouldn't know its name. And in my hut of wattles, I'll be spooning with the she. Don't make it she, dear printer, for it wouldn't be the same. And in the Celtic twilight, I'll destroy the ABC of Is and Ta and other things I'd dearly like to ban. For Kathleen Neulachan is different, you see, to Kathleen, the daughter of Houlihan. The language of the Senate there shall fall upon my ear. I'll purchase me an aerial when my pension check is paid. And with my own right hand, I'll draw 360 quid a year to keep the pot of broth aboil in the WB loud glade. And when the vulgar Gaelic tongue is dead as Finn McCool, don't print it Fionn McCool, or it will baffle WB. I'll teach Yeatsonian Irish in a purely pagan school to keep the home fires burning in the Isle of Inishfree. <laughs> Brian O'Higgins was a very skilled satirist, but it all goes one way, I'm afraid. You might be inclined to dismiss such verse as worthless, but it does have one feature of interest. It preserves in a completely unambiguous way the mentalité of the community that produced it. Another of Frank Hart's sayings was, if you want to know what happened, read the histories. If you want to know how it felt, read the songs. That is certainly the case with these products of turbulent times. They can be thought of as equivalents a century ago of today's use of social media to express extreme political positions and make contact with like-minded people. Just let's take a look at the men and women who did write the songs the ones who instigated the revolution. They're the big three, Pierce, McDonough, Plunkett, they're all well known, but they weren't alone. Other people who wrote verse, James Connolly, Eamon Kiant, Constance Markovich, Maeve Kavanagh, The O'Rahilly, Thomas Ash, Terence McSweeney, Roger Casement, Ernie O'Malley, before mentioned Brian O'Higgins, Pather Kearney, even Tom Clark and Con Colbert all put pen to paper. They were all interested in, even in a small way sometimes, of creativity. I'm going to take Kant's record as the most interesting of these. He was the author of one indifferent song, a parody of Deutschland über alles, Ireland overall but a man who achieved, devoted considerable energy to the transmission of Irish musical arts. It's arguable that the primary contribution that Kant made to Ireland consisted of his commitment to Irish music, and in particular to Irish piping. He went into battle in 1916 with two talismans in his knapsack, a component from a set of illen pipes and a component from a set of war pipes. Both objects live in this institution, I believe. Before his involvement in revolutionary politics, he had been involved in no less revolutionary musical activities as the leading activist of the Dublin Pipers Club, established in 1900. He was acutely conscious of the possibility that, that the playing of the Irish pipes, the Union pipes, Illan pipes is a modern misnomer, could fail into oblivion, just as the Irish harp had done at the beginning of the 19th century. He arranged for pipers with the crucial link to a century of traditional practice to perform and teach in the Dublin club. Those who acquired their piping in that way, figures such as Leo Rousam, Jimmy Ennis and others, were seminal throughout the 20th century in writing the songs. But the effort was beset with constant indifference and sometimes contempt from official, institutional or comfortable Ireland. One uh, example will make the point. At its outset, the Feshkul Association had an interest in traditional music and made efforts to publish it, eventually succeeding in 1914 after several aborted attempts in publishing a small collection of airs and dance music. Sorry, that's, that's Eamon Kant in the front, sitting down with the moustache beside the uh, 
the worthies of the Dublin Pipers Club. Feshkul Collection. In earlier years, they had organized competitions for unpublished airs, and competitors would play, sing, or lilt their music into the horns of Edison recording machines so that the adjudicators could later transcribe and examine them to see if they had or had not already been published. But the cylinders then mostly were reused and the performances erased. The attitude was that the dots on the paper constituted the crucial artifacts rather than the played tunes. They were like butterflies to be captured and pinned to a board. Once successfully salvaged from illiterate musicians, they could be regarded as saved and made available to proper musicians in printed collections which cannot possibly convey the music in which, the way in which the music was performed. It's like trying to learn German from a book without ever hearing German spoken. You can't do it. In other areas, musicians were expected to conform to conventions appropriate to classical music before being afforded the opportunity of public performance. The school music curriculum then and now was structured on the conviction that art music is the only real music and all else is a degenerate form. As mentioned before, the situation of cultural degradation before the revolution was articulated by the aforementioned Captain Francis O'Neill. He was unforgiving of the cultural debasement of his countrymen and his opinions are to be found in several letters of the time that have been preserved. Irish indifference paralyzes optimism and discourages effort. The human strata which comprises membership of Irish societies, fraternal, religious or convivial, regards any expenditure in the direction of intellectual luxuries or wants prohibitive which exceeds the standard dollar. Religious organisations, propaganda and church extension, led, fostered and forced by the most powerful influence in the world, monopolised the energies of our race with the exception of their undoubted talents for agitation and conspiracy. I'm going to have to skip a couple of these, I'm afraid. To the earlier climate of ignorant condescension, the new state added active hostility. The real body blow delivered by official establishment Ireland to, to traditional music was the passing in 1935 of the Public Dance Halls Act. The Catholic Church lobbied for regulation for years before the act was introduced. Their motivation was their perception of the danger to morals provided by social dancing. The church's campaign included public statements from the hierarchy, sermons at masses and letters to newspapers. Junior Cree and the great Clare fiddle players on record as deploring the effect of the act on traditional practice around the country. However, the act did not prohibit gatherings like this. I researched the papers on the action of the National Archives a few years ago, and these are the opinions of the Attorney General at the time. I am of opinion that the dances referred to are not held in controversial of, contravention of the act because they are not held in the place as defined in that act. And various supporting minutes conveying this information to the, uh, the powers that be. The end result was that the clergy and the police behaved as if the act did prohibit these dances. And the ordinary people whose amusements they were had no option but to believe them and comply. And our traditional arts were nearly wiped out as a result. I'm just going to conclude. Yeah. Those without power continued to make the songs. And these are a selection of the grass, grassroots activists who managed to keep the flame alive in the years, the bleak years of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. 
Nowadays, the Irish, dare I use the, fr the phrase, middle classes have discovered traditional music and how wonderful it is. And they believe that because they have just discovered it, it has only just come into being. But this is a record of the, the people who actually kept it in being because they knew its worth. Just to conclude on a, a short remark on the same topic. It has often been said that the single event that enabled the Irish middle class to get over their aversion to Irish music was Sean O'Reid addressing the traditional musicians of his group, Kjolthori Coolen, in dinner suits for their 1969 concert in the Gaiety, where they played selections of traditional tunes arranged in the style of a chamber music ensemble. When those musicians were dressed in their ordinary clothes, playing their music in their customary locations in the way it had always been played, it was not worth attention, even though it was played with the same flair and virtuosity. People educated to value one kind of music and look down on another needed it to be dressed up and made almost like the music they liked so that they could like it. <coughs> to return finally to the theme, those in power don't write the songs, the proposition is supported by the case of the erstwhile anti-treatyites getting over their reservations and entering the Doyle in the late 20s, upon which they too ceased to create songs of protest. But the irreconcilable rump that they left outside continued to do so. We have scores of songs created by the diehards. Sean South of Gary Owen, The Patriot Game, The Four Green Fields, Only Our Rivers Run Free, the men behind the wire were not a squeak from those who finally accepted the democratic process. It leads one to an appreciation of the dismal nature of these songs. Some of them are well written and can be well sung, but most have their effect only in the company of the committed. The great American satirist Tom Lair might be accorded the credit for the final pithiest observation on the subject, his song, The Folk Song Army, satirizes the 1960s American fashion of protest song, and one verse tells it all. Let's remember the war against Franco. That's the kind where we really belong. He may have won all the battles, but we had all the best songs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. And you didn't go over time because we don't count singing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Our third speaker today is art historian and visual art curator, Dr. Emer O'Connor, who is uh, the resident director of the Tyrone Guthrie Centre at Anna McCarrick. The predominant concerns in her research are the complex national and international contexts pertaining to the construction of Irish visual identity in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Emer is the author of numerous texts, including Sean Keating, Art, Politics and Building the Irish Nation, and more recently, Art, Ireland and the Irish Diaspora, Chicago, Dublin, New York, Culture, Connections and Controversies, which was awarded the inaugural Lawrence J. McCaffrey Prize for Book in Irish America. Emer's talk t t t today is titled Art, Ireland and the Irish American Diaspora, Tensions in Representation. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, I can tell you I'm not going to sing, <laughs> but I'm, I hope I don't go over time, but I'm not doing any singing, okay? It's just great to be here, isn't it? Great to be at a live thing. Um, I am ju it's just so nice, and thank you for the invitation. If I may, just for a moment, I'd like to remember S.B. Kennedy, who passed away not so long ago, whose books were so important to us in Irish art history. I hope that's appropriate, but I, I feel it is. So uh, today I am going to focus on tensions in Ireland, specifically around the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art during the 1920s, while at the same time highlighting a series of interconnected networks between Dublin and New York, which were to prove vital for the sales of Irish art at that time. I'm going to begin with George Russell A.E., who we heard mentioned earlier, who is probably best known among art historians for his outright condemnation of cubism and abstract art. Yet A.E. was a visual artist, an author, a pacifist, and a forthright cultural commentator, although his continual desire for unity kept him from being a Republican. 
He, he declined a place offered to him in the Irish Senate in the post-Civil War years, preferring instead to encourage cooperation between all people from his helm as the editor of the Irish Homestead, a publication owned by the Irish Agricultural Organisation Society, the IAOS, which had been founded by Sir Horace Plunkett. To quote Con Curran in 1935, A.E. was one of the rare people who maintained their friendships unbroken in the strain of civil war. A.E.'s peaceful yet thought-provoking stance is evident in this open letter to Irish Republicans published in the Irish Times in December 1922. In civil war, more hateful passions are let loose because greater natural affections must first be overcome. The whole body politic suffers, the people far more than the state. Which of you are architects, master craftsmen in the art of nation building? You have yet to create cultural, economic and political ideals which the nation can brood over and take to its heart. There is no dishonour, he said, in raising the conflict from the physical to the intellectual plane. For it is there the only victories which do not leave the spirit desolate and bankrupt can be won. Thinking about the art of nation building, Sean Keating was a devout nationalist from the outset of his career, and subsequently he and his wife were devoutly anti-treaty. It was this painting, an allegory, that signalled Keating's intention to get on with life in New Ireland. It tells us in a palette that suggests the bitterness of the internecine violence, that it was time to bury the civil war, the two figures on either side of the coffin, and to get back to a sense of order bombed out in the building in the background, so that New Ireland, the baby in the foreground, previously imagined, could now ring itself into being in spite of the two men in cahoots to the left of the image, one of whom looks suspiciously like Edward Carson. Keating, like many artists and cult those involved in culture, did not want Ireland to let itself down any further. Keating, like many artists of the time, was a published cultural commentator, and in an article titled, and listen to this, The Slave Mind of Ireland, which he published the same year that he painted an allegory, he wrote, we blame the English, we blame the climate. Unless we take off our boots and dirty our hands if need be, we, the Irish, are doomed and damned to the bottomless pit of futility, and we shall have nobody to blame but ourselves. All very positive. <laughs> Keating's main focus, however, after the Civil War was the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art. He felt that artists had a place in society and had given proper facilities in the school. The post-treaty government, um, the government uh, and government-funded opportunities, Ireland's artists could contribute to building the Irish nation both at home and abroad. It was for this reason that he began painting emerging history, such as the con construction of the hydroelectric station at Ardna Crusha in 1926, for which, I stress, he was not commissioned. Like so many of his contemporaries, he was to become bitterly disappointed by successive governments' failure to properly fund the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art and to establish it as a university. Meantime, in the post-Civil War years, Irish painters engaged with modern life in different ways. Jack B. Yeats, for example, casts a cold eye on post-treaty poverty. This is a painterly document of society's history at the time. Life for this young flower seller was no different than it had been a few mere years before. There were artists who wanted to explore new methods of painting, another way of seeing, a different way to contribute the new, to the new Irish nation. Mainly, Jellett brought Cubist-inspired abstraction to Dublin with the exhibition of decoration with the Dublin Society of Painters in 1923, thereby igniting the ire of one George Russell, who, as a cultural commentator, was biological in his condemnation of the work. On the other hand, evidence of George Russell's belief in everyone working together towards an equality of life in Ireland is clear in a painting such as The Stone Carriers, a metaphor in which the two women, note the two women, each carry their fair share of the weight. In the post-treaty treaty years, Ireland's visual artists were anxious to make their mark, to make real what had been previously imagined, and to contribute to the cultural construction of the new nation. But frankly, contributing to cultural construction was all very well, but artists needed a market. 
And while the RHA put on their annual exhibition every year, it was even more short of space since taking up residence in the School of Art after the destruction of their purpose-built Academy House in the Easter Rising of 1916. The, ex the exhibition space available in the capital expanded with the event of the Dublin Painters in 1920, who showed on St. Stephen's Green, and with the opening, or reopening rather, of the Daniel Egan Gallery on the same St. Stephen's Green in 1926, along with the Victor Waddington Gallery, which had opened in 1924. And there were other venues throughout the country, but truthfully, unless the church was commissioning or buying, it was difficult to eke out a living as a visual artist without a teaching position or some other form of employment in the post-treaty years. America, however, was a big place, a wealthy place, a place where one could invent or reinvent oneself, a place of emigration for so many from Ireland. Irish visual artists were very, very keen to find a market there in the post-treaty years. John Butler Yeats, pictured here by his friend, American artist Wald Cunn, moved to the city in 1907 and never returned to Ireland. Although he maintained his connections to his family and friends through dozens of letters sent throughout the rest of his life, he actually died in New York in 1922. Yeats lived under the watchful care of American Irish lawyer and art collector John Quinn. And here's Quinn pictured by John Butler Yeats. Quinn was deeply involved in Irish-American cultural life, a friend to many of the best-known Irish artists of the day, a subscriber to several publications from Ireland, lawyer to innumerable Irish writers seeking copyright rights in America, collector of Irish visual art, peacemaker, financial contributor to the Abbey Theatre and to Scalena, organiser of lecture tours for Porrick Pierce, George Russell, Lady Gregory and many others, co-author with George Russell and Horace Plunkett of a publication on the Home Rule Convention in 1917. And as it happens, thinking of who's uh, supported this conference today, the last person to see Sir Hugh Lane alive in New York before his tragic end on the Lusitania in May 1915. Quinn travelled to Ireland for the first, time, first of three visits in 1902, during which he met everyone that was anyone on the Irish art scene. He was close to the Yates family, which explains to some extent how the father of the family ended up under his watchful and attentive care in New York. A financial backer and co-organiser of the 1930 Armoury Exhibition in New York, Quinn exhibited work from his private collection of Irish art by George Russell and Nathaniel Hone, the younger, at the show. And he encouraged Jack B. Yates to exhibit work there too. Among Quinn's network of Irish artists in New York were two men who would later involve themselves in a major venture. The first was Dungarvan born Michael Power O'Malley, or Pom to his friends. He was originally Michael Power. His mother married again to an O'Malley, so he became Michael Power O'Malley. This is an undated self portrait from a private collection in America. He was introduced to John Quinn by Countess Markiewicz, who saw an exhibition of his work in Dublin in 1912. By 1913, the artist had settled well into New York life and was living along the Hudson River in the area known as the Palisades. Power O'Malley returned to Ireland once a year to paint works for his American buyers. He concentrated on picture postcard landscapes aimed at the expatriate community. He was not inspired by cubism or modernism. He had no interest in visual metaphors, just straightforward bucolic landscape, easy on the eye for his purchasers. John Quinn died in 1924. He was a huge loss to the Irish cultural community in Dublin and New York. His collection of Irish art, along with his extensive collection of European modernist art, about which he received several highly disdainful letters from George Russell, was sold off between 1926 and 1927. Many of the works by John and Jack Yates were purchased by the Irish expatriate community, such as lawyer Cornelius J. Sullivan, and donated to the National Gallery of Ireland, the Hugh Lane, and the Modern Island in Sligo. Patrick Tui, born with one hand and with an intuitive talent as a painter, was well known on the Dublin art scene before he left for America in 1927, where he developed a promising career as a portrait painter before his tragic death left questions still unanswered. But in the few years before his death, a new gallery opened in New York, and owing to the Irish connections therein, Tui involved himself in suggesting Irish artists for the venue and in encouraging Irish artists to send their work to the gallery. 
The gallery to which I refer was called the Helen Hackett Gallery or the Helen Hackett Galleries. It was opened by Helen Hackett Nee Plechner in 1928. She was Dutch. After her divorce from Kilkenny-born artist, uh, Kilkenny-born book shop owner Ed Byrne Hackett, founder of the Brick Row Bookshop in New, in New Haven, in which he had run a small gallery uh, before the 1920s where he showed work by Harry Clark and George Russell, among others. Helen met Ed Byrne Hackett through the bookshop where she began working in about 1915. In fact, he had been married and he divorced his first wife to marry her. The Hackett family are incredibly interesting and, you know, subject of another talk some other time. To put them in context, um, Ed was the brother of author Francis Hackett, who was married to Danish author Senja Toksvik, and these were very, they lived in Wicklow in the 1930s. They were friendly, very friendly with Sean Keating. And Father William Hackett, who some of the historians here may know, uh, he was known for his Republican views for which he was posted to Australia by the Jesuit order in 1922. They just wanted to get shut of him. He got into big trouble over there too. All educated in Clongo's Wood, Ed, Francis and another brother, Dom, emigrated to America in the 1890s. They remained deeply involved with Irish culture and politics, and Helen actually visited Dublin with Ed in about 1915, where she met George Russell, members of the Yates family, and several other well-known writers and artists of the day. It was hardly surprising then that Helen Hackett would begin her gallery career with an exhibition termed by the local press, and I quote, as a revival of Irish art in New York. It was Patrick Toohey and Michael Power O'Malley in New York and Madeleine Boyd in Ireland who organised the artists for the event. There were several different representations of Ireland and the Irish in the exhibition, but before I show you some of them, I just wanted to draw your attention to this portrait of Patrick Toohey, wonderful work by Hilda Roberts, where he's shown uh, uh, with the glove over his left hand and note the little pencil in his pocket, denoting the fact that he was an artist. So on view at this exhibition were several types of landscape, including many by Michael Power O'Malley and several by Nathaniel, Nathaniel Hone, who was already well known in New York owing to John Quinn. It's a lovely work, isn't it, from the Crawford. Keating's Tipperary Hurler, which he painted in 1928 for the Amsterdam Olympics, is a visual metaphor uh, of the strength and resilience of the Irish with references that Irish-American audiences would have recognised. It was on exhibition in the show. He is an amalgam of Ben O'Hickey, a former member of the IRA turned art student under Sean Keating at the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art and later an artist, and the then famous, and I would even describe him as celebrity hurler, John Joe Hayes. There were several other portraits in the exhibition, including this wonderfully lively work painted by Hilda Roberts in 1929, showing George Russell in front of his own paintings and published books. By this stage, of course, AE was extraordinarily well known and highly respected in America. There were several other artists that showed, but I just wanted to show you this painting. Um, it is by Margaret Clark. Uh, Margaret Clark showed works there, so did Dermot O'Brien. Not this work, I'm just showing you what Dermot O'Brien looked like because he had, was the longest serving president of the RHJ. And Margaret Clark, of course, a wonderful artist. Porrick Cullum, who was an emigre to New York, wrote of the Hackett revival of Irish art. The movement that was initiated in Irish literature 30 years ago is being repeated in Irish painting. Irish painters have discovered a significance in their own countryside, in their own folk. It was this discovery that brought about the literary movement, and of course he's referring to poets such as W.B. Yeats, and to the works of Singh and others for the Abbey Theatre, which toured America on a frequent basis. The exhibition received good reviews in the New York newspapers, and Helen Hackett was so pleased that she travelled to Ireland later that summer to select works for group and individual exhibitions in her gallery. Her diary of her travels around Ireland in the summer of 1929 is well worth reading. It sheds light on how the other half lived in post-treaty Ireland when there was serious economic depression. And in spite of the economic deprivation suffered by many, she was collecting Irish silver and antique prints while drinking Bollinger champagne and having the best of red wine and the best of food in many of the great houses around Ireland. It really is an interesting testament to her time. For his part, 
Sean Keating undertook his first one-person show with Helen Hackett in December 1930, so this is just after the economic crash. His response to the economic conditions at the time, both in America and in Ireland, post the stock market crash, is immediately evident in this unbelievable painting called Homo Sapiens, an Allegory of Democracy. Keating always said that you could tell the measure of someone by their hat, but he also said that the world was run by people wearing certain types of hats, so you, there are several in this. And if you think, if you look at this, that this is a pleasant painting, or perhaps you don't, maybe you would or wouldn't hang it over your mantelpiece, he produced it as a Christmas card in 1930, so happy Christmas to you. He went on to paint, Night's Candles Are Burnt Out. As New Ireland moved into the 1930s, the pressure between tradition and modernity became far more explicit, evident, for example, in this painting, Night's Candles Are Burnt Out, in which Keating himself points to the modernity of the project, while a priest resolutely, by candlelight, reads by candlelight in the bottom right-hand corner of the painting. It says a lot about Keating's stance at the time. The tension is evident, too, in architect Michael Scott's pavilion for the New York World's Fair. Here it is for which he was officially encouraged to refer to a traditional signifier while yet presenting modernity in concrete and glass. In other words, this was his second iteration of the pavilion. His first design was something else entirely. He was told to change it to something recognisably Irish. And, of course, it became colloquially known as the Shamrock Pavilion. How am I doing for time? I'm, I'm going to do this. This is my final slide. Helen Hackett closed her gallery in 1934, but meantime, one Patrick Farrell, an American-Irish co-founder of the Irish Theatre in New York, opened the Irish art rooms in the city in 1930. He showed work by numerous well-known Irish artists right up until the 1939 World's Fair, to which he brought many of the Irish works in his gallery, so Keating's Tipperary was brought to the Shamrock Pavilion by Patrick Farrell. It was Farrell who gifted Keating's Tipperary Hurler to the Hugh Lane Gallery in 1957. As for the School of Art, Keating's big um, issue, it took until the French report of 1937, in which the Irish government brought in a group of people who could only speak French and not English, before the school received its status as the National College of Art. Keating was appointed Professor of Anatomy part-time with no pension. He spent the rest of his life painting portraits of Ireland's middle classes, painting religious commissions for which his wife, a devout agnostic, played the role of the Virgin Mary, and painting commissions of the Aran Islands so that he could support his wife and two children. His disappointment in the promise of Irish independence, specifically in terms of the treatment of artists by the state, continued even after the formation of the Arts Council in 1951. The National College of Art, by the way, became NCAD in 1971. George Russell, the man who encouraged cooperation in Ireland, became saddened by Irish politics as the 20s moved into the 30s. He eventually left his adopted city of Dublin, choosing instead to die in Bournemouth. Pardon me. <clears throat> the onset of World War II closed the American market for Irish art for the foreseeable future. By this stage, Helen Hackett had divorced again and moved into art dealership. She died sometime in the 1950s. Patrick Farrell closed his Irish art room sometime in the 1940s but continued to represent Irish artists. He visited Ireland several times during the 1960s. It's thought that he died in the mid-1980s. It was not until the formation of the Cultural Relations Committee in Ireland in 1949, the forerunner of Culture Ireland, that the American market reopened to Irish artists. It is notable, I think, that the, um, culture, the, the uh, Cultural Relations Committee came before the establishment of the Arts Council in 1951. That was all about tourism. The post-treaty years were tumultuous for Irish visual artists, and I've spoken today of only a few. These were some of the people among so many others who were on the front line in Dublin and New York as Ireland began to repre represent itself to itself at home and abroad. It's been a pleasure to have had the opportunity to tell you something about them. Thank you. Thanks very much, Emer, for that. Uh, our final speaker this afternoon is Paul Rouse. Paul is Professor of History at University College Dublin. He has written extensively on the history of Irish sport and sport in general, uh, including Sport and Ireland, a history, and the hurlers, the first All-Ireland and the making of modern hurling. 
Paul has made TV documentaries for OTE and TJ Cahar, including one about the source of today's presentation, the Tolchin Games. Now, I'm speaking as a leash man. What I find most impressive is that he previously managed the awfully senior football team. His talk today is titled Sport on a Partitioned Island, the Tolchin Games. Um, local relations between Leash and Offaly aren't great uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the GAA world, so I'd, I'd like to respond to Billy's magnanimity on that. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> this could be a brawl. Um, what I'm going to do over the next 20 minutes or so is to look at what happens to sport on an island that has been partitioned. And I'm going to try and do that by looking at the decision of the new government of the Irish Free State to attempt to use sport as a vehicle to bring its newly won independence to the attention of the wider world. And I'm going to move out from that attempt to look at what was happening to the major sports on the island in the first years of Irish independence. So one of the first decisions made by the government of the new Irish Free State in January 1922 was to organise a major two-week sporting and cultural festival in the summer of that year. That festival was called the Tolchin Games and it was to be modelled on the modern Olympic Games and planning for it began in earnest at cabinet meetings of the new Irish Free State Government in February 1922. Now, while the modern Olympic Games were the model for these Tolchin Games, their inspiration was rooted deep in the traditions of Irish nationalist history and mythology. The Talchin Games were presented from the 1880s onwards as a revival of a festival supposedly held at Tara in County Meath from 632 BC until the last record of the Games were held in 1168 AD, helpfully just before the English invasion of 1169. You won't have to be eagle-eyed to spot the handy coincidence of, of that. And in general, of course, when you see history boxed into neat dates, the flags of a warning should fly. Those games, those original Talson games, were said to have involved some athletics and some equestrian events, as well as cultural contests in poetry, music, and dancing, but were really the cultural exposition of a peaceful and unified Ireland uh, uh, and island. Again, you won't be surprised to know that the historical record, as in facts, did not sustain these claims. But the message of the propagandists of Irish nationalism were clear. Despite centuries of invasion and despite oppression, that is cultural, economic and uh, political oppression, the Irish had survived and so had their unique culture. J.J. Walsh, a 1916 veteran who was appointed to the position of Postmaster General in the new Irish government, was the driving force behind these new Talchin Games. Now, Walsh was an extraordinary man. He is best remembered as the Cabinet Minister who established 2RN, the Irish state radio system that became RTE, and also as the man who had the red post boxes of empire painted green after the establishment of the Free State in 22. Walsh later became a successful businessman and regrettably also became a fascist supporter who lamented the defeat of Germany and hoped in a book written in 1944 that the Japanese would hold out. Um, but back in 1922, his greatest talent was said to be his organisational skills. In Walsh's vision, the Talchin Games would be open to Irish-born people and people of Irish extraction and descent around the world. There would be sporting competitions where they would represent their various new countries. So there would be a team from South Africa and from America, from Argentina and from Australia, as well as Irish teams. Uh, and as well as sporting contests, there would be competitions in art, music and poetry, as happened in the Olympic Games at the time. But even as disagreement over the Anglo-Irish Treaty deepened in the course of the spring of 1922, plans to stage the Talchin Games continued. It was decided, for example, to stage the opening ceremony on the 3rd of August, 1922, with dignitaries invited from around the world and the whole thing filmed for broadcast later in cinemas across America and beyond. Now, as we know, disagreement over the treaty worsened to split and then to civil war 
during the spring and early summer of 1922. And as that civil war of violence worsened, it eventually came that a telegram came from America that the Irish-American team that had planned to travel would not now travel, and the postponement of the games then became unavoidable. Although Walsh tried to avoid postponing them, he eventually had to come in. I will come back later to talk about what subsequently happened to the Talton Games. But before I do that, I want to move out and look at the wider sporting world of organised sport in Ireland. The programme that had been arranged for those original Talchin Games, for the abandoned Talchin Games, sorry, of 1922, had emphasised the fault lines of Irish sport. The competitions in the Games comprised Gaelic Games, athletics and a range of Olympic sports, but no soccer and no rugby. These two sports, as well as hockey, had been explicitly banned from the Talchin Games, and it was said that this was because they were, and I quote, foreign games. Now this was an exclusion based on a mentality that understood as an imperative the expression of nationality through sport. This mentality had earlier led the Gaelic Athletic Association, the GEA, to operate a series of rules from the beginning of the 20th century which banned from its membership those who played or watched rugby, soccer, hockey or cricket. There were zealots, essentially, in the GEA who wished to use the association to do what Harry Boland said was to draw a line between the garrison and the gale. And there were many within the GEA who subscribed to that approach. J.J. Walsh was one of those men. He was virulently anti-foreign games and was devoted to the idea that the GEA had its, as its primary aim to be a contributor to a project of national liberation. Now in 1922, under the initiative of Walsh, a sum of £10,000 was made available to redevelop Croke Park, the home of the GEA, to host the opening and closing ceremonies of the Talchin Games. That's quite a stunning sum of money in the context of a, 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 of a new state to give to the building of a, a sporting venue. And it was the first in a series of government decisions made in the 1920s which privileged the GEA in the Irish Free State, including ones around taxation. So, for example, later in the 1920s, the GEA successfully lobbied that it should not pay the entertainment tax that was introduced later in the 1920s. By the way, it also successfully lobbied that although they shouldn't pay it, that soccer and rugby should pay it. Um, there were many orders, members of the association, though, and this really matters. There were many other members of the GEA whose interest in the association and in Gaelic games was entirely, or almost entirely, sporting. They played Gaelic games because they loved football and they loved hurling. And the idea that they chose to play sport as a political statement was a very limited one, and one that is wrong in many instances. The GA's ban mentality posed a problem, however, because it was unable to accommodate the many who in their sporting choices were swayed by conviction, personal conviction, personal interest, personal taste, and social context, not by matters of politics or identity. And it is basically a fact that this type of membership is at odds with the cartoon history offered by Walsh and other nationalists, and that this in turn was at odds with historical reality. So for example, Walsh told the new Dáil Éireann that the members of the GEA had been the main contributors in the fight against England and had provided no members of the British Army who had fought during World War I. This was a position of history that was adopted by the GEA during these years, which demolished any sense of complexity or contradiction of its own past. Part of this demolition of complexity involved changing the name of a terrace in Croke Park from Hill 60 to Hill 16 in the early 1930s. To aid this transition of a terrace, which had been originally been called by a battle fought in Gallipoli in 1915 to one fought by Irish rebels in Dublin in 1916, a myth was invented that the hill was built from the rubble of the GPO. That the terrace had been finished in time for the 1915 All-Ireland Finals was not let stand in the way of this invention. Reversing time's arrow is not yet known to be possible, unless, of course, you are seeking to rewrite your own history in a particular light. And in this instance, it now meant ignoring not just the real naming of Hill, 50, Hill, 50, Hill 60 into Hill 16, but also the fact that there were more GEA men fighting in the British Army in France during World War I than were in the GPO on Easter week 1960. For their part, those who controlled Irish rugby reacted to partition by pretending that in a sporting sense, 
it was not actually happening at all. The provincial structure of rugby already in place after a previous split in the 1870s permitted an independence of local action that suited those who organised rugby in the province of Ulster. The overarching ambition to preserve the unity of Irish rugby amongst those who controlled it was challenged, however, by the practicalities of fielding a national team. The emergence of international sporting competitions in the 19th century is a key marker of national identity, replete with uh, symbols of statehood, created obvious problems after partition. What nation did the Irish rugby team now represent? On which side of the border will it play its international matches? What flag would it fly? What anthem would be played before matches? That a significant constituency of the membership of the Irish Rugby Football Union was unionist in its politics created obvious difficulties. And that rugby's leadership, both north and south, was, appeared similarly unionist in its sympathies, created further tensions. This was the case because, of course, there were many rugby players themselves who were not unionist. And, and people who just had no politics at all. They loved to play the game and they loved to watch the game. The problem were, were those players who deviated from the idea of a, a unionist mentality within rugby. For example, in October 1922, a delegate from Bechtel Rangers Rugby Club on the south side of Dublin told the AGM of the Leinster branch, who controlled rugby in the, in the, in, in, in the province, that they were unrepresentative and, impen, and impeding the progress of rugby in Ireland. They say, this guy said at a, a meeting, rugby football could be the national pastime of Ireland, but not until its control has been democratised. It has been deliberately excluded by the organisers of the Talchin Games, and he personally regarded that as a humiliation, but he and no doubt many others guessed the reason it was because the present control of rugby was undemocratic, unsympathetic, and ultimately un-Irish. So this was a view that came from within rugby itself. The thing is, the old administration of rugby was not about to give way. There was no change to the jersey. It remained green. In terms of grounds, the IRFU developed Ravenhill in Belfast, so one international match a year will be played in Belfast, while another one will be played in Dublin. So far, so good. More problematic was the flag. The IRFU designed its own flag in 1925. There were critics who argued that Ireland, when it played at Lansdowne Road, should play under the national flag, as in the tricolour, but this was objected to by committee members who noted that popular interest in rugby was drawn from opposing political traditions and that only the flag of the IRFU should fly at home matches. And this is where the matter lay until the 1930s when a popular campaign from certain rugby clubs in Munster, from politicians and from members of the public saw the IRFU agree to change and said that the tricolour could fly beside the IRFU flag at intermatches, international matches in Dublin while the Union Jack did the same in Belfast. Rugby's fine balancing act repeatedly drew criticism. In 1936, for example, the decision to postpone a rugby match between Cork Con and Sunday's Well and down in Cork um, was taken because it fell on the day of the funeral of King George V. This was condemned by a Cork constitution delegate as, and I quote, pandering to satisfy a certain section. Regardless, though, the accommodation that the rugby authorities made in the years after partition allowed them the flexibility to continue administering rugby in the present just as they had done in the past. There were moments of discomfort, but none so great that compromise could not be secured during the 1920s and 1930s. Even into the 1950s, there was still compromise. There was a dispute over the playing of God Save the Queen at international matches in Belfast before international matches in Belfast, and it brought complaints by Southern players, most notably before a match in 1953 when 10 players from the 26 counties declined to take the field or said they would not take the field until the playing of God Save the Queen was finished. This included the captain of the team, Jimmy McCarthy. It was resolved only when the High Court judge, Cahar Davitt, said that to the players that if they took the field, this would be the last time an international match would be played in Belfast and this was agreed. Subsequently from then, all international matches were played in Dublin. Their matter stood through the Troubles until the emergence of the peace process in Northern Ireland and the need for a certain flexibility on all sides contributed to a new approach to flags and anthems. For unionists, the idea of playing under the tricolour and standing for Aura on the Veen created obvious difficulties. And this was manifest at the 1987 World Cup, the first ever Rugby World Cup. 
what anthem will the Irish team play for, stand for before the games? For that first World Cup, the IRFU agreed that Auron Naveen would not be played at the Rugby World Cup in New Zealand. And instead, the pre-match anthem that the Irish team stood to was the Rose of Tralee. Quite the choice. At the next World Cup in 1991, the Rose had been dumped with Auron Naveen back in its stead, but Ireland's matches in that World Cup were played in Dublin. So that was the excuse that was used for that. The question again came, what would happen for the 1995 World Cup as the peace process took off? The answer was the commissioning from the Irish musician Phil Coulter of a new song, Ireland's Call. It would be wrong to suggest that the song was welcomed musically. Nonetheless, a new political dispensation, notably the IRA cessation of violence and the establishment of a power-sharing executive later in Northern Ireland, which promised peace on the Ireland, lured those who were less than enamoured with the tune into a grudging acceptance in the international peace. And that song has subsequently been adopted by the all-Irish all, by the all-island Irish hockey and cricket teams, though not, of course, by the partition soccer teams or by the Gaelic Athletic Association. Soccer alone of the major sports assumed a new partition structure after partition in 1922, with the Irish Football Association in the north and the Football Association of Ireland in the south. In 1922, the most immediate manifestation came of change came with the playing of the Irish Cup. Until 1922, from the early 1880s, there had been an All-Ireland com uh, competition, this Irish Cup, played annually between the island's leading soccer clubs. And then, in, 19, in the spring of 1922, just four months after partition, there were actually two Irish Cup finals played, within a fortnight of each other, one in Belfast and one in Dublin. It was the most obvious manifestation of split immediately made. And in 1922, what would happen with the, with the international team? The government of the Irish Free State recognised the legitimacy of the Football Association of Ireland and supported sending a team to represent Ireland at the 1924 Paris Olympics in soccer. But the IFA from Belfast rejected this legitimacy and its attitude was later encapsulated in a memorandum which read, our football association in this country functioned harmoniously until a political movement inspired by a religious element caused a readjustment of relations between Ireland and the British government. So what happened during these years? Until the 1950s, the IFA in Belfast and the Football Association of Ireland in the South both fielded teams called Ireland. Both claimed the right to draw international players from wherever they wished on the island. And it, indeed, it was only in the 1950s, 1952-53, that this ceased. By then, more than 40 players had lined up for both Ireland teams, selected by both competing sporting bodies, because, of course, matters of identity could be suborned to, desire, to the desire to win matches. Time and again, it was this idea of the love of play, of watching play, of organised sport, of trying to win and doing whatever you had to do to win, which undermined the attempts of ideologues to infuse sport with a specific meaning. There were people who, in their sporting choices, were indeed swayed by personal conviction and social context, many of them, even most of them, and they were not necessarily swayed by matters of politics or of identity, despite the motivations which may have been ascribed to them or that we choose to ascribe to them now. Basically, they played games because they liked to play games. And this was utterly manifest when the free Irish Free State finally got around to staging J.J. Walsh's Halchin Games. It did so in the summer of 1924, as still stretches of the city centre lay in rubble. And what emerged in those Halchin Games was the biggest sporting event held in the world in that year. It was bigger even than the, than the Paris Olympics, with more than 5,000 competitors. And indeed, it was satirised, including by people such as AE, uh, as uh, being, it being impossible not to win a medal in the Talchin Games. So if, if you sometimes see medals lying around the place, they're not valuable in case you have them. Um, sorry to break that news. Um, in those games, these Talchin Games, there was no soccer and there was no rugby. But this does not ensure a triumph for Gaelic Games. Instead, it was the new, modern, mechanised sports of motorcycle racing 
and speedboat racing and aeroplane racing that were the most popular, wooing people who were fascinated by speed and danger and ultimately by modernity. The greatest success were two things. First of all, there was a mock plaster cast castle built in the Phoenix Park, which after the airplane race between the new planes of the Irish Free State, they then bombed that castle in a demonstration <laughs> of what they were doing and drew a huge crowd. But the biggest sports people who were favoured and celebrated on that day were the motorcycle competitors from Northern Ireland, J.W. Shaw and Joe Craig. You can see the footage of this in Pathé newsreel scenes where they are mobbed by the crowds who attend them. And this, and I'll finish with this line, is a reminder that partition did matter when it came to sport, except when it didn't matter at all. Uh, thanks very much for that, Paul. And now we'll throw it open to questions. Actually, maybe I'll ask the first one on, on, on the Tolchin Games. Um, <clears throat> was, was there any sense in 1922 when they were organising the Games, and I'm thinking of the, some, one of the brochures that had a, a map of Ireland on it with no border, that, OK, geographic partition was sealed, but that they were trying to create uh, this notion that culture and sport and art were not partitioned. And like, there were participants, I presume, were from all over the country, 32 counties, all of that. I, I don't think it was conceived at all with partition in mind. I think it was conceived at all with independence in mind and an expression of independence. And I, I, it was conceived with the idea that this was a celebration of, of, of Irishness. As I don't think they went down. I don't think right, it was it really. Wasn't in their thoughts. I don't think it was in their. In, I don't think it was in their thoughts at all. Right. Now they did panic, even in twenty four. They panicked in 24 when they thought the crowds mightn't necessarily come. So they went to Paris and they got American competitors mm. to come in because they wanted, to, they wanted it to be a successful festival as a festival in and of itself, rather than okay. anything that would see, be seen yeah. to transcend any putative border. Right, OK. Um, 24, that's Johnny Weismuller. Johnny Weismuller, which is the best bit of sporting yeah, trivia. Yeah, 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 do you yeah. want to tell it? No, you do, yeah. So it's the, my favourite bit of sporting trivia ever um, is Johnny Weismuller. Do people know who Johnny Weismuller is? It's, uh, like, uh, Johnny Weismuller won the 100 metres front crawl swimming at the Paris Olympics, and he's one of those people who, with Harold Abrams and other people who... J.J. Walsh went to Paris, invited these 10 Americans who took the boat into Cove, and they added luster to these games. It was an extraordinary high jumper and things. But Johnny Weismuller was bought into the swimming, and Johnny Weismuller duly won the 100 metres in the Talchon Games, having done the same in the Olympics, won it by a huge distance. Um, and he later went on to, to star as Tarzan, in, famously in the films. But Johnny Weismuller won the 100 metres swimming competition, which was held in the pond in the zoo, in Dublin, Dublin Zoo. It was actually, they'd set out the track in the zoo when he went up and down. I love the fact that Tarzan won, in, won the goals in Italian games <laughs> while the monkeys were bleeding away either side of him as he went along. I see for Terry here, there's just a question on, well, I, I just paraphrase it, just on the people who wrote the songs, and there was, they're noting that it's mainly men wrote the songs, many women write songs whether in victory mostly or defeat. Mostly men wrote the songs, yeah. I suppose. At the time, mostly men really did a lot of things in public. Women might have written the songs, but they never escaped, if you like. Uh, one woman who was prolific was Maeve Kavanagh, and there's very little about her in the books about the Rising and the period before the Rising. There was hardly a week before the, in the years before the Rising when some inflammatory thing from her wouldn't appear right. in the radical newspapers. Connolly referred to her as the poetess of the revolution and she was an intimate of Connolly's, apparently. But uh, herself and Constance Markovich are the two that come to mind. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe there's some recovery required as well. Um, so any questions from the floor? Um, I just want to ask you, Neve, about the Acela Solomon um, exhibition. Um, women artists in general, um, their work is underrepresented. 
But um, Estella Solomon's work, you know, we don't hear about her at all. And you said that her um, etchings were reminiscent of Rembrandt, so that's, you know, high, high praise. And uh, also, when um, you said there, Emer, I'm wondering, should she have gone to America <laughs> <laughs> to sell some work? Um, what do you think uh, was keeping that, you know, her work from us all hearing about her? Because she was a great artist. Yeah, um, I think it's a case of, uh, well, she didn't necessarily need to, uh, you know, um, she wasn't dependent on commissions, basically, uh, because of her middle class background. But I think her focus kind of later in life turned to supporting her husband, Seamus O'Sullivan, with the Dublin magazine. So that would have, um, I suppose, she turned her focus to that rather than... Uh, pushing her art, um, as it were. She exhibited for over 60 years in the RHA, um, and her works are, you know, still filtering, you know, onto the market today, but still at such kind of low prices uh, in comparison to her male car counterparts. So, um, so I suppose this is an opportunity to highlight her um, as a kind of a key figure who knew all of these people uh, and was very close uh, friends with many of them and just uh, again showing the connections between all of those sitters uh, like I only showed a, a fraction of the the amount of people that she did actually depict so yeah it's an opportunity to highlight her to a lot of people that don't know of her yeah could I just make a point about that too, yeah. just about women artists in general, which is a real research interest mm. of mine as well. I'm, yeah. I'm just thinking about Grace Henry, for mm -hmm. instance, who mm -hmm. we all know Paul Henry and his work sells for squillions. Uh, and, and poor Grace, mm. you know, uh, you can pick up a Grace Henry for a couple of thousand. So, so, so actually there is this whole thing about the treatment of the woman artist in, in kind of critical art history. And it's really in more recent years mm -hmm. when art historians have picked up that cudgel and run with it and brought women really we put them back into, and I hate the word canon because it's kind of a male construction, mm -hmm. but put them back into the story, the narrative of Irish art history. Mm -hmm. It's been a very important work for a lot of art historians. Yeah. You've been doing it, I know Roisin Kennedy has, and mm -hmm. several others, myself included. And it's very important, mm -hmm. actually, but you still see it. You still see it. Look at the auction catalogues. Um, mm -hmm. Just getting well, back the, to Grace in, Just Henry, in the fact know. that, uh, you know, somebody highlighted recently about the, the auction houses are highlighting, you know, all the That's wonderful right. uh, artists that are on view in the, the sales. And it's only just male artists men, listed. Yeah, so yeah, you're saying, yeah. uh, where, where are they still? Yeah, well, actually, that was a recent thing. And I got onto that auction house. <laughs> oh, did you? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because there are great women artists. But then the term great is part of the canon as well. So mm. we need to be very careful about the language we use around women artists. We need to be very careful about the language we use about art in general and not be using those constructions instructions that were put in place at a different era. So we're all working hard to find other ways mm -hmm. to better describe and, and assess women in the same way as we assess men in terms of their legacy and mm -hmm. career. And I also think for somebody like Estella Solomons, a lot of the people that she would have depicted in or who would have sat to her in the 1920s, like uh, many of those you know, people like, say, Padraig Colum, and just as an example, a lot of them ended up living abroad, mm -hmm. uh, going away. Um, a lot of them had died as well. So, as I said, that's why I think she, she lost that kind of urgency to depict all of these important people um, and hence t turned her attention to the landscape uh, later in life. Stella Solomons have sold well in America. You showed yes. some Power O'Malley, mm -hmm. and you, I got the impression that it was very traditionalist, sort of thatch cottage images that the, maybe the, the well, diaspora were looking to buy. Well, and that's no, sort no, of what I didn't mean to get that no, impression. No, 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 they, what I, just, I was trying to yeah. really say is that the diaspora were, were interested in everything, yeah. you know, and in fact, Solomons did show in some mm -hmm. um, shows in the States. I, did, I left her out because I knew you were talking about it. Okay, good. Um, so um, the diaspora, I mean, Michael Power O'Malley was churning out work. I mean, he was coming home and literally chucking out the work, you know. Yeah, but he was he also a very good portrait yeah, painter. Yeah. He knew his market. But Keating and, and Dermot O'Brien and Margaret Clark were, were sending work that they were painting ordinarily 
Oh, anyway, yes. yeah, okay. um, Keating with metaphors, Dermot O'Brien with the most wonderful, he was the most wonderful landscape painter, Margaret uh, Clark with the most, I'm sure you know her work, with the most beautiful figurative work, you know. So yeah. they, they weren't particularly making work for the American market in a way Power O'Malley was because he knew his market well. But having said that, I found Power O'Malley's descendants and they were left with a lot of his works after he died. I mean, this kind of shed loads of his work, you know. Uh, but, you know, he made his living. That's what he yeah, did, yeah, you know. Yeah, you so that's what he had to do. Yeah, he had yeah, to survive. Exactly. And that's an important point, by the way, and it's probably an important point for artists even now. But this idea that um, it would have been great if artists could have had work given by the state in the way that America was employing artists in the 1920s. This idea that artists could have contributed by doing big mural works and going into schools and working with children and all those things, uh, that just didn't happen. So it was very difficult. So people had to make the kind of work they needed to make. Yeah. The, uh, interestingly, the 1922 Tolkien's, which were postponed, one event went ahead, and that was the, the Great Tolkien Art Exhibition, yeah, that's which right. to this day is still the largest exhibition of Irish art that's ever been held in the country. Yeah. And it's really, it's inter it's really interesting the sort of records around it, uh, it, it, it set up and who paid for it and what was exhibited. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Which Keating won a medal? Was it worth anything? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also a, a, another exhibition that I've re researched quite a bit recently is the there was a major exhibition of Irish art in Paris in January 1922. Yeah. And approximately 50% of the exhibitors were women and 50% mm. uh, men. Yeah. I just thought it was interesting for the time, but you gradually see that. Uh, I follow exhibitions through a number of years, and you gradually see that uh, always change over time in mm. favour of men. Mm. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do, you, do you think, Paul, with the anomalies of, say, software and embedded cycling, that the example of sports demonstrates that the political and legal partition of Ireland was not accompanied by a sporting or cultural partition? I think, the, I think the sporting, I think the partition of Ireland, it's the, the enduring partition of Ireland isn't just the border, it's the divide in. in identity choices between people who consider themselves to be British and people who consider themselves to be Irish. But not in a sporting contest? Not in a sporting contest, but sport is kind of different because people in sport are prepared to make um, compromises based on the capacity to perform at the very highest level. They are made, like if you consider the Irish rugby team, there are members of the Irish rugby team who are currently born in New Zealand, born in South Africa, born in Australia, and they're willing to do it. There are Irish people who compete for Australia as a brilliant runner, which is an absolutely amazing runner, runs for a, a Australia in marathons. And I think the story of sport is the story of people who are prepared to make compromises in their identity based mm -hmm. on playing at the very highest level. My, my singular point around this, around sport and around partition, and around the decisions that are happening, that is that it, it's, there are different reasons why different sports either accepted partition or partitioned themselves or didn't quite do it. The GEA ignored partition, but also it ignored, well, essentially. Well, how do you mean? Well, what it did, what the, the point I'm making is it remained an All Ireland organisation, yeah, yeah. and except if you were a member of uh, a, a unionist community, a Protestant community in public schools, then you were ignored. So that's a different type of partition. Mm -hmm. Rugby, with the singular exception of certain clubs in certain towns and Limerick, was partitioned on class lines because it was an incredibly middle-class sport played in middle-class schools, dominated really by the Dublin middle classes and by the Belfast middle classes. So that's a different type of partition which has got nothing to do with identity. Soccer's partition Again, there's a class aspect in soccer's partition and there's an educational uh, partition within soccer. But soccer's partition was, yes, there were two organisations that were separate, but for 30 years, those organisations picked players from north and south of the border, as it saw fit. Yeah, but, yeah. Well, I, I've also been a lot about soccer's split, um, but the, uh, it, it was more really for an internal government's reason why they split. And the pace of selecting players from both teams I was getting more on the, on the face side. Yeah. Because they saw, after the Liverpool agreement in 
my point is they ignored partition in terms of their choice of players. And they, north of the border, who, they, who, who would not have dealt with anyone in the 26 counties on a whole load of different reasons, were more than happy to pick a soccer player, including people who played soccer for Ireland. Three days separating each other, they played for two different teams. And I think, I think the key to understanding soccer is one of the, or one of the keys to understanding soccer is, even though it is understood as largely a working class game, which it was, it is also a middle class game, and the fact of it is that the All Ireland competition that survived partition was the Collingwood Cup, which was the inter universities competition, which survived the whole way through and never partitioned. So that tells you something about class structures on the island. The Irish banking system didn't partition, that remained largely things, and so on. There are networks of influence on the island which, which survived partition and did not change, while others did change. So it's a complex of reasons which are not just to do with, not just to do with national identity, identity, they're more local than that. Sorry, that's too long of an answer. <laughs> okay, there's a question online here from, for uh, Emer from Russian Kennedy. Um, Emer, did other diaspora groups in the US develop similar specialist galleries and, uh, uh, and diaspora collectors in the interwar years, or was this particular to Irish art, do you think? Um, Sorry, uh, yeah. can you read the question again? Sorry. Did other diaspora groups, other than uh, the Irish? Oh yes. Uh, oh yeah. yes. I mean, I haven't studied them, but absolutely, yeah. uh, of course. Um, the Dutch, in particular, had a big um, kind of diaspora in New York, and there were galleries, sort of, you know, associated with that. Yes, absolutely. But yeah. my interest, of course, is the is the Irish aspect. Right. Uh, yeah. It's a, Sinead, oh, yeah. Thank, yeah. Thanks very much. That was uh, wonderful papers this afternoon. Um, I, I suppose I would be referring to, to Emer and, and Neve both, both as a joint question, but mostly um, as a statement first to, to sort of refer back. Um, just to say, just, just to bring it back to Lady Lavery, um, you know, the, the idea that she's often referred to as an aspiring artist when, you know, mostly to do with the lack of the, the, the works coming to light. And in the case of Estella Solomons, I suppose my question is, is when is that exhibition happening and are you still in the research phase um, of it, Neve? It's happening, um, it starts on the 3rd of September. Yeah, so, so you're, you're I'm preparing your... it. Well, I'm in the process of doing it at the moment, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so just the point I wanted to make, and this is, is the case that I, I suppose what I would be aware of from the past, like for example, um, Gregory O'Connor, um, would have, a chemist would have purchased the Estella Solomon studio and he would have made a lot of that material available maybe in the 90s. Mm -hmm. But that material then again, those, those paintings just go back into the private collections. And so often when we're doing exhibitions, it, we don't actually get the pre-publicity that's required mm -hmm. that in order to be able to bring more works mm -hmm. to light. And then you're, you have the exhibition and then the material comes to light. That's so right. I suppose what I'd say is mm -hmm. the, the importance for, even for media outlets, for, for follow-up from an exhibition, that if something could be put into the press, which would be a sort of a, something that, again, is, mm -hmm. is pre-publicity, so mm -hmm. that you can uh, encourage that type of engagement and that yeah. material coming yeah. forward. But just to say to you that it's really interesting to hear about the material that's outside the country as well, and the work that Emer has done in relation to those to those galleries and those, it's, Again, it's, um, it's the hope that you'll find new Irish material abroad. Mm -hmm. So thank you, everyone, and uh, enjoy that. Even the, even the sport when I don't know that much about it. Questions for you all. Just to say on, the, on that point as well that I, when I um, curated the exhibition on Margaret Clark, you know, not much was known about her at the time. And, uh, you know, a lot of works came to light post-exhibition uh, that had been in people's attics, etc. So, yeah, it is amazing what, what surfaces with an exhibition. Yeah. And just a shout out for uh, my uh, friend of mine, uh, Carla Briggs. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I, we were very aware of a lot that Margaret Clark, you know, because she was, because of her widowhood, she was in a position where she was doing a lot of work with commissioning. So, yes. so places like, um, you know, the Bishop's Palace was having, you know, would have works of hers. But I think the, the main difference between then and now is the, the opportunity with social media to be able to put out the, 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 and the images and that to get the, the, those more of the you see that actually, uh, that happened recently with Una Waters. 
-hmm. the Mary Morrissey was using um, public media to find her works. Did you see that, yeah. um, Sinead? It was, it was really fascinating to watch and they managed to put together a big show of this woman whose work had completely disappeared from, mm -hmm. from exhibition history. They did a recent exhibition in the Irish Arts Club. So it's, it is amazing mm -hmm. what you can do. Yeah. Yeah. Social media does have it's great. Its it has its yeah. some benefits, not yeah. not many, but some. Yeah. Yeah. Me in mind of a question for, for Terry, you talked about social media and generating. When you showed your slide and you put up all the politicians who, who wrote songs, mm. was that because it was such an effective way of communicating, or were were they innate, or they just so culturally engaged? We're going to do this anyways, or was it was it a way of communicating that? Why did they write those? Yeah, things? why did they write them? Was it get their message out, or? I think people that are seized with some kind of commitment, political commitment or identity commitment, they resort to verse, I think. And right. uh, the, when you're in power and you've achieved your aims, that seems to fade away. I don't know why. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So were, were they communicating to a wider audience? They were communicating among themselves. These songs okay. are mostly right. to make yourself feel good when you're in, in right. the appropriate okay. company. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, Mike, coming your way. A question for Ema, if I may. Um, Helen Hackett, she sounds like a fascinating character, and you mentioned the diary. Was the diary published? Uh, and if not... I, oh, well, I, you know, like art historians, we do this mad stuff, yeah. don't we? I actually found the Hackett Papers. It's a private collection in New oh. York. And I published the entire diary in my recent book on oh, wow. Irish America because it is so fascinating. So um, I got the permission from the family to publish it. Yeah, it's there. Excellent. I can, I can attest to that. I read it. It's a wonderful read, reading her diary. Yeah. Okay, any final question? Not I, I, one question that I want to ask Neve. Uh, did, Stella Solomons, did she ever feel under threat did she, for her safety and that she was a safe house and she was painting these people? Did she, I wonder, did she ever feel like her personal safety was at risk? Um, I don't know. I think she was quite uh, in, inventive in, in how she kind of handled it. I, I, I did read about the fact that um, when... Free State troops did raid her her uh, studio on one occasion. She said that uh, the two men that were in the studio had just been delivering the piano, but you know they weren't necessarily those those uh, people. But um, yeah, I think there was obviously ways of of getting around it. But obviously there was a there was a a need to there was an element of risk and there was a need to. Uh, destroy obviously a number of the portraits that she did do uh, as I said the gallery did acquire that one of an unid unidentified uh, sitter but most likely he was one of those uh, revolutionaries on the run okay. um, so it must have been a, a quite a, an interesting time that mm -hmm. these people were passing through and uh, I think her the manner in which she painted uh, those kind of her spontaneous way of uh, depicting them or capturing them um, uh, was suited to, to that kind of uh, dynamic of people kind of coming and going. Uh, not only her friends, uh, and, uh, but, but those revolutionaries as well. So yeah, I would say definitely there was a yeah. sense of risk. And that notion of not wanting to incriminate people, so, so then destroying okay, artworks. Yeah. OK, there, there's a number of complimentary comments coming from Carla Briggs and Ruth Moore and, and other people as well, just thanking the NMI. And sorry, you've a question. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah, far ahead. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just a quick question. Um, I'm, I've, I saw Vera Ryan's exhibition on um, uh, on modern art, not modern art, but crafts in the Crawford Gallery. I saw the exhibition on um, pool. You know, Grace Pool. What's Grace? Alan Pool. In Canberra, they, she she fitted out the Governor General's house, mm. and then I was just wondering about women, not necessarily painting, but maybe involved in ceramics or involved in 
in uh, embroidery and involved in, but at a higher level. Mm. Um, are they there or? Oh, well, they are. Yeah. Yes, they are there, yeah. And in fact, um, we're just doing a bit of research up in the Tyrone Guthrie Centre. There was a group up there uh, known as the Women of Anna McCarrick, and they were embroiderers, and they did this most fantastic exhibition out in America, and we're, we're looking to pull that all together again and um, see where all the work is and see what we can do. And there's the Kolyka group at the moment, you know, the Kolyka group that um, Catherine Marshall is working with, mm. um, women making it. It began, in fact, with one of the artists. It was, it was um, um, uh, Patricia... Um, sorry, her second name has just gone out of my head, but she began to make life-size figures. And suddenly this turned into a big project with a group of women, and it's, it's just turned into something quite extraordinary. So actually we're developing plans to pull these two exhibitions together. Uh, because that, that, that work does operate at a very high level. But of course in art history terms, until more recently that kind of craft would have been dumbed down. But in fact it actually does work at a very high level and it's very important to recognise it. Start Kensington with women in people. That's right, yeah. But if you look at the tech records, the technical education, you see women learning crafts yes. that are, you know, at the higher level of what they're doing are artistic as well. Yes, It'd be absolutely. Very interesting to see. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot more of those exhibitions coming out now. Yeah. Just on, on the exhibition you mentioned in Canberra, it was Ruth Lane Poole was the artist. And no, no, uh, uh, She's yeah, I've a, I'm, I have a blog coming out on the Trinity website next week. Just I have a blog on her coming out on the Trinity website. What's her name? Ruth Lane Poole. She yes, that's yeah, Sorry, you're yes, right. Yes. Yeah, Ruth sorry. Robson, she's I saw the exhibition. It was only it closed after a week or two yeah. because of pandemic. Yeah. But I have the catalogue. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she's I've I've seen she's one some of, the of her work family. as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, she worked in Dunima and Kuna Industries. Yeah, and then that influence of the Yates family yeah. on her. Mm. And the pieces going into the houses in, yeah. in the Governor General's house and in the uh, Prime Minister's house is very interesting, yeah. I think. Um, her husband was a forester, yes, yeah. and the building he works in has various examples of um, timber because they were promoting Australian forestry. But if you go into Stephen's Green and look at the marbles on the wall in the Department of Finance, again, you know, the development of art first is the materials. The, 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 the Married in Dublin, the Married in Dublin, William Butler Yeats, Deborah Way, and Hugh Lane designed his suit for the wedding. So bring it back to Hugh Lane. He was good at designing suits, <laughs> Hugh Lane. <laughs> okay, I, I, I think we'll, we'll leave it at that. So j just before we go, on behalf of the National Museum of Ireland and the Hugh Lane Gallery, I'd like to thank all our speakers and attendees, both in person and online today, for participating in the Portrait of a Nation conference. And I'd particularly like to thank our last group of speakers here. So. And uh, I'd like to remind everyone um, that you can also join us again tomorrow for our final two panels, exploring the impacts of the treaty on families and communities, and also on the role of the artist as witness, with two great panels of speakers again. Uh, <clears throat> there is also a limited number of in-person spaces still available, so book for tomorrow. So if, if anyone uh, wishes to come along for tomorrow's sessions, you can book on Eventbrite. Okay, so thank you again, and thanks to our panel. <laughs>